What is going on guys? Happy New Year! This is a very, very small gift from me, from me to you in this 2021. Uh, this was one of my Udemy courses, it's called The Complete Guide to WebSockets and I'm making it available here for free on YouTube. It's a little bit more than five hours, take your time, enjoy and uh, the reason I'm, I'm not making that free on Udemy because guess what Udemy sucks as a platform and they change their rules so that only two hours you can only make courses that are two hours or less free so huh so alas anyway so that's why I I privated that course on Udemy but it's now available here for YouTube in YouTube hope you enjoy guys and uh, so let's talk through about the curriculum of this course a little bit. Um, first of all, there will be, and you'll start seeing chapters, YouTube chapters, where you can jump to the interesting part of the video at any time of your leisure. So the first section is just an introduction to HTTP and web servers, stuff like that, because this is very critical in order to understand WebSockets. The second section talked about an introduction about WebSocket, what is this thing, uh, why do we need it, stuff like that, with a little bit of practical uh, slides and code and all that stuff. The third section talking about scaling WebSockets, how we can actually go, you deploy reverse proxies and load balancers to scale WebSockets because that's a little bit tricky since WebSockets is um, a little bit uh, stateful, so it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to scale. Right, and um, then the next section, I'm gonna talk about securing WebSockets because mm, a little bit different than HTTP, but nevertheless, it's it's very easy to secure. You can use TLS on top of WebSockets. Then I have a, a final section which I called Advanced WebSocket Topics, which is just a collection of my different YouTube videos where I talked about. WebSockets and the future of WebSockets, and then the advanced topics of WebSockets, like like uh, WebSockets on top of HTTP2, and, and, and what's the future of WebSockets, and how would does WebSocket really look like under the hood with Wireshark? So all these fancy stuff that are really optional. But I hope you enjoy this course. I'm gonna see you in the next one, and uh, let's just jump in the course. Q and. HTTP is a protocol for transferring web pages, text, images, media, binary files, and much, much, much more. It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It is what the internet pretty much runs on. Everything you're using the internet is pretty much runs on the HTTP. In this video, we will learn how HTTP works how it is secure with HTTPS, this green lock that you see when you browse, for example, Google or Gmail, right? Or any website that is secure for that matter. We'll also learn how to spin up your own HTTP web server. We're gonna talk what is an HTTP web server to begin. We're gonna talk about that. We'll also learn very quickly about the evolution of HTTP, starting from 1.0, what changes, what bad decisions those guys made to 1.1, and then HTTP2, which Google basically helped with Speedy, and eventually HTTP slash 3, which is still experimental, by the way, as of the making of this video, right? Has been, up, I think, approved by the Eng Internet Engineering Task Force, but is still under experimental. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Hussein, and in this channel, we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. So if you want to become a better software engineer, consider subscribing, hit that bell icon, and like this video if you like it. With that said, let's just jump into the video, guys. So here's the agenda. We're going to talk about the HTTP anatomy, all right? Well, so the essentially this layer 7 concept, right? And the, how it is actually a client-server architecture, mainly. And... Uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. We're gonna show you how a rec HTTP request show looks like, uh, how a response looks like, and then we're gonna talk about the HTTP 1.0 over TCP. Okay, so that's the first version. I think it was 1996 when it was first released. There was a version before that, but I'm not gonna go through that. That's like pretty much that was the popular version 1.0. Then there was a lot of problem with this thing. 
They invented 1.1, 1 .1, still for a long time, 1.1. Most of the site now running is still 1.1 over TCP. I'm not going to talk about what that means, really, over TCP, right? And uh, HTTP 2 over TCP, and finally, we're going to talk about HTTP 2 over Quick, which is a UDP version that Google is experimenting with. So it's a UDP protocol. Okay, and uh, it has actually has more features, right? And I'm gonna reference a video that we made, TCP versus UDP. I really highly recommend you watch that, guys. It's a, like, a, like a mini course, 40 minutes. It's a free, you can watch it. And I talk about the details of TCP versus UDP. And, and I really, really, if you know the basics, you can jump into the video, that's okay. But literally, take, take some time and watch that, TCP versus UDP. This is the experimental version. They are renaming it to HTTP3. All right, so it is client-server architecture. We know how client-server architecture works. There is a client somewhere. There is a server somewhere. You, as a client, request something that is only available on the server. You send a request. The server responds with a response, okay? That's a client-server architecture. For the web, for the HTTP, the client is, guess what? Your browser. Most 99% of cases, like you are browsing something, right? If you go to google.com, you're making an HTTP GET request, okay? And there is eventually a server that lands. That request goes through proxies and switches and, and go through TCPs and, and get packets. Finally, reaches the destination server where it is an HTTP web server, okay? That finds that request. You want indexed HTML, you want a JS JSON file, you want an image, and that takes that, shoves it up back to this vehicle, which is mostly TCP, and then sends it over to you. Okay, it's a client server, it's a request response architecture. It's always been the case. Okay. Does that mean that's the only thing I can request with browser? No, you can make a request HTTP request from Python. You can make a HTTP request from a JavaScript application. You can make an HTTP request and you are actually making an HTTP request from your phone. If you're watching this in your phone for some, for, for some reason, iOS or Android, you're making an HTTP request to the service, right? If, if you're reaching through, through YouTube, for example, there are some HTTP requests going to the back end, okay? So HTTP request essentially is, is this medium that we, we just uh, shove everything. It's a standard. Everybody knows how to understand it, right? And how to talk through it. That's why we are using it everywhere. There are some limitations. We're improving it. Google has a huge contribution. It's actually almost scary how a lot of contribution has uh, Google on this thing. Okay, like especially with Speedy with 2.0 and 3.0. It's like almost most of the thing is just Google's gonna take over the world, dude. All right, so server. I don't know if you're from the 90s like me, right? Uh, when I started in the university in the 90s, you probably used Apache somewhere, right? PHP, right? The LAMP stack or WAMP stack. We didn't have Linux back. <laughs> I, I worked with Windows mainly. But LAMP stack, WAMP stack, whatever, right? So Apache, that's a web server. IIS, there's an Internet Information Services. That's a Windows thing that comes with your Windows. You can enable it on Windows features and you get, boo, you get a web server. You can write your own web server from scratch using Node.js. There's certain APIs that allow you to do that, right? And there's like a, when we're gonna show that, you can actually build your own, uh, you can just use a, a ready-made web server in Node.js. We're gonna use a HTTP dash server to show that. Python Tornado, I made a course called P Python on the backend. Little plug here, guys. Check that of course out. It's just showing you how to build a web server using Python and, and details about how you can serve content from Python. It's a it's, it's a uh, I, I'm really proud of that course. Go check it out. It, it's gonna help me, right? I'm gonna leave a coupon code right here. Python on the back end. I think it's like on ten dollars. Don't buy it from Udemy. It's just gonna show you like two hundred dollars or whatever. So use my coupon code if you want. If you wanna check out that course, right? HTTP request. If you want to request, these are the four items, properties in an HTTP request. There are many others, but I would like to just talk about these things only, right? There's the URL, obviously, right? You're going HTTP, HusseinNasser.com, HTTP, Google.com, right? Example.com, that's a URL, slash, 
whatever, twitter.com slash hnasr, that's, that's a URL. The URL has a lot of components, it has like the whole path, the arguments, all right? We don't really need to talk about that. I made another video, I'm gonna reference it here, just breaking down the URL, really. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long thing, okay? It's just URL. You're making a request, you have to tell me what URL. You gotta make, you have to tell me what method you're talking about. And these methods are really interesting. I made certain videos, like to explain the differences between these detailed methods. Mostly, mostly get, post, put, delete, and I think options, and there are a lot of HTTP methods. And each method has some semantic. Get mainly says, hey, please give me an, a page or an image. So reading, essentially. It's like, almost like, if you know SQL database, there's like this semantic where select is actually a query, right? Git is the select version of the SQL, if you want. All right, and insert is basically post, and update is basically put, and delete is basically delete, right? So that's kind of if you want to, it's just different semantics, right? Git, oh, we made a video about uh, Git versus post, and the details, differences semantically between those two, okay? But you gotta tell me what do you want, right? What method are you executing, okay? And then URL, method, right, because these, Two things will give you essential results. Headers, what kind of content are you sending to me? Uh, are you sending any cookies? It goes in the headers. Uh, what else? It goes a lot of things here. Host, where, which host are you going to in case of proxies, right? You wanna, uh, if you wanna use a low, layer seven proxy and to kind of navigate yourself, you need to put the header host here and uh, location, other stuff as well. Buddy. Certain method types have body. That's where the difference comes right here. Like get has doesn't have a body. It will it will give you an error if you try to send a body with a get. You have to send it through the URL. And we talked about this in the video. Get versus post, All right? And uh, post will have a body because hey, I'm gonna s upload an image. That's a post, right? Okay, and the post request, you're gonna send the content type of the image's image, and then you're gonna send the binary stuff in the body. So it's gonna be long, right, the body. HTTP response, I am going to hopefully make a series about all the beautiful sta status codes that are there are. Hopefully, and I'm just gonna talk through uh, one video, as each status code or one video. I'm gonna make a series, I'm really excited. Uh, tell me in the comment section if you're excited to see that series so I, I get motivated to make it sooner. Okay, but I'm gonna make it anyway. So static code. This is, guys, you probably know it. If you make a request to a web server, it res responds with three things. Status code, headers, and the body. So the body is the actual image that you re requested, the actual JSON content, the actual index.html file or HTML file. Headers is, hey, this is the content type is actually hey, uh, application slash JSON, application slash text, whatever, uh, application slash octa uh, binary. Status code is actually whether that succeeded or not, or warning, or all this kind of things. 200 is basically, hey, success, okay, that means you're cool. 201, that means, oh, hey, you created it. 404, it's very popular, status code is pretty much used everywhere. 404, I couldn't find that URL that you requested. Whatever you requested here, I couldn't find it, so we return 404. And the web server has to be authored in a smart way to actually handle those things. IIS, Apache, pretty much HTTP server, Node.js is gonna do that for you. But if you're writing your own web server, right, which we kind of did in one of those videos, I'm gonna find it, I'm gonna reference it here, okay? Then you have to handle those status codes for you, which is which is pretty cool if you ask me, right? So if you're like, you're creating, like if you're building a service, like a normal service, a web service, a micro service, right? You want to handle your own status codes, right? You're writing everything from scratch, right? You're making a request, you're getting a request, you have to return and you tell me that what kind of status you're returning based on that. So the client actually understand, other clients understand. All right, let's show some example, guys. We're gonna show two examples. We're gonna show you how to browse because you guys obviously don't know how to use the internet. I'm gonna show you how to uh, navigate the internet and just browse using the browser, okay? Because that's what you came for this video for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, we're gonna show you the browser, we're gonna show you the request that's going on, all right? And we're gonna show you how to spin up your own HTTP web server. 
Okay, let's get into it. I here have opened Chrome and I am, I would just went incognito just so I don't have any caches or anything, right? So I want to just start from scratch and I want to go to my website, which is www.husseinnasser.com. Can't even spell my name, okay? And this is this is the request that we made, right? We went to husseinnasser.com and this is what we got back, okay? Let's analyze that. If you go to this three dots, I think it's called burger button, whatever. More tools, developer tools. Let's see what happened here. You go to network and you say, if you go after the fact that you browser, you're not gonna see anything, but if the moment you refresh, you're gonna see the whole those requests. Oh my God, look at that. Look at that, my website actually sucks, man. I'm using Blogspot and look at all this. This request, this is slow, right? Because you're making a lot of requests, but that's the first request that goes here. Okay, and let's talk about these things real bit. Okay, that's the request. Okay, so we made a request to HusseinNasser.com, right? Let's look at the request headers. What do we have? We have a lot of stuff, guys. We are going to HusseinNasser.com. The method that we talked about is get the path. The URL is just slash, right? Uh, whether you're using HTTPS, we're going to talk about a little bit about HTTPS. Actually, we talked about TLS and another video. We're going to reference that as well. But what do you expect except as a result? Okay, encoding and cache, whether you want to cache it or not, and so many other things, the user agent. So this is a request, right? The response is the actual, the response headers, right? Say, I'm sending you back what? Text, HTML, because that's the index.html or whatever the page was. As you can see, you can't even tell that I'm using Blogger, right? And uh, the date, e-tag for caching. We made a video about e-tag. I'm going to reference it here, how, how caching actually works. Pretty cool stuff, really, guys. And the status, 200. That means it is coolish. That means it is coolish. And this is just like a general uh, summary of all the requests, right? So we have status 200, get, and all that stuff. Remote server, like what is the remote address that actually served you? This could be a little bit uh, different because it could be actually, it might be the proxy for, uh, IP address, but that, nevertheless, right? Cookies, whether you have used cookies, whether the server created cookies, guys, I'm gonna reference, I'm gonna go, I referenced a lot of videos, right? We made a lot of videos. Cookies, we made a course about cookies, actually. Just, it's just a free course, check it out. It's just talking about the different kind of cookies. You would think a simple concept like cookies is a, a simple thing, but it has a lot of things, and we talked about that as well. And the response, look at that, that's our HTML file. And you can see, this is just the first request, guys, right? After that, after we got that, we got a bunch of index.html and the browser says, ooh, that's just, there's a lot of URL here, right? I need to stop pulling some stuff. So the browser said, oh, let's go ahead and make other requests. Started with CSS for some reason, right? So it looks like it looked at the first thing, it looks at the headers of this thing, right? And started pulling one of them one by one manually. Oh, CSS, let's put the CSS. And then the plus one dot JS. What is this thing? Plus one dot JS. I don't even see it, but it's somewhere here. Okay, so start pulling all these uh, files or resources. Okay, okay. Now let's make another get request to blogger.com slash CSS, right? Plus one dot JS and then images. And then let's, let's talk a look about images. How does the image looks like here? Yay, the content type. Look at that. Image PNG, right? So you're going to receive different response, uh, response uh, things here. And some of these will get cached based on your e tags, right? If you receive an e tag or not, it's gonna get cached. So the browser doesn't have to make these requests. Obviously, it's more uh, performant this way. And then you get the idea, right? So we get a lot of requests. Do I have any other kind of status codes that I can show? Maybe if I refresh again, do I get any fancier status codes? No, it's all, yeah, there you go. There you go. 302 found, right? So I don't remember what that means. 302 found obviously it's found i think this is um this is the redirection thing there was another request that actually shows uh the the three 204 there you go what is this 204 so 204 yeah i forgot what that means okay guys all right so this is our request 
We talked about requests, we talked about response. How do I spin my own web server? This is this is connecting to a server that already exists. I want to spin my own server, sir. Okay, let's show you how to do that. What I'm going to do here, guys, is actually I'm going to open Visual Studio Code. You can download it for free. It's the best editor out there, in my opinion. Okay, you can disagree with that if you want to. But, and I'm going to spin up and I'm going to write a simple HTML page. And I'm going to spin up my own web server on my machine and I am going to request it from the browser. Let's do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and open a new folder. All right, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder, call it HTTP tutorial. And then I'm going to open this folder. I am going to create a new brand new index.html. Doesn't have to be index.html, but you can call it anything you want. I'm going to do HTML5 tab, and I'm going to go, hello, word. And then going to do it. I don't know. Hello, guys. This is my first website. And then, yeah. Right. And then I'm going to use the terminal here. And this is a trick here. I have installed a plugin with Node.js called HTTP server. You can go to the same path to the folder that you have, and you go to terminal. Then when you do that, you do HTTP server dot. I'm going to reference a video that is like literally a three minute video to show you how to set up this thing. It's literally install Node.js, do, I think it's called npm install dash g HTTP server to install it globally. And then voila, we have running web server on port 8080. It's a little bit ugly. It's not just without a port. But we talked about how to forward ports and on other videos. Check out the other content of this channel, guys. There's a lot. If you consider subscribing, you're going to learn a lot of stuff. So I'm going to use my own IP address, localhost, 8080. And if I do that, ooh, that's my beautiful web page. Look at that. Let's take a look at the request. There's one, should be one request, right? That's it, one request. There's, there's no other thing to request. And then there's like, these are the requests that, uh, that Chrome sent. You can make the same request using uh, using the Fetch API, which we talked about, the Fetch API, I'm gonna reference it here. So let's go ahead and actually show you how to write JavaScript code to actually pull, not, not necessarily uh, the browser, right? But I'm gonna write code to pull this thing, okay? So I'm gonna do HTTP, localhost, 8080 the Fitch API, and then close this thing. And then, then if that's okay, go ahead and I'm expecting text back, right? And then go ahead then, console.log, just printed that thing, and then boop, look at that, guys. So I just made a request using JavaScript here, because JavaScript is the best language ever, okay? Because you can open a browser on any machine, and you can write code immediately. No plugin, no have to install anything, it just works, right? That's why I like JavaScript, okay? Okay, Python, it's a great language, but that barrier that it doesn't allow me to work on any machine I want. This thing, any machine, just walk in a library and you can start writing JavaScript code right there without installing a single anything. Okay, that's the cool thing about it. Okay, all right, guys, let's jump back to boring slides. How about that? All right, guys, so we talked about HTTP responses, requests, web servers. We showed you how to make a feature request. We showed you how to make uh, a web server, spin up your own web server. We did all of that stuff, but how does it work? How does it really work? How does this HTTP work? Usually you have a client, that's your browser, or that's your JavaScript application, or that's your Python application, or that's your, I don't know, C-sharp application that makes a request, that's your mobile app, that your iOS app that makes a request to a server. You get the idea, right? And this is an AWS or the web server or anything that hosts a web server, an HTTP web server. It has to be an HTTP web server, understands how to deal with HTTP requests, okay? And here's what, what we really need to talk about here. HTTP is the layer 7 protocol. So what does that mean? What are these layers that you talk about? I'm glad you asked because we made a video about this OSI model, Upper Interconnection, uh, Upper Interconnection Protocol and Model, uh, which has this layer. Layer 7 is the HTTP, SMTP, and all that stuff. We have layer 4, which has the TCP, UDP. We have layer two which has the data link the frames the mac addresses and physical link layer one which is the actual fiber optics or or, or ethernet the actual electricity get going on or the light okay so we talked about this in another video i'm going to reference it here 
okay gonna reference the osi model please please take a look at it so it will actually explain to you how how this tcp connection works what are we how is this russian doll effect where we can put a uh, a packet inside another packet inside another packet and then unpack it and shows another thing it's exactly like a russian doll thing http is this layer 7 protocol it's the logical layer where we have the application where we we talked about headers and what we talked about urls we talked about method types we talked about body the wires the actual internet connection if you look at that layer one it's just a bunch of ones and zero and you probably know that guys it's like okay i know this is ones and zero i saying you didn't see anything new all right but it is actually a bunch of ones and zero but that's at that level it is actually literally it's just electricity to be honest right or just light and that light has some ones and zero snuck into that into it that only the destination actually can parse and make sense of it there's a lot of garbage so there is a, there's the devices that switches actually just can extract meaningful data of this light and electricity. Once we do that, the layer two that actually takes, actually makes a, a logical frame, which is still doesn't make sense to this application because it's a, it's a still ones and zeros, but it has metadata called MAC address, which is a physical network layer, ad, network address. Okay, and then up another level, IP address. Oh, I, I know what an IP address is. At the layer three, you start seeing IP addresses. And the layer four, you start seeing even more cool stuff. You start seeing the ports, port 80. I don't think we talk about ports, but ports essentially is, is the application level concept, right? Once you see at the TCP layer, you start seeing these ports. Okay, and then we're going up the other layer, this encryption layer, session layer, and then go all the way and then unpack all the dolls, the session doll, until we found a bunch of blob string that actually looks like an HTTP request. TCP is the vehicle that transports this blob of string for us the http that we talked about right it's just a blindly transport this thing it does it has no idea what it's transporting it's just a stupid layer it is it's a smart layer i'm sorry it's a smart layer that does its job very well okay let's rephrase it okay but it's just like a bus just like a bus send send me data i'm gonna receive it i'm gonna send it i'm gonna send it in a way that it is received correctly at the at the other end and we talked about tcp and udb tcp is a little bit expensive because to ensure this integrity it has to do a lot of stuff it has to do a lot a lot a lot of stuff okay and uh, congestion control and all that stuff but tcp it uses tcp in a nutshell okay that's what i want to talk about so a tcp as this vehicle is the 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 bus that carries this data that are around okay so it's just chunks this data and then into packets and then shove this data into tcp and shit but to to start the tcp connection we really need to essentially do some sort of a handshake first okay we, we have to like essentially three-way handshake okay open a connection to open a connection between the client and server and that's the first thing we do we open a connection because we're about to send a GET request. We just we're going to HusseinNasser.com, right? And we're going to that site. And the first thing I do, GET slash HusseinNasser.com. That's the only thing I sent, okay? This string of thing will get converted into bytes. And this bytes will become such a bits, but ones and zeros and zeros, TCP. And then we'll get sent across to the server. And then you, uh, the GET request will be received by the server. And the server will make the process this request, make sense of it, responds with the headers and the index HTML, send it over to the TCP connection. This could be one packet, it could be multiple packets, if you have a lot, right? Because TCP just breaks things down. Okay. But that's the idea. Make the request, send it back, close it. That's what HTTP actually does. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the differences, a little bit differences here between one zero and one. But that's the thing, that's it. Open TCP, close TCP. That has a cost. Open and close, okay? HTTPS. It's exactly like HTTP, but there is something happens at the beginning. It's called a handshake. It's a TLS handshake or SSL handshake. And I'm gonna reference the video that we made on TLS, guys. Talk about how we actually establish a secure communication. So all of the reason of this handshake is for those two to have the same key. 
That's the all what it is, TLS. And we talked about the details. We actually zoomed in in this thing and we talked about it in details in that video. So I'm not gonna go into that in there. But essentially, the, the goal of this is let both parties have a key, the same key, symmetrical key, encryption, okay? And then let them exchange it. Now, if the client want to send, essentially encrypts, but to encrypt that, send the request, get the request, and then the server will actually, if someone, if someone starts to sniff it, it will not understand it. Take that request, response, encrypt the response, send it back, and then close the connection, okay? Now, talked about HTTP, talked about HTTP, S. Now, what is HTTP 1.0, oh, the first version, 1996? For some reason, okay, it was a good idea, right? So, remember guys, this is 1996. RAM was what? I think the maximum number of RAM was, was 64 megabytes right back then. I think that's the com first computer I got. Right, so TCP connections, establishing a TCP connection was expensive in, in terms of RAM because each TCP connection takes some memory, okay? And we didn't want to leave all these TCP connections open. So what we do, we, we thought that we are smart back in 1996 and said, okay, let's for each request, we're gonna open a connection, send the request, response, and then once we're done, we're gonna close the connection. And we thought it was a great idea. We thought it's a brilliant idea. But then index.html, that that's when we had what? Like the index.html had uh, what? It was like text and that's it. Like this web 1.0 pages where it had like marquee text and, and what was this blinking uh, things and you know, the 1.0.1996 kind of websites if you're from that era. Right, so it doesn't have a lot of stuff, but as the internet became more popular, people start putting images in their index.html, people start doing a lot of stuff. So this index.html has a lot of stuff. So guess what? That's not the first request and the only request we're gonna make, right? Yes, you just close the TCP connection here, right? By the way, the CP connection is actually both sides, right? So this is here and there's another one here. So I just didn't show it. But that's the most critical one, the one that is here, that's the memory. Second, so we close it. So we receive the reserve the memory, and then the memory can be used for something other thing, like playing Minecraft or where Minecraft did, wasn't invented in 1996. Never mind. Playing playing print, Prince. If you guys know that game, Prince, Prince of Persia. So close that thing, and then guess what? I'm about to send another request because there is an image. That user need to see that image. I have to request it at some point. So go ahead and open another connection. Request that image one.jpg. The server will open that connection on that side and then spawns with the image. And then guess what? We close it again. And then, hey, by the way, I forgot. There's an image one two. And then we close it. You can see how expensive this gets, right? If you watch, if you watch my TCP versus UDP, TCP is very slow to start. It is literally there is a problem called with TCP called TCP slow start. Okay, because it has to do a bunch of things. And TCP is slow in general because sending it has to do all this congestion control, or reordering packets and all that things and making sure everything is in order. So that's very expensive. So HTTP 1.0 didn't last a year, right? 1997 is like, that doesn't make any sense, guys. We really need to fix that, right? So we'll see how to fix it. So it establishes a new TCP connection with each request which is slow. And what it does is like it is buffering the responses, okay, at the back end. So if you have like a large uh, results, like, the, like a huge index to HTML, what it's gonna do is will literally buffers wait for the server to build all that index to HTML and then sends it slowly to the service, okay? Uh, HTTP 1.0 a little bit improved on that using streaming, but instead this is using buffering, okay? One, one, all our problems are solved. This is the only protocol that survived, what, 20 years? Because 2015, HTTP2 became the dominant ones. I don't know if it's still dominant or not. But 2015, let's do the math. 2015 to 1997, that's 20 years. Oh, more than that even, okay? This guy survived 20 years, okay? And it invented something called keep alive header. So it's a header 
but the server it's a server uh, the header for the server to know that oh i probably shouldn't close that connection huh right so we open a connection normally we send a request but we send it i forgot to add it here a keep a live header which is part of the http request right and then at the server what we do is we will leave that connection we're not gonna close it i'm gonna keep it for you sir right as long as we d as we as as long as we agree that both this connection are kept on both sides so that's why the clients always the is the person all right, that tells the server, hey, please keep it alive. Please don't kill me, right? And then we made another request. I don't need to create a new st stupid connection, right? Do, do, do. Fast, fast stuff, guys, right? And then oh, finally, when we're done, right, we close it. And whenever that means, right, when we're done, okay? Uh, HTTP 1.1 introduced caching with e tags. I forgot to mention that. So, so 1.0 didn't have really good caching. This e tags concept, which we, which we talked about, right? So, in the description, guys, there will be a bunch of links to my videos, right? To to talk about all of that stuff, right? Hopefully, YouTube will also suggest some some of that stuff for you from my channel, which will be if you go to watch it, you're gonna support me. Thank you so much, right? 1.1. We move to this persistent TVCB connection or persistent connection model. If you heard this term before, that's what it means. We persist now. We gonna persist the connection, so we have lower latency. And then we have streaming with chuck transfer that we talked about instead of buffering. So the moment we have part of the HTML page, we're gonna send it, boot, boot, boot. we're gonna send it through the connection. We just, we're not gonna wait, right? Okay, so that's, and then we're gonna tell the client that, hey, by the way, uh, this is part one, part two, part three, part four. So so at least if, if you wanna show an image, you can show part of the image. I, I don't know if you guys remember back and when you had a slow dial-up connection, the image will literally just, drrr, 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 drrr. you can see the image loading, okay? And that's because of the streaming chunk transfer, okay? Which, by the way, has been replaced with 2.0 with a better multiplexing functionality, but, that's when you when you remember there's like the images I'll try to put a GIF here or something. The image loading, <laughs> showing you the image actually loading. Remember the dial up days? No? You don't? Okay, sorry. Pipelining. I don't want to talk about this because this is like some moot uh, it was it was a smart idea I won, but it made more problems than than good, like this HTTP pipeline. It has been actually disabled by default in in, in Fig twenty. 15 or 2017 so you know what HTTP live pipelining is having this problem called head of line problem which where where clients keeps waiting for the packets to reorder themselves and which is which is I might, I might make another video just talking about that HOL problem but pipelining where we send in these requests right and instead of sending and then waiting for the response sending and waiting for response sending and then waiting for response the 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 three blue lines will come first and then the three red lines will come after okay so we'll send them in parallel essentially okay this could be multiple threads could this could be like a uh, the, uh, the loop event the loop uh, mechanism where we actually send them all of at once and then wait for the result the problem with that is the ordering really so we have really to guarantee the order and that and that became really problematic. So that's essentially pipelining in a nutshell, right? This hopefully we're gonna close the video a little, little short here, right? I know I talked a lot, but uh, I hope I hope you guys uh, really enjoyed this video. I know my videos are long in general, but I hope there are a lot of content for you that actually uh, valuable, right? Uh, I don't make two or three or four, five, or five, even seven minutes video. I think I couldn't. I, I'm not good enough to make that short of video delivering good content for you that's why i i need to talk about a lot of other things because if i made a seven five six minute video then i'm gonna cut a lot of things and and to me that was that isn't a valuable video because this channel is designed to make me a better software engineer to make you a better software engineer so you need to understand the details and nuts and bolts of things right that's why i need to talk about detailed things okay and 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 that's okay and if you disagree i i totally respect that right but that's why my videos are long a lot of people complain about that a lot of people of you guys love that i have made 20 30 minutes videos but that's essentially my my points of this right so 
I make longer videos because there are a lot to talk about, okay? I can make break them into multiple videos, but you have to jump through multiple hoops to get one answer, right? Uh, HTTP2. I don't remember the timeline, I'm sorry guys for this, but uh, it was designed to solve all problems in one, one and one, one, no one, one. Uh, compression is one of them, but I really should put multiplexing as the first one. Multiplexing is idea, essentially an idea where multiple requests come and get shoved into one channel. That's that's what multiplexing is. Like you go like a lot of wires coming into one place and you multiplex them into one. Okay, that's the same thing here. So if you remember our requests, think of multiplexing like the client will join these requests and shove them into one TCP request, one TCP packet, if you will, not one TCP packet, multiple TCP packets as a one request. It goes as a one request. So logically, the HTTP protocol 2, 2 will, which is called Speedy, by the way, and then it was renamed to HTTP 2. It was just shoved into multiple one connection. And that's, you can see, it just, just like doing that, we solved the head of line problem, which is like the ordering of thing, because I'm saying one request, right? It, it looks like three requests, but it's actually... Uh, it looks like one request, but it's actually three requests or four or five, right? So we start doing that stuff, multiplexing. And then we found a way to compress these things because everything is now uh, bu protocol buffers, which is that uh, pro uh, the open source uh, format for um, was uh, Google that uh, designed it instead of using JSON or anything. So it's using a uh, binary format, not necessarily protocol buffer. You can't support that if you want to. Uh, it uses a service push, so if you don't have to wait for the the request to come, the actual server will push request because it's a bi-direction, almost like a bi-directional request. Again, that looks like a re request response to a fetch API, to a browser, but internally it's a server push, it's, which is slightly faster, okay? I'm really, think, I'm still thinking HTTP2 is stateless, right? I Although, under the hood, it is stateful because if you think about it, all protocols are stateful because it's using TCP, which is stateful. But it gives you the, the impression that is stateless at the end. And I think HTTP2 is still applicable to uh, stateless because if you, if you destroy the server and you spin it up again, I can, it doesn't hold information about that. Or even it, it can resume my session, my HTTP session quickly, right? Without me even noticing that it, something has broken. Okay, that's the idea. It uses speedy, and it's always they those this, those guys decided to secure by default. So it's always HTTPS. Okay, because and the reason because of this protocol negotiation and the protocol negotiation is because we have a lot of old servers now, 1.0 and 0.9, right? But we have to really negotiate, guys, the protocol that we're gonna use with the server. Right. So the client have says, okay. Can you support 2.0? Can you support HTTP 2, please? So this protocol is called Next Protocol Negotiation, and which has been replaced with the application layer protocol negotiation, which is a little bit better. This this thing was trying to encrypt uh, the the requested protocol, which is kind of useless, right? Because like, but this one is like transparent on the clear, right? So I'm gonna make a video just about these two, essentially. Right, but essentially an idea is like you make a request and say, hey, this is the list of protocols that I support, okay? The server picks one and then that happens during the TLS negotiation, okay? The TLS handshake, which that's why these two things, which, which is just let's talk about this because that's the new version. And that's an extension of TLS. ALPN is actually an extension of TLS that allows you to pick that and, and it does it very quickly because it's part of TLS and because it's part of TLS it's always it's always HTTPS right right and, and if it's not then they have to do this other stuff to pick the protocol and all that stuff right guys finally HTTP2 over quick okay or recently actually I think 2018 September has been renamed to HTTP3 it has been adopted by the Internet Task Force Internet Engineering Task Force I ETF, right, IETF, okay? It's been renamed to HTTP3 now, okay? And the idea is it's exactly like HTTP2, 
But instead of using TCP, which is slow because of, of all this uh, frame ordering and and, and um, the conjunction control and, and uh, a lot of other pro uh, cons of the TCP protocol, the slow start and all that stuff, right? they decide to use UDP instead. They use their different. But the problem with UDP, just using UDP, it is lossy, right? You're gonna lose. You don't guarantee that you're gonna receive the request in in intact right correctly right it doesn't have conjunction it doesn't have anything just send the data and you just hope that you're gonna receive it correctly right so google came up with quick right which i think stands for quick use udp internet connection which people don't like to call it that is that's not an acronym for anything it's just literally called quick okay and then udp with congestion control that's what it is essentially and there's a lot of going on i'm not going to go through details but it has all the http features but it replaces the tcp as this vehicle that transfers thing and instead of this tcp let's use quick which is the udp with some features that makes it uh uh reliable if you will okay this still this is still experimental it did not uh hit the road yet right uh google is still i think they're still using it though internally in google server but uh, it, it didn't sh see a wide bad option yet right so it's still experimental http3 is still experimental but if you saw http3 that's that's it it's just http2 over quick okay uh if i missed anything guys do let me know in the comment section below, okay? Obviously, I'm not perfect, okay? This is my research. This is the research I did, and then that's what I found, okay? We talked about HTTP anatomy. It's a long video. We talked about request response. We talked about 1.0. We talked about 1.1 over TCP, HTTP 2 over TCP, and all the problems that we solved, the speed that we got with each one of those, right? And then we're almost here, HTTP 2, and we're moving to HTTP 3 in the future. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a like, subscribe to this channel, hit that notification bell to uh, check out the other content of this channel. We have, we talked about all sorts of software engineering, right? That's the goal of the software of this ch channel, right? I want to become a better software engineer. I want you to join me in this journey, right? We're going to learn everything that is to software engineering. And uh, I know that we're not going to get there ever right because there is a lot to learn and that's the beauty of it it's an unlimited game it's an unlimited game we can never be the best because there is literally infinite information out there okay and it's like pokemon we're gonna catch them all okay hopefully but you know ash never caught them all did he i don't know there are a lot of pokemons out there but we'll try to cut or oh, we'll catch all the software engineering uh, Pokemons out there, but I don't I really doubt it, but that kind of make me want to push more and learn and learn and learn more All right, I'm gonna stop talking right now guys Sorry, and thank you so much if you really made it to this end Thank you so much for making it all this way to the end of this video You guys rock leave a comment in this section if you want to say anything Okay, if you want to troll me feel free good if you if you want to say the you suck. Feel free. If you like this video, say so. All right. And uh, love you so much. Stay awesome. Gonna see you in the next one. Goodbye. A web server is a software that serves web content through the HTTP protocol. It is the foundation of the internet and any website out there must be sitting and hosted by a web server. Web APIs like REST APIs can also be hosted on some sort of variation of a web server as well. Web servers can serve static and dynamic content. We're going to talk all about that. And uh, you can use an out-of-the-box web servers like Tomcat or Apache or Lighty. Is that what it's called? I think it's called Lighty. Or you can build your own from scratch. Like you build the using a framework like Node.js or Express.js or Python Tornado, right? You can do all of that stuff with a web server. Okay. In this video, we will explain what is a web server, how it works, and we'll go through and spin off two types of web servers. One of those like ready-made web servers, which you can just install and just put static content on it and let it work. 
And we can also we're gonna also explain how you can write almost your own web server from scratch using the web framework. We're gonna use Express.js for that. Okay, but I have made a lot of videos about Python and web and unknown, so check out the content in this channel, right? So uh, speaking of which, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Hussein, and in this channel we discuss all sorts of software engineering. By example, we have tutorials, programming, uh, we discuss software engineering concepts like what was a web server, was it a proxy, NAT, right? Anything that particularly interests me, I just add it as a thing to do in this channel and uh, in order for me to learn. If you're interested in that kind of things, Hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon so you can get notified whenever I upload a video. Well, that's it. Let's just jump into this video, guys. All right, let's just jump into some. Uh, hopefully, we'll go through this theoretical part so we can show you some coolish stuff. And I'm gonna add some jump codes here. You're gonna uh, see it here, so you can just jump to your favorite part of this video. All right, uh, we're gonna talk about what is a web server in this agenda. We're gonna talk about how. Uh, web servers work and we're going to show you the examples right this is our agenda for this video okay what is a web server it is a software essentially that says web content period okay define what web content it could be your html pages could be just images pdf right anything that can live as a web and transferred as a web content is defined as web content okay your api could be web content right your json document is a web content okay anything that's sent back text right can be web content that's that's the and uh, that's the definition of that okay and it's consumed by clients who knows how to consume web content okay let's talk more about that that's why it uses the http protocol and guess what we have made a video about the http protocol i'm gonna make it uh, reference here so if you want a deep dive into what http exactly 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 is with examples go watch that video i'm gonna reference it here but essentially it's the hypertext transfer protocol because it's designed and there's different versions different semantics right but we are now in http 2 http 3 is coming HTTP 1.1 has been living for almost 20 years, and essentially this is what the web runs on. Okay, right, and that's when you say like HTTP slash slash. That's you're using HTTP protocol. Okay, if you don't want to more, more learn more about it, go there. And uh, all right, static versus dynamic content. So what does that mean? Okay, if you're like me, born a millennial, born in 1983, or a little bit earlier, a little bit after that, you would remember the early days of the web where those flashy marquee texts and the moving stuff where the web was essentially just you consume stuff. Okay, you cannot really change anything in the web as a user. You can just consume. It's a static content. It's just a bunch of static content, HTML pages, right? Most of the of which were run on Apache, by the way. All right, so... That's like like the the state of the art in the '90s, if you remember. Okay, so all these flashy images and and uh, essentially static content is like indexed HTML, index pages, uh, HTML pages, PDF, images, CSS, right? I don't know if the CSS existed in the '90s or not. JavaScript files also considered as a static files, which is funny because it's actually code, but it is. Nevertheless, it's a static file. It's a file that you can download, and that's it. Okay. And uh, here's the interesting part with that static file. So you can host a web server and you can put static files on them, and you can serve those very easily. We can show that. Okay. That's the cool part of the web application. So you author content, you paste it in a folder in your web server, and then your web server will immediately generate that these nice urls for you the so http slash whatever the folder you created and then blah you can you can host your pages which is pretty cool right so people instead of sending files by emails you can let just be, send people link urls or uris okay and then they will go to your content so static files are cool because they can be cached because no matter they can if they change you can detect this change using e tags and caching okay and i'm going to reference this caching concept here if you want to learn more about it dynamic content on the other hand is is when things like blog posts right it's a it's a query to the database and will retrieve certain results so based on the login user you can get different content different page 
Facebook is an example of this, right? It's a dynamic. You know, nobody have the same work page ever. Okay. So caching this is a little bit tricky. Okay. So that dynamic content, dynamic content is generated as a part of a language that you write. You write code in the back end that generates different content, different uh, page or web content based on a different context, like could be the user or it could be just the location. If you're coming from uh, Asia, you're gonna get a certain like look and feel. If you're coming from America, you're gonna get a different look and feel. So that's the dynamic content essentially, okay. All right, uh, use to host web pages. We talked about that, right? So we can use to host web pages. You can use, that's the 1.0 era, just web pages. Yeah, you used to have, you can use blogs and forums, right? Where you can, that's the web 2.0. Right, web to one is just everything static. Two O is when things started to allow users to actually interact with these pages, like create a comment, post it, post, right, do something, and then and then the, you can see these changes. So there's an interactivity between the web, right? And you can also build APIs, right? We talked about APIs on this channel. Uh, I'm gonna reference some videos here we made about how to build a REST API uh, with Python. You can also check my course there, Python on the back end, if you're interested. It's all about APIs and how you can write Python on the back end. Little plug there. All right, so how web servers work, guys? How do those things work? I'm gonna talk about concepts here that I explained before, so I'm gonna gloss over them like TCP or TCPS, right? So if you wanna learn more about TCP connections, Check it out here. But essentially, what happens here is if a web server, this is a client, this is your web server, and this is your client, could be a laptop, could be a mobile phone, and it's requesting a page. And what it happens here is your IP address have you, you have an IP address, that site will have a, a domain name, it could be having a, a host name, and then it, it is running on a port. Usually this port is 80. For web servers okay that's the default port and right? if you don't see a port on the url that means it's port 80 but you can also run web server on any port you want okay that's not that's just the standard 84 http 443 for https all right so and when when you have a web server running and listening on this port that there is a tcp socket or connection ready right and if you make a request let's say get that's the http semantic we talked about get me the index.html page on the example right and this is a syntax for http and when you do that the server will process that request perhaps maybe query the database if it doesn't need to just pull it from a cache or, or, or just pull from the directory and just serves you back the result and then when you send you back it sends you the index to html or whatever that html page and it also sends you a bunch of stuff in that response we call this the headers and a status code okay and the status code is like you might have seen the 200 okay or 404 not found things like that right so the web servers have these http codes that and i want to make a series about all type of http codes hopefully okay so that's the nutshell of that but let's go dive deeper for those who are daring to dive deeper into this okay so another example of a web server one examples of this is what I call a blocking single threaded web server and I, I decided to explain that because it's the easiest to explain okay obviously none of the web servers work like that and well I take that back so some web servers work like that and there's benefits of that but most web servers have different implementations so let's Let's talk about it. what exactly happened when I make that get request, okay? So this is my web server. I just made it into a box so we can draw stuff in it, okay? And then when you first, a client makes a request, whether this get request, there is something happening before that, okay? The HTTP protocol runs on a transport layer called the TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, okay? So a transmission control protocol, what it does is 
it establishes a two-way communication between a server or a client, okay? But the HTTP protocol is just a request response. So if you make a request, the first thing it does is establish this TCP connection. So this is like some handshaking going on. If there's a TLS, you need to establish the TLS if there's a secure thing. And then once you do that, the server creates in its memory, and very important here, memory. Let's focus on the word memory. Every client that connect reserves a little bit of a memory on the server. Okay, that's where things can get a little tricky, right? That's where all the attacks, denial of attack, happens because of this reservation of memory. Okay, reserve a lot of memory and your server crashes. Okay, but okay, your client connects, you reserve a little bit of a memory, and this thing is called TCP socket. You reserve a socket for that client, okay? Okay, and once you reserve a socket for that client, now you see, okay, we have one thread, one process with one thread that is allowed to execute stuff, okay? You can have 10 of those sockets, but they are sitting in memory. They are just idle, okay? But your process can only execute one at a time, okay? So let's, oh, I'm free, your thread is free. Let's say there's a thread here that I start executing and says, okay, oh, you want me to get index HTML? Okay, let me go do an IO desk or whatever, right? And then start getting busy. That thread means it's it's the sock is busy. It's doing something. That process is busy doing that. And that means that thread cannot do anything else while it's doing that, okay? So based on that request, that's a very simple request, but there are many requests that actually pulls from the database or, or does a processing, I don't know, prime number, right? Do, do your web API thingy, okay? And that's the tricky part where you need to do short circuit uh, uh, breaking, say a circuit, circuit break and just break the circuit if, if, it, if the client executes for a long time. You execute that, you release, the third is back and it's, Back in normal, the, the client got a response and we're good to go. So what happened now? Okay, so let's say I want to, the client works on another request. It can use its the existing TCP connection. It doesn't have to create a brand new TCP connection, which is kind of fast. So having a connection, TCP connection open with the server is a kind of nice thing. There's a bad thing about it is just you have your reserving memory on the server. So if you have a TCP connection that is open and you're not using it, you're wasting server memory, okay? But yeah, pros and cons of this. And we talked about the HTTP. And then we go execute and then release, all right? Let's, get, let's make this a little bit spicy. Let's add another client, okay? One client may, makes a post request. That's the right request to the server. Okay, so I want to write something like I want to create a new to-do list in my API and the web server takes that and start processing. Then guess what? A, a poor Joe Slop here want to connect to the web server. Okay, and the server is a little bit busy. And now the web server implementations shine. What do you do? What do you do as a web server implementer? Apache does one thing, Tomcat does the same thing, all right? Node.js does another thing, Python does another thing. You can do whatever you want if you write your own as well, okay? You can do whatever you want. And But here's what, here's what a blocking single thread does, okay? It creates that TCP socket for you, and that's it. It just, just does that. It creates a uh, place of memory for you. But guess what? Sorry, I can't serve you. Yeah, the only thing I could do is just create that socket for you. Yeah, you have a TCP connection, booyah. That's it. But I'm busy serving this guy now, okay? That one thread is busy serving that, okay? And then once you basically done, right, this guy can be served, and then you release, and you're done, okay? Some... You, some of you might say now, okay, can you just spin up another thread? Sure, that's what Apache does. It spin up a new thread for every single request, okay? And that's why you, you'll see when you go to Apache or Tomcat, there is a parameter called maximum thread numbers or maximum connections, right? How many, how many of those do you want, right? I cannot just have unlimited, right? Well, you can change it to unlimited if you want, if you have unlimited memory here. But think about that when you really 
work with web servers. I like you to think about all of that stuff. It is really interesting to know how stuff works, especially web servers, because we work with these as with software engineers. I mean, writing REST APIs, this is very critical to understand, guys. Okay. So your implementation of how it looks like is very critical. So you might be happy with a single threaded blocking, okay? But you might say, okay, I'm going to spin multiple web servers like that, okay? So I'm going to put them behind a load balancer, and that's fine. Why not, right? I don't see anything wrong with that. Must be some limitations, right? You can put in Docker containers. You can spin up as many containers you want off single threaded, I find this way more simple than having complex thread multi-threaded app web server, right? Uh, let's have a discussion in the comment section, guys. What do you think is, is a better way of doing things, okay? There is no right answers or wrong answers here, okay? People still debating this, okay? Don't think this is set on stones, right? Don't just absorb information, discuss, right? Challenge everything that you read, okay? Nobody's perfect. Example. All right. Example. I love this part. I love this part so much. Okay. So I did a Google search on some of the web servers, right? The one I knew was, to be honest, I knew HTTP. I didn't know it was called HTTPD, by the way. it's This is Apache. It is the other name for it. It's called HTTPD. I know IIS. I work with IIS most of my time. I work with Tomcat almost on a daily basis, my current job, right? Uh, I use HTTP server all the time when on my YouTube videos because it's the easiest thing ever in life, okay? Light HTTPD, which I think they, they force you to say lighty. I don't know why it's called lighty. There is there is there is an H, there is a G, there is a P, there is a D. As as a foreign like non English speaker, this is all wrong by all means. You know. So write your own. That's another way of writing. So so you can you can use an existing web server or you can write your own. You can you can just use Node.js as a framework, a web framework, or you can use Python Tornado. So guys, you can write your own web server as well, right? And you can use Node.js for that, you can use Python and Tornado, and that gives you the bare metal bones of things. It, can, it gives you how to listen to a port, gives you how to send statuses, it gives you how, hey, there is a request and a response came. Do your thing, okay? It can do, so it, it gives you essentially a, a blocking uh, single threaded, okay? Uh, server but you have to write all of that stuff for yourself okay these guys does most of the work for you if you have IIS you can just write an ASP application I forgot what ASP stands for ASP.NET active server pages I think is that I think something silly like that so yeah for Microsoft you can just really enable IIS and just copy ASP.NET pages and then bleh, works like that for the demo part of this, guys, I'm going to show you how to spin up Apache 2, which is HTTPD also, okay? And we're going to show you... I'm going to sh uh, show you how to spin that in my Raspberry Pi because I have Linux there, okay? That's the easiest thing, all right? And I'm going to show you how to do your own web server using Node.js Express. All right, guys, so here's what I want to do. I am logged in here to my Raspberry Pi, which has a Debian distribution, and I'm going to install Apache 2, which is HTTPD, which is the Apache web server. Okay, and this is one of those ready-made web server where you can just throw a web content at it, like HTML images, and you just meh, will serve it for you. Very simple stuff, right? And uh, so that's like the easiest way of hosting a web page or hosting in you know, a blog or things that... Uh, if you want to host a web page or some some like a company website, this is the easiest thing you can do, right? So let's 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 learn how to do that. Okay. So to do that, since I'm using Debian, I'm gonna do the apt get here, sudo apt get and install. It's called Apache 2 for some reason. Okay. Maybe the first version sucked, so they made another version. It's called it Apache 2. Okay. Uh, if you're using Docker, it's called HTTPD. Maybe, maybe we'll show you how to do that in Docker. So let's go ahead and install. It's gonna take a while. I'm gonna pause the video, 
show you back when the, whenever this is done. I really can't believe that this is only 361 kilobyte, which is pretty amazing if you ask me, right? This is really, it's written in C, I think. So, or C plus, I forgot. Last time I checked, it's, it's written in C, so it's a like very, very small footprint, right? Unlike Tomcat, Tomcat is written, written in Java, and it is really heavy stuff, but you can do way more stuff in Tomcat, obviously. But yeah, it's done. <laughs> That's it, okay, we just installed it. Well, in your case, I have installed it before, and then I uninstalled it, so you might know to do it in sudo apt git update, and then sudo apt git install Apache 2, and then you'll have it. So what do we do? Once you install it, you go to a folder called var www root, and there is a folder called HTML. Okay, and there is literally a page called index.html they give you for free to test your stuff. So let's go ahead and see if that works. All right, guys. So I am here on my Mac, my Mac and my Raspberry Pi on the same Wi-Fi, so I can access that stuff. Right. So I'm gonna do go www Raspberry Pi the local. And by default, the Apache 2 listens on port 80. So this spins up a, uh, the server on port 80 by default, okay? So if I do that and then runs, and you can see it works. And I'm using Debian, obviously. Okay, it tells you that, uh, you, hey, you have your Debian distribution. But essentially, it tells you what to do as well. Copy stuff in that, and you get yourself a web server that can serve anything you want okay so since we guys are curious let's do that okay first of all uh, I'm not the owner of that thing for some reason so what I want to do is uh, I want to change the owner of this thing all right guys so before we create our own HTML page and do fancy stuff I want to own that HTML folder here because uh, I'm not the owner of it okay as pi the user okay so what I want to do is go back a little bit and then I want to do a sudo chown which is change owner and the chown this thing in from pi on this folder okay so that means the owner of this is moi okay moi can now write stuff in it because previously I couldn't so I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna do first order of business remove this file Okay, and I'm gonna create one from scratch called index.html. Okay, and uh, it's fancier. It's gonna be fancier. I'm going to do hello world. This is my page hosted on HTTPD or Apache 2 because the first version sucked okay body uh did we close that yes we close this and then we do deet deet, and then that's it we just created an index html let's go back to my mac all right we are in my mac i am about to hit refresh hopefully my server is smart enough to not cache that page and guess what it worked it worked all right and you can pretty much put any stuff there and it will just get hosted for you okay and uh, let's say uh, for example I don't know let's do a main.js file here and that does literally an alert hello word I'm JS okay and then we can edit my index.html and then we can do fancy stuff like that here in the body saying script uh, source equal, was it, what did I call it? Main.js, since it's in the same folder, we can get away with that. So let's do that. And then when we refresh, we're gonna get an alert because my JavaScript got executed. So what happened here, if you literally took a look of that, right? We need to refresh two requests made, right? The first request is to get the index.html. This is the 200 OK. Obviously, we talked about that. We got back an index.html. It's a text, right? And 
that thing when parsed by the browser discovered that there is another thing it needs to pull so that's back to our tcp connection thing guys so if in http 1.0 these two was two tcp connections which is extremely slow because every connection every request will start a tcp connection and close it at the same time now there's something called keep alive i'm alive oh my god this video is gonna get demonetized all right keep alive all right so it's gonna keep it alive keep the connection alive baby that's what it yeah keep the spark alive so once it's keep the connection alive the second request okay we'll actually make that request to get that main.js okay obviously when you write your own web server there you have to do all of that manually you have to do the caching manually you have to do all that stuff but this guy the apache does caching for you okay and, and let's prove it so 304 not modified that's the e-tag okay guys i'm gonna reference the e-tag here go check it out okay, what is what is the concept of that but in a nutshell this is a caching mechanism so what what the first thing the first time let's disable caching and let's let's show you that if i the first time i make a request okay to any content i get back an e-tag okay and the client then use that e-tag with every single request it makes okay so if i make a request now and it sends the client sends that request says hey if none match tell me it does detect change tell me if it didn't change coolish okay but in this case the javascript didn't change so it says nah you're good whatever you have is good okay so let's see how good uh, the apache implementation is so i'm gonna go ahead and do main.js and i'm gonna edit that thing to say alert hello word i am js and i just changed baby okay and sure let's do i don't know another alert message because that's the only javascript code i know I'm kidding guys i'm kidding oh my god all right uh, that's another js right now let's see if the implementation of the thingy is smart so i'm gonna go ahead and what was the our, our original ah, i lost it dash okay no problem it was a certain e-tag the client will attempt to send the same e-tag but what 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 look at that we got the new stuff that's another js right so what happened here is we sent it the same e-tag but we told nope 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 we got a new a-tag okay i don't know gzip is we're zipping this thing that's what it's just like the implementation of the actual web server here okay so the web server says nope it has been modified all right so that's that's essentially the trick guys that's that simple stuff let's show you how node.js works how about that right so we're gonna write our own implementation here so in order to write our own implementation we need some decent editor we cannot we cannot do use vim i mean we can but yeah <laughs> it's just a lot of work okay all right so i have visual studio code here i have node.js installed go ahead and check it out i'm gonna reference a video that we have installed with node.js and all that stuff what i what i want to do essentially is just create a brand new folder with visual studio code let's call this uh web server from scratch okay and then just a brand new folder there's nothing in it okay and you go here and then you click on this guy and you will create a new folder file and that file because i'm writing javascript on the back end you have to write your own code here to do everything okay to serve a web content here so i'm gonna say index uh, index.js and uh, i'm gonna create our index.html page here and uh since we are in the editor, we can actually write the entire HTML with just one click <laughs> instead of having it to write everything. Hey, H1, hey, I wrote all of this myself. Node.js, babes. Okay, so that's the HTML that we want to serve, but we need to listen to a port. We need to 
receive requests, we need to send requests, we have to do all of that stuff. So let's get into it, guys. So and you pick then at the end of the video, you pick what what is the favorite part for you. Okay. So I'm gonna do a, an app here, const app equal require express. Okay, and that's just the bundle. So we need the app. We spin up a version of that. Okay, that's like literally a function call or con constructor or tor. Con C tor. I don't know why every everything is an abbreviation with people. Okay, constructor. Can't you say constructor? Really, you have to type tor tor. Ah, oh, I know, man. API people, guys. I'm telling you. App dot. Here's what I'm gonna do. App dot listen. You're gonna listen to port 8080 because 80 is kind of reserved for highly privileged apps and I'm not one of them. So I can't listen to them. I have to run as a root and I don't want to. So let's just listen to 8080. And when you're done, you say console.log sup. I'm listening. Yes. Uh, what, what do you want? Okay. This is just for what the heck is happening okay this is just for us to know that we're listening correctly but that's not enough okay well let's run it so i can show you okay i have express installed globally so that will work right but that's it sup i'm listening yes sir what do you want okay that's it okay but that's not enough right we need to really accept the request that's if i do that now let's see if i do that and let's say run let's just say local host right see the error i'm getting so now guys if i go and try to go to local host which is my machine 8080 i'm getting this error cannot get why because you didn't implement anything right there's nothing there okay if you refresh there look at all these errors Forget about those, but look at that, 404. Because that's the only thing that the application does. It says, hey, I, there's no, there is nothing on that server. The server is dead, okay? So here's what we need to implement. We need to implement a get method, a get slash method on the root, okay? So that's the first thing we need to implement. Remember, we didn't have to do any of that, okay? Well, we have an index to HTML. It didn't get served. We have to tell it to get served. How? We can do apt or get. On the slash, if someone visited me on the slash, on the root, I want you to call this function. And this function always has to take two parameters, request and response, okay? And then what you do essentially for simplicity is you don't really care about the request. Sometimes you do, obviously, but here we don't. There's nothing in the request. I just want, if someone visited me, I just want to send file and then you send it the index.html file, okay? And to do that, we have to do all that stuff where it's in my directory. This is to avoid hackers pulling all your stuff. So you have to specify, you cannot use relative files here. So you have to do that, okay? So that will take the directory name and then index.html, okay? So that will serve the index.html page, okay? Let's try this, restart. And now if I refresh, Hey, I wrote all of this myself, not JS babes. Okay. You like this, babes? You like it? This is the best, right? This is the best. And if you've served another file, you have to do the same thing again. Okay. Anything. Okay. There's obviously regular expressions that you have, like any, if someone visited anything, then serve them anything. A little bit dangerous, but you have to do you know what you're doing. But that's essentially how you write uh, web content. Can you do something else? Sure, sir. You can do get slash sup anything you want, really. And then request response. You can do. And we have the function here. We can, for example, just send a result. Anything we want. Text. Hello. Okay. And then if I do that. All right, if I go to localhost 8080, I get this. If I do sup, I get hello. And let's see what, what did we get back from the headers? What did we get back from the headers? We get back 304 not modified, and we got back the results, okay? And now, can I change that? Yeah, sure you can. You can do result dot 
status code and instead of 304 you can change it to anything 404 what is the 404 you guys know right 404 is not found although it was found but you can tell it whatever you want that's the flexibility you get when you write your own web server okay although the document is there you can you can have an if statement hey if this this exists do that if this do that you can add all of kind of stuff like like 201 code which is i forgot what it has i think accepted or something like that and create it right you can do anything you want all this stuff if you change this to 418 for instance right this is one of the april fools status codes that have been created look 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 what you get i'm a teapot i don't know what the heck is that <laughs> you can actually change it to whatever you want okay get what 401 i am a teapot that's one of the status codes that has been documented and it's, it's gonna be there forever all right guys that is our video today hope you enjoyed it give it a like if you do and if you learn something subscribe to learn more and share this with your friends and i'm gonna see you in the next one you guys stay awesome WebSocket technology is a bi-directional full duplex protocol for communication between the client and server over the web. It has been standardized in 2011 and it's fully compatible with HTTP. This protocol enables real-time applications such as chatting, notifications, live feed, multiplayer gaming, and other use cases as well. In this video, we will explain what WebSockets are, why it was invented, and we will build actually an example with WebSockets, a client and server using WebSocket. I'm going to use Node.js for that. And we will also talk about the pros and cons of WebSockets because let's be honest, guys, there's no technology that is perfect. Everything has a pros and cons, right? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Hussein, and in this channel, we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. So if you want to become a better software engineer, consider subscribing, hit that bell icon so you get notified whenever I head and you video with that said let's just jump into this video guys web socket here's the agenda here's what we're going to discuss before we jump into any technology i like to go back and say why did we invent this thing okay and that brings us back to http okay i need to talk about http a little bit okay we're going to talk about http what is it okay not in details just little bit okay because we'll, this will allow us to jump into why we have web sockets then we're going to discuss this concept of a web sockets handshake then we're going to discuss a little bit of a use case of a web socket we're going to talk about an example some code yay we're going to show some code and we're going to show you like uh, the pros and cons of this technology we're going to talk about these pros and cons of this technology and you guys you're going to see the jump codes here uh, under the screen where you can just go to that or minute second to watch any of these topics that you're interested in you don't have to watch the whole thing so it's really up to you okay guys what do we have we're going to talk about first of all http 1.0 okay he was like why why are we talking about technology from 1995 very good point okay there was a lot of while researching this video was watching a lot of videos and there is a lot of misconception and wrong information okay so i just wanted to just literally just clarify some of the things http 1.0 which is the first technology that was invented and there here's what how it works okay http protocols obviously guys it's built on the tcp protocol and we made another video about http i'm going to reference it if you want to learn more about it but in a nutshell it's built on the tcp kernel. when we first invented this http first version we said it's gonna be a request response system so the client always makes a request and the server responds to that request it's not the other way around okay the server doesn't just randomly sends information to the client it always the client has to initiate the request and it worked great and it's still working great however when we built this the first version we said okay let's be smart okay tcp is expensive it require memory it require all these descriptors to be saved in the server so when the client opens the uh, the tcp connection and sends the first get request 
Okay, and the server responds, like say, hey, I'm going to get the index.html. The server responds back with the, the actual data. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna be smart. Hey, we just finished the request. Let's close the connection. And then if you wanted to make another request, just go ahead and open another TCP connection, okay? And then request the second thing you want, okay? And now imagine, guys, you have an image, you have a website, okay, with like three, uh, 30 images, and you can open and close connection for every single thing, okay? We just literally killed the performance, okay? That was quickly revised and this model of opening and closing connection did not scale at all okay so we said one one to the rescue okay and and i want to talk about one one because this is what the web sockets was built on and you need that you cannot do web sockets on one zero because of what we're going to discuss now so we said we're going to be smart about it if you're going to make one request the first request you establish a tcp connection and leave it open Make all the requests under this TCP connection, okay? Do not close it unless you're absolutely done with it, okay? And that was using the header called uh, keep alive, okay? And it's kind of, I think it's an ephemeral header, so that means it's, it cannot be propagated through the proxies, okay? But what happens here is like, you send a request, you get the index of Gmail, and you find that there's images that you need to load, CSS files, JavaScript, you go ahead and request, response, request, response. And that, that's great works fine and we close the connection okay this model still working fine till today but there are use cases that need some real time interaction from the server there are use cases that the server needs to send me information despite me not requesting it okay as a client okay and that's why we invented other technologies other before websockets but websockets is became the dominant one here okay let's talk about websockets now so what websockets does is it essentially uses the http 1.1 this pers persistent tcp connection as a vehicle to send data from the client to server and the server and client guide they both aware of each other that means it's no longer stateless it's a stateful right because the server is aware of the client the client is aware of the server the moment this awareness happens it's a stateful, okay? It's a stateful, a stateful thing. HTTP, on the other hand, is stateless because you don't really have this awareness. You can kill the server, restart, and the next request would just be uh, served normally. So how does WebSockets work? The first thing happens, we do the same thing, right? We're about to send a HTTP request. We do the WebSocket handshake, which involves a little bit of information that we're going to talk about. It's still an HTTP request, okay? An upgrade request with some salt and pepper there. But what will happen here, this handshake will first happen between the server. The client will say, hey, I would like to do a WebSocket connection if you would mind, okay? The server will say, hey, I don't support it, or hey, I support it, cool, let's do that. And then what will happen is, there is no there's no order. It's a binary protocol. This WebSocket becomes a binary protocol. It's detached from HTTP, okay? And then it's the Wild West. Anyone can send data to anyone. The server sends client the data because both know of each other now. They have the API access to the underlining TCP connection, okay? With a little bit beautiful API. It's not as ugly as TCP with segments, right? So the server sends information to the client, client sends information to the server, client sends another stuff to the server, server sends back something, client sends that there's no order, okay? And the server sends twice, and client and server sends information concurrently. Who cares? That's what WebSockets, okay? And based on that interactivity, a lot of use cases were born. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit more about the handshake itself. And when we talk about the handshake and the first thing we need to talk about is this protocol which is ws which stands for websockets okay and if you do what websockets on tls then it becomes w websocket secure okay we talked about tls i'm gonna reference it here go go watch that video but here's what we do guys here's what makes websockets really awesome the first request that we make 
is an HTTP normal GET request, right? That means when we make that request, it's an HTTP 1.1, so I mean, I'm gonna establish the persisted connection that we talked about. But here's the special thing. There is an upgrade header in that, uh, in that request, and that's really powerful stuff, okay? So it's really a good request, a simple request. The server takes that because it's a web server. We talked about web server. I'm gonna reference it here. We talked about a lot of stuff in this channel, right? And uh, it's a web server, so it consumes that, but here's what, it, if the server knows that there is, it, the client is trying to upgrade this one one connection to something else, to WebSocket in this case, the server will reply either cool, I'm switching the protocol and the code, the status code is 101. You know, the status code, guys, 404, 200, 201. This is a special status code says 101, switching protocol, you cool. And once we switch the protocol, then we start communicating with this binary protocol. So that's the handshake, essentially. And it has to work on 11 because of this persistence that we talked about, guys, right? It will never work with 1.0, okay? And recently, I think uh, also WebSockets work with HTTP2 because it's the same concept, right? It's still persistent connection. And we close the connection. And here's, uh, here's how the actual handshake looks like, right? I took this from Wikipedia. Okay, and then you do a GET request on, for example, any endpoint. It doesn't have to be chat. You can name it literally anything you want. It has to be HTTP 1.1. And you say, hey, I'm this host. Uh, you can block this host if you don't want to. And you want to upgrade this to WebSocket. You want to upgrade, uh, connection upgrade. That's the special. Hit. And there's these keys, right? And using these keys, the server will take them, will do does some seeding and hashing, and then send back a new WebSocket accept, okay? So that you take the value and the client will verify that it's actually that server is the one who sent me that value, okay? This is just for the server receive information from the actual client. We get that WebSocket, and that's it, okay? So we receive 101 switching protocol, and we're good. So that's, you can build your own web server, WebSocket server that does know how to deal with that, but you can always use an existing library that does that for you, because it's a little tricky to do the binary protocol, right? And uh, use cases. Why do I need this duplex, full duplex, or whatever you called it, Hussein? Why do we need that? Chatting, right? You know, chatting is not something great for request response. It's not, you're not loading a page. The client can receive a message, like WhatsApp, right? Someone can send you a message without you requesting it, right? You don't want to say, hey, is that a message for me? Is that a message for me? Is that a message for me? Is that... You don't want to ask for that, right? You want the message to get, quote unquote, pushed for you when there is a message, right? So chatting is a perfect example for this, right? And uh, having the client request something only to find out that there is no chat for you is just not working, okay? And live feed. Hey, I want to connect to this feed, and whenever there is a blog post, just let me know, okay? Or any any notification, Facebook notification, right? I'm not saying that web, Facebook uses WebSockets for this, but I'm saying that's one way of doing it. I think Google Wave, when it first launches, I do remember them using WebSockets, and it was really amazing back in 2011, right? And I, like, I still remember that video, and I was watching that video, and they were just typing, and the immediate window, you can see that, hey, type, uh, person one is typing a message, and that was really mind-blowing, because uh, I know that HTTP couldn't do that, obviously, right? So it was a little, little awesome to do the to hear about that. Multiplayer gaming, obviously, you can build gaming. Multiplayer gaming is like, hey, multiple players, they send input and the second uh, client can receive information, right? So here's a little, a little bit tricky, okay? When you when you have multiple clients connecting to one WebSocket server, this WebSocket server have to maintain multiple connections, multiple TCP connections with each of those guys, okay? And that was makes it also more stateful. And statefulness means what, guys? We talked about this. 
you cannot easily horizontally scale stateful application because the moment you destroy the server all those guys just dead right you can obviously write it in a stateful way but it requires it's not it's not natural right you have to write more code to make it stateless in order for it to horizontally scale doesn't mean that it cannot horizontally scale okay show client progress login you know when you upload a, a file you want the server to send you updates that hey the file has been 70 percent uploaded 80 percent uploaded or you're rendering a video you're like make this mp4 into a gif or gif uh whatever party you are okay so if you upload that video you want the client the server to send you information about that okay uh so yeah you can use websockets for that you don't have to though i want you to keep that in mind WebSocket is not a solution for everything, okay? Don't get attached to anything, guys. Don't get attached to that technology. Code time! WebSocket example. Here's what I want to do, guys, okay? I want to show you an example of a raw WebSocket client server, okay? And to do that, I'm going to do it in a very bare bone. A lot of people make the mistake of when they want to learn WebSocket, they go download some sample that has a chatting application. And that's like... To me, at least, it was like the worst way to learn, okay? Because web chatting application is not, is not easy to implement with WebSockets because you have to have multiple array of connections and all that stuff too. It's not easy to understand. So in my opinion, I'd like to show you how this server talks to a client, client talks to server with, with very basic stuff. So we're gonna write the server and the client will be, guess what? It will be the browser from the console window because we can write javascript code there and it's beautiful guys how powerful javascript is because this websocket client is available literally on your browser so i'm not gonna allow you to i don't i'm not gonna let you raw uh, forces you to write html code and script tags and all that stuff right so we'll try to write as as less code as possible let's just jump into it all right guys so i have visual studio code here because it's the best editor ever you can argue with that if you want to but visual studio code i really like it because it's very lightweight and supports a lot of scripting languages python javascript typescript name it all right so i like it and um, we're gonna build our own web circuit server okay using visual studio code using node.js okay so we're going to build that so you have to install you have to have node.js installed obviously on this machine in order to build that okay so let's start with that i'm going to start from scratch i'm going to obviously go to open i'm going to create a brand new folder here on my javascript folder here i'm going to create uh let's call it web socket demo okay and then just like that open and then here's what I want to do. I want to create a new file called index.js, okay? Because it's nano.js, right? And then what else do we need? Let's initialize this project with npm. So go to terminal and then literally we don't really care. Just do npm dash uh, init dash y. That means, hey, initialize, initialize this project with whatever. And this will create us the package.json. We don't really care about that. This is just for us to debug. Okay. And then here's what we want to do, guys. Okay. Let's zoom in so you guys can see. We will create uh, the HTTP server here. And this is using the HTTP library here. And that will have the persisted web server that we talked about. Okay. So that's the web server that we're going to create. We're going to create a server using this native thing okay which is the http server we're going to spin up a little bit of a mini server mini web server and then take that server inject it into another library that will allow us to do that handshake we talked about so let's do that guys so http and here's what we do right const i'm going to create http server equal http dot create server and that essentially takes a request and response function and then I am going to just literally just log it here. We have received a request. And we will add a breakpoint here because here is the first call of the request will come here because 
specifically if you create a new WebSocket, the first call is what, guys? The Git upgrade, remember? So I want to show you that Git upgrade here. And when we have the server, we can just listen. And let's use a port that I never used before. I think 8080 is free. Okay. And then let's just say console.log. My server is listening on port 8080. Don't make fun of me. Okay. Listening. That's, it's funny because that's when I first learned English, I used to literally read this listening and it was, it was funny. Okay. Yay. Laughing guys. <laughs> okay. So that's the first thing we need to do, right? Let's just run it, make sure it works. Okay. Obviously there's nothing. Hey, okay. My server is listening. That's not a web socket though, right guys? That's not a web socket. Let's make a web socket. And here's how we do it. Okay. We're going to do web socket. Let's make it capitals because it's a class web socket server equal require web socket dot server. Okay. And that will give us the class which will have this beautiful uh, events, like say, hey, if you receive the message, do this. If you receive the connection, do this. If you do this, um, and all that events, which makes it stateful, obviously, guys, right? So we have a WebSocket server. Here's what you do next. We're going to create a WebSocket, if I can spell it right. WebSocket server. And here's what it takes. It takes a JSON, and that JSON is http server and you pass it the http server you just created is it it needs that it's just remember guys this is just the handshake part and the messaging right we're going to use that protocol to to actually uh authenticate right do the handshake so we need to send it the http server that we just used which underneath it has a socket which has the tcp connection so we send it that thing sweet what else? What should I do next? Next, what you do is you have to have a, an event here on request. If someone requests this WebSocket, right, go ahead and call this function. Here's what happens here, guys. So the first thing we do, we make this get request, right? And uh, that get request have the upgrade. It comes here and then you decide as a server whether you want to accept this WebSocket request from the client or not. And guess what guys? I'm gonna accept it. I am going to accept it because I accept everything. And then this this uh, this parameter is interesting. You can create your own like fancy protocols. Like if your server supports like gaming, you built like a gaming protocol, you built like a chatting protocol, you can you can accept whatever the client sends you. You cannot just accept any WebSockets that that won't be secure, right? So you can you can kind of accept the things that the client will support. Okay. And we're gonna accept anything because it's just an example here. So null. Okay. And then the origin here, which is request.origin. Do you want to you can check the origin if that origin is not trusted or you don't like it. You can just say, nah, I don't want to accept that. And here is the interesting part, guys. We're going to get a connection of this. Connection. Okay. I know people make fun of my accents, like connections. I, I don't know how to say connection. Connection. Okay. <laughs> okay. So connection. We're going to get a connection. I'm going to make this as a, to quote unquote, global variable, whatever. Right. So let connection equal no. And I used let here because I'm going to override it. I cannot use const because I'm going to override this literally. So I'm going to do connection equal that. And then here's the thing. If you do connection, you can add other stuff on, on open. If the connection has been opened, call this function, right? Console.log opened. Let's zoom out a little bit. I think you can read it in this way, guys, right? And then if the connection is closed, do this, close, right? And you can do some other stuff here, maybe notify the database to do something, right? So you can write any function you want here. You know, we don't really need to do the variable here, right? And here's the most important function of them all. It's called on message. If you receive a message, get me the message. And here's what I want to do with this message. What are we going to do with the message, right? 
I'm not fancy. This message will just literally print it, right? I'm gonna print whatever I receive from the client. And it has to be an event, guys, right? So, uh, received message, and then we can say message dot, I think it's called UTF data, something like that. All right, we'll, we'll find out. Okay, I, I don't remember what it, the property is, but we're gonna find out, guys. Don't worry about it. Do not worry about it, okay? And then, obviously, that's it, I think. That's it, we receive a request, open, close, message, and that's it, right? And here is, let's, let's run, let's run, let's run. We got an error, cannot find module WebSocket. Well, what, what do we do, guys? Simple, npm install WebSocket in the same folder. So we can install this technology. Install this model for me. Okay, that's one of the modules, guys. There's socket IO. There's other other stuff, but that's that's what I saw. That it's like the simplest one, really. Uh, it's big though. I don't know why. Okay. Can you build your own? Of course, you can go ahead and try that. Download the uh, the RFC and then write your own. But it's up to you if you want to write your own. Okay, but okay, let's try it. I'm gonna listen to eighty eighty. And we're listening. Okay, our WebSocket server is ready, guys. Okay, let's go through the code a little bit quick before we jump into the client and write that. So we have the HTTP server, which is like the raw server. Okay, we have the WebSocket server, which allows to do this uh, web, uh, the handshake, right? Because it's, it's exactly this thing, right? On request, when I do accept, that will send back the switching protocol that we talked about. And we get a connection as a result. And that connection, we're going to do beautiful stuff with it. And that connection, we're going to take that connection. There is a method called send. And we can use it to send information from the server to the client. Remember, guys, I am in the server here. This is the server code. Okay. Let's go to the client. I'm gonna create a new page here and literally go here and then more tools, developer tools, or in Firefox, you can, I think, call Web Console or something like that. And here's the beauty of this thing, guys. Since it's JavaScript, since WebSocket comes with every single browser, you can write this WebSocket client right there, okay? And I'm not gonna bother writing HTML code. Let's do that, okay? So I'm gonna do a let WS equal new web socket. Guess what? That's that's what you do. What's the protocol? WS, right? Because this is a web socket. What's the IP? Uh, what's the host name? It's localhost. It's on the same machine. What's the IP address? 8080, right? I was like, this is the thing we're working on running on. It's running on 8080. And then when we do that, let's make sure we have all the Let's make sure we have all the breakpoints so we don't miss anything. So here we're going to do. Hit enter. The first thing we get. What? We got a request, guys. We can use that request to guess what? Get the origin. We have the Chrome search, whatever the origin is that. And then when I do that, I accept the connection. I just got the connection now, right? And then... We set the events, obviously just wire the events, and guess what? We received it. Here's what I want to do now, guys. I'm not gonna stop. I'm, I'm not gonna stop debugging. I'm gonna go back to the client, and here's what I want to do. When I do WS, I want to wire the events on the client, which I did not do. On message, if someone sent me a message, I want to take that message and then, guess what? I want to print it. I want to print that message. Uh, we received a message from server. And the message is, that's how, by the way, how do you, how do, you do what it's called? The uh, text, uh, which is like inline formatting. So I just want to print the message dot data. I think that's what, how you do it, okay? And if we do that, nothing will happen. We just wired the event. So when someone from the server, from the server sends the client a message, we should get something printed here. How about we test, guys? I'm going to go to the server here. And in the debug, I have access to the connection, right, guys? 
I'm going to do connection. Let's send. What? Hello, client. It's me, Asar. And then hit enter. Let's go back. What? Look at that. We received a message from the server. Hello, client. It's me, Asar. How about that, guys? Should we, do the, should we do the other thing? Let's do it, guys. Let's continue continue that. Let's go back to this to the client and then say ws dot. How do you do that? Send. Hello, server. It's me, client, baby. All right. And then let's make sure we have the breakpoint. We do have a breakpoint. So this function should be called because on message, right? On message is the function that will be called when the server received a message. Let's receive a message and send. We sent a message and we didn't get it. What's going on? So <laughs> apparently I I typed the wrong event name. It's not called on message or on open or on close. It's just message close open, right? Let's restart and let's try again. Since we are restarting, guys, obviously, that just proves my point that is, this thing is stateful. Look at that. There's a word state there. Okay, so it's just dead. So how do we do this again? It's okay. Just connect again. Let's just do it again, all right? So let's establish the connection once again, okay? Let's just do WS. Boop. We go come here. We forgot we removed the connection. Then that, just like that, we have a connection now. Let's do the message. And then we have the log here. Let's go ahead and w to send. Hello, server. It's me, client, baby. This time it should work. What? Look at that. And immediately, boom, boom. All right, got it. And now here's... What I, what I didn't know is like, what is this called, right? So message is essentially a JSON object and there is something called dot UTF-8 data, okay? So that's what we sent, UTF-8 data. So we can do dot UTF-8 UTF data, okay? So now if I do this, it should just print it. Okay, let's restart it one more time. One more time. Right, one more time, guys. We're getting deep. we're gonna get it. All right. Ooh, request. Accept that request. Let's do this again. Do the wire the message on the client, and then how about we clear this and then send, and we get it. We print it, and there you go. We have the message here. Receive message from the client. It's me, client baby. All right, guys. So here's what I want to do now. Okay, I want you can now you can. Take this and run with it, right? The trick here is the connection. If you want to build a chatting application, you have to build an array of connection. And every time a client comes, you add it to this array. You push this connection to an array. And then you start maintaining these states of connections, pool of connections. And then every time someone sends a message, you can send the group message back to all the connections, okay? So we can build something like that. I'd rather build it in another video and we focus on just the raw web sockets here. I want you to understand that it's a, it's a connection. You can send information from both states, okay? And uh, let's build one more function here. I wanna build uh, this, I wanna configure the server to send a message to the client every five seconds, like a random number. So how do I do that, okay? So I wanna build a function like, uh, stop this function, uh, function send uh, every five seconds, okay? And then here's what I wanna do. I want to literally do connection dot send, and then message, I'm gonna send a message and then math.random literally any random number i just want to send a message to to this to the client okay i don't know this could be logging this could be anything you want right so we're sending the connection to the, the server uh the client messages right all the time after every second how do we do that set timeout okay and uh, literally just call yourself every 5000 milliseconds and that's it that's it but this function is never called so 
after a connection is accepted, go ahead and call this function, which will always send a message to the client. Let's do this again, guys. So guys, can we build an application that have like a decent client? Our client is lame, but you can you get the idea, right? You can't build a script that actually does exactly what we're writing. I just want I don't want to write a lot of code. I try to ma minimize the number of code that we write. Okay. Obviously, this thing is broken now, right? The ready state is three. We need to establish a brand new shiny object. Go ahead and write that. And now the client, by the way, the server started sending us messages, but we cannot receive them. You know why, guys? Because we didn't wire the on message event here. That's what confused me. On messages in the client, right? On the server, it's not called on message, it's just called message. Okay. Yep. Let's do this. Now, yep. We got a message. We received message from server. Message function random. Yikes. I know what's going on here, guys. We're sending the entire function, Jason. <laughs> All right, let's fix this. Yeah, I forgot to invoke the function. You know the difference, guys, right? I am sending literally the stringified JSON of the function, right? I didn't invoke the random function to give me a random number. I literally just sent off the function, which was dumb. Okay, guys, let's do this again. I, I By the way, guys, I'm going to make the code available, so don't worry about having to, to pause the video, right? But yeah, we received the message, accept that. Let's go ahead and accept it. Uh, wire the message and there you go. One, two, three, four, five. Five, there you go. One, two, three, and four, and five. All right, guys, okay. You got the idea, guys. So you can we send something in the to the server while we're doing that? Sure, hello? Babes, you can. Oh, if only I can write. If only I can write. Yeah, sure, we can receive message. Just remove these breakpoints, and you can see that babes receive a message. We send another babe message. We can get it here, right? We get the messages. Then there's it's a two way communication between a client and server. So now, guys, if you want to build like multiple clients, one server, you gotta you can always do that, right? Okay. Our server currently does not support multiple clients. If you do, it will accept it, but it's going to be very bad because we're we're having just one variable, one object maintaining the connection and whoever last twins essentially. And you're going to leak stuff and it's, it's really bad. Okay. If you close the connection, obviously, let's try that. Close the connection. Is that how you do it? Close. And if you close, essentially closed and you know what how this what happened here right we called this function essentially okay sweet guys let's go back and talk about pros and cons all right guys we learned about web sockets we saw an example now we need to learn about this pros and cons of this technology because there's nothing perfect there's always pros and cons okay so what's bad about this what's good about this what's good about this pros it's full duplex. So if you are building an application that requires the server to send you updates, okay, you do not need to do polling essentially. And you do not need to ask the server, hey server, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You don't you don't have to do that. And that's you have to do that with HTTP with with HTTP because it's a request response system, right? Full duplex, on the other hand, you don't have to. Server can send you information, client can send you information, right? And you can build it for gaming and you can build really cool apps with this technology. It's HTTP compatible because of the upgrade header. Without that, proxies will fail, things can go bad, nobody can know this is actually a WebSocket, right? If you started just creating a socket, right, and, and sending binary information, the, the the firewall start blocking because it's like what the heck is this right what are you sending me All right but because it started with an upgrade with a legit http request and then we upgraded it to a web socket that kind of passes all the internet infrastructure and it will sh should should work with the with anything right there are problems there but we're going to talk about them <laughs>
It's far from friendly because it's a standard HTTP. It's only 443 or 80. Well, you can listen on any other port, and that's how HTTP works, right? HTTP web server, you can listen to any port you want, but usually it's just 40 if it's just uh, 40. <laughs> usually it's 80 when it's insecure, it's 443 when it's secure, okay? And what else? Oh, we're already out of good things. <laughs> I can probably think of more good things. I just didn't add it. Cons! Proxying is very tricky, guys. Nginx just recently started adding this to to the to its uh, WebSocket support, right? It's it's real tricky to know that hey, you're 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 receiving a, a WebSocket request and you have to do like HTTP upgrade and the client the server has to respond to the HTTP, especially if it's the proxy is a layer seven proxy. Because, you know, we talked about layer seven and layer four load balancing and proxying, guys, I'm gonna reference the video here. And what happens essentially with layer seven is proxy has to break the TLS, right? It has to terminate the TLS most of the time in order to look at the layer seven data, which is HTTP. And the moment it does that, it has to create its own TCP connection with the destination server, and God knows how you can handle this WebSocket, and, and because there will be a bidirectional between the proxy and the server, and then another bidirection between the client and and the and the proxy is just a mess, all right? Okay, so I really recommend just doing a layer four load balancer or a proxying, and just never worrying about it. Okay. Yeah, layer seven load balancing is very challenging. Dealing with timeouts because proxy HTTP or normally have a timeout, right? Server timeout, okay. But WebSockets shouldn't have timeouts because you're using the connection. Yes, of course it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna stay open for a long time, even if it's not used. You shouldn't terminate that for me because I can use it at any second, right? So timeouts is, tr is tricky. Right, and uh, you probably don't care about these things, but it's good to mention. It's a stateful protocol, right? We talk, we saw this literally this variable called connection, and it is literally on my server. So if I sort of start my server, my connection is dead, the client is dead, and you just you just lost the connection essentially, right? You have to reestablish that. Okay, so. It, since it's stateful, it's really hard to horizontally scale. Okay. Does that mean you cannot horizontally scale? No, it does not mean that. You can write web sockets in, you can persist the sockets. You can you can write smart application to use a third, uh, like a serve, a database service, like a Postgres, to kind of persist the connection IDs and have numbers in them and then you read the connection and then you have to maintain the state in the database. And even if the database died, it will just, if this, uh, not the if the, if the server died, it can read back all the connections from the database and do a smart thing and reestablish those, right? If you want to, right? It's still, it's still not easy. The client has to be written in a way to do the statelessness thing, okay? It's not impossible, but it's very tricky, okay? So that's essentially pros and cons. Do you have to use WebSocket, guys? Do you have to use it? No. Okay, I know, I know, all right? It's a cool technology, but doesn't mean we have to use it, okay? It really depends on what you're trying to do, right? The question is like, do you absolutely need bi-directional communication? That's the rule of thumb. That's, I, I just came up with that, right? So if you want the server to send you information and the client to send information to the server, like gaming, absolutely, it's cool. You can use WebSockets. But if you only want like request response, like you're, you're hosting a web page, don't use WebSockets, right? Because why? Just use a normal, beautiful, stateless HTTP, right? That's why HTTP survived this long, because it's so beautiful. Beautiful and simple. Simplicity rules, guys. Simplicity rules. Okay. WebSocket's also simpler, right? But 
still it's more complex than HTTP, right? So if you absolutely need to move to more directional communication, that was a terrible British accent, I'm sorry. So if you absolutely need to move to bi-directional communication, then you use WebSocket. But there's still stuff that we invented, guys, that is long polling, okay? I don't, I don't think I made a video about long polling, but essentially the client can send a request and just wait until the server has information, okay? To, to essentially, uh, to avoid this messes, right? If I, if I want to make a request to get the data and the data is not available yet, you can use long polling, it's a little, again, it's tricky, but the server will not send you information until it gets you, it gets some information. Kafka uses long polling, and they have good reasons about that, okay? Because WebSocket, the problem with WebSocket is the server doesn't know that the client has disconnected as well. It's just like, it's, it's like really, really weird to push data to the client if you don't know if the client is there or not. You cannot assume that. You can use the socket connection, obviously, to, to tell you that, but you cannot rely on it. Okay, long polling is one. Event source is another thing. I'm going to make a video about it, but it's, it's pretty cool. If you want just the other way, you want the server to always send you information like a notification. You don't have to use WebSocket. It's the one way, but the other way. It's the server sending you a request all the time. Okay, you can send client server, but the server always pushes you information if there is uh, if there is data like notification or push notification that's perfect and you can use event source so it's like the other way okay long polling is just hey give me information if this available but event source is really powerful stuff so we can make a video but most 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 use cases you can solve them with event source okay except chatting right where i mean even chatting you can solve it with event source because if the server receives information, just send it to me, okay? All right, so complexity versus simplicity, guys, okay? Summary, what we have done, what we have learned in this video, guys. We learned HTTP, okay? We talked about HTTP, the basis of all things, the simplest protocol ever, the most beautiful protocol ever. And then we talked about WebSockets this bi-directional full duplex thing, right? We talked about that. We talked about the handshake, which is the upgrade protocol, switching protocol 101 code. We talked about use cases, real-time live feed, right? You don't have to use WebSocket, but you can use them for that, right? Really think hard about use cases, guys. Now, example, we've, we've written a Node.js application that is a web server, essentially, a WebSocket server. Okay, the client was so simple, it was just literally three lines of code, and we did not even open Visual Studio Code to write that code. We wrote it in my Chrome browser. How coolish is that, guys? Say it with me, it's coolish. Okay, it's very coolish. So there's a difference between cool, there is not cool, way in the bottom, there is cool, way in the up, and coolish is a little bit below cool, right? It's almost cool but it's just coolish right it's the ultimate state of the mind you want to reach you want to reach coolish you don't want to be cool right you want to be coolish so websocket pros and cons we talked about all that stuff we talked about when do you use websocket all right guys if you enjoyed this video give it a like and share it with your friends and hope you really enjoyed this video and you learn and uh subscribe to learn more about software engineering, to become a better software engineer, and I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys, leave me a comment in the below if you want to learn anything. If you want a new video about anything that is in your mind, I'm going to do some research and talk about it if, I, if, I, if that interests me, right? All right, guys. You guys stay awesome. I'm going to see you in the next one. Goodbye. What is going on guys? My name is Hussein and in this video I want to talk about how you scale WebSocket connections guys to run on multiple servers and uh, 
Uh, I'm gonna show you how uh, first illustrate that how WebSocket works. I am going to illustrate how you scale WebSocket connection with a with a reverse proxy such as a HA proxy or Nginx. Um, and once we do that, I'm gonna show you exactly a demo or some some code that I wrote that simulates a live chat application that is scalable with Docker, right? So I'm, I'm gonna spin up a little bit of a multiple servers with the multiple WebSocket servers and one Redis connection and, and uh, one reverse proxy and we're gonna distribute all this beautiful connection websocket -y stuff and that's gonna be fun right how about we do that right you can skip to the code part if you're interested I'm gonna put the jump code below well, that's it let's just jump into it all right guys so a whoops whoopsocket connection here's how whoopsocket connection work I made a video about whoopsockets go ahead and check them out if you want details but in a nutshell if you have a client here and you have a web server that's a normal web server the first thing that the client does is it tries to establish just a normal HTTP connection and it does hey I want to do a get request but that get request has a something very special in it it has something called the upgrade header right and that upgrade here is like hey sir web server i know we just established a tcp connection for the http session but is there a chance i can upgrade that to a web socket the server says wait a second upgrade web socket yeah i do support that right go ahead and let's reuse this connection for web socket from now on that http session is now hijacked just for web socket now this is only true for HTTP 1.1. This is not true in case of HTTP 2. HTTP 2 a little bit more nuanced. The one stream of HTTP 2, one th almost like one thread of HTTP 2, right? The stream will be used for WebSocket connection because it will, will be just a waste to waste the whole TCP connection just for a WebSocket, right? But that's another topic for another day all right so what we're gonna do is like a, the server now can send information just randomly to the client the client can send information to the server it's just a bi-directional thing right and that's how web sockets generally work right so it's a very stateful thing so we're using we're aware of this connection we are aware of this connection and the client just sends information to this connection it, che it checks the state of the connection right so how do you scale something that is stateful, right? With HTTP, it's pretty simple, right? Because it, it's uh, just make a request to the reverse proxy and the reverse proxy can load balance and hit that request to any web server at the back end and they will be able to uh, serve us. But WebSocket is a little bit different, right? So let's, let's take the same example with WebSocket. And here's what we're going to do. I am going to simulate three clients. The first client is the red client, right? We have red. Here's what we're going to do. We will have some sort of a reverse proxy here and listening to certain port, let's say 80 or 443, probably 443 for security reasons. And uh, that reverse proxy will establish the connection on our behalf to the backend server. So these guys are the WebSocket servers now, right? WebSockets, 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 right? So these are the WebSocket servers. So how do I scale? Here's the interesting part here. If the first client made a request and says get upgrade, right? That reverse proxy, if it supports WebSocket, and there's a big if, not all reverse proxies support uh, WebSocket connection. So you need to find some someone that does, right? So I know HA proxy does, Nginx does, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the rest, right? So now we have a request here and it checks the reverse proxy says, oh, you want to upgrade the header, huh? I know how to deal with this. Let me, just a second, let me let me connect to one of the servers and let's say the load, load balancing algorithm is uh, round robin. So it's going to connect you to this server. And now there is one TCP connection between the reverse proxy and the, um, and the backend server. And there's a one TCP connection between you and the reverse proxy, right? But since this is WebSockets, right, protocol, that reverse proxy will act like a layer four proxy. So it will stream every single packet that you send from now on to always go to this server. That's it. That There's a dedicated TCP connection to this client. So it's like an almost, almost act like a one, one TCP connection, but it's really not. 
there are some implementation that where this is physically one TCP connection, so where this guy acts like a gateway, just like your router, but this is outside the scope of this video. But let's just uh, say for simplicity, you now you understand that, right? Okay, let's pick my second beautiful yellow client. My yellow client here now makes another TCP connection. Well, uh, once a web socket, right? So that reverse proxy will say, okay, round robin, I the first request was to this guy. So now the second request goes to this guy and so on, right? So let's just go the blue guy, sha. This guy, this is the WebSocket connection. So now let's just uh, simulate what would happen here if I start sending requests, right? That's what will happen. If I start sending, so let's say the server starts sending information to the client, right? So we'll start sending information. The reverse proxy will say, oh, wait a second, this is part of this. So it will link it somehow to this, right? So it's like almost like one connection. Any request that you send will go to this client. Now this client, if it sends information to that TCP connection, it will go through that pipe, right? And let's say the client, the yellow client now sends information here, it will go through this, and the blue will go through this, right? So frequent requests will not be load balanced. That that's, that's what you need to understand with WebSockets because you cannot just, the yellow client suddenly jump to go to the other server because there is state here, guys. There is state that these guys agree on. Like if you're building a chatting application or a game, there is a state that is here. You cannot just abandon that state and just jump to another one. You can, but it's, it's really, really hard to build, right? It's just, it's almost impossible to do that, right? So you do that and that's the idea. That's how you scale WebSocket connection. So you, this guy's acting essentially as a layer four load balancer, but the configuration is technically a layer seven because why? Because this guy actually looked at the header and says, oh, what a, this is upgrade connection. How does it know it's upgrade? It looks, it looks at the header and, and sees, right? So, uh, and uh, I'm no, I'm, I'm, I'm omitting a lot of details, guys. I know this probably, this guy is a TLS terminator where it actually, has a secure certificate serving the certificates, but at the back end, you can either be secure or insecure. It's really up to you guys. All right. All right, guys, to the fun part, the coding part. So I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining the architecture of the application, the live chatting application that I built. And then uh, we will uh, essentially just show you the code. How about we do that, guys? All right. So here's what I have here. I have a Redis instance here right and i have the same thing these guys w web circuit servers right it's a bunch of uh, web socket servers and this is the reverse proxy which in my case it's ha proxy and these are the clients so these clients want to communicate with each, with each other right they all entered a like a, a lobby and they want to start chatting with each other so that's the application so the red guy connects obviously, which will obviously be streamed to one of those servers. And that's it. Now one TCP connection, almost like a logical TCP connection between the client and this server one. Okay. Let's take the second client, which is uh, blue in this case. Communicate. It's the second server. And the final client is the green client. So this guy connected to this guy, and this guy to connect to this guy, right? And that's that's absolutely fine. So the first problem here, if, if this guy started to send chat messages, says hi, right? How do this hi propagates to this guy and this guy, the client number, this these two clients, right? These are completely different servers, guys. So here's what I did, right? I used Redis as a pop sub system in this case. I know I talked about Redis, guys. Check out the video I made about Redis and WebSockets. I, I, I really generally ch uh, encourage you to, to read about these backend technologies. Really, really, pretty cool technologies, right? I'm going to use another color here for the backend. And here's what I'm going to do I use the pop sub technology. And we talked about pop sub in this channel, guys, right? And what we're going to do here, I created a channel called live chat right and i made all these guys when they spin up i made them subscribe to this live chat channel to this channel okay and when what does it mean to subscribe that means if someone published something to this 
those three guys will see it immediately. And here's what we're going to do. So this client sends a message, says hi, which will be transferred to this guy, which then is responsible to publish the hi message to the live chat, which will, the Redis uh, code will trigger and it will say, okay, who's subscribed to the live chat? Oh, this guy, this guy, this guy. So this guy will get it. This guy will get it. Also, this guy will get it as well. And what will happen is like, okay, there will be code that will say, whenever we receive a message from the channel, go ahead and push it to all my clients. So in this case, hi, hi will be transferred back to everybody. So what well, this is the client, this client will get the message, this client will get the message. Also, this client will get the message because <laughs> we'll just get his message back, right? Because we don't know, right? We just subscribe and the message will be distributed to all of these guys. How about we actually show you the code? That's the most fun part. It's really, really simple because I just use Docker for the whole thing. That's it. You just need Docker and Visual Studio Code to write the code. How about we jump into it? So here's the code, guys. I'm going to go through the Docker Compose. And guys, you might say, what the heck is Docker Compose? Check out the video I made here on microservices and how to spin up all this stuff. So the first thing is the load balancer, which is this puppy, right? And I'm going to use HA proxy, and I talked about HA proxy in this channel. Go check out the course I built on uh, HA proxy. And we're, we're going to listen in port 8080. And here's the HA proxy configuration. We'll go, go through that. And what we're building here, we're spinning four or three. Actually, four. Huh, how about four WebSocket servers, right? And the WebSocket logic server is actually in this image, which we are about to show. That That's the code we written that... Oh, connect to this Redis instance and, and publish and connect and send information back. The, all this logic lives in the, in the web circuit server itself. And I'm just sending some app ID here so we know which server we're connecting to. It's just uh, mumbo jumbo, nothing fancy here. And then finally, the Redis server that does uh, all this magic, right? And here's the host names. These are host names, essentially. Okay. And now go, let's go to the HA proxy configuration. The HA proxy configuration, you see large timeouts, and these are very, very critical because the HA proxy will terminate the connection if nobody's communicating for an X amount of time, right? And we don't want that because this is a stateful connection and there will always be some people not sending messages for a long time, right? So we need to keep this connection open. So what do we need to do is like uh, configure a backend, and this backend will have four servers. Server WS and WS1, WS2, WS3, WS4, listening on port 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, right? And this is just like logical server names that is for the configuration, all right? And uh, what is the final piece? The Docker file, which, which will build our application, all right? This will be building a Node.js application that will have the WebSocket server, which we discussed in, in another video, right? And how to build it. And this is the Node.js application itself. We are using HTTP module. We are using the WebSocket module. Obviously, we need the Redis as well. And we're taking the app ID. And here's what we're going to do. We will create two connections from the WebSockets, a subscriber connection and a publisher connection. And that's too bad because I don't like this. But I think, I guess this is just the limitation that the Redis team have, right? Because this is what we're talking about. Because this guy is also a publisher and a subscriber, you need two TCP connection. And the reason is, the moment you subscribe, you cannot publish on the same TCP connection for limitation reasons. Obviously, Quick will definitely solve this problem. I have no idea if Redis team will ever move to Quick, but that's definitely one solution, right? There will be one TCP connection, well, UDP in this case, but uh, a stream will be reserved for a subscriber and another stream will be reserved for a publisher. I think that's a great solution. Uh, RabbitMQ came up with the idea of channels, so I don't know why uh, uh, the Redis team can also implement that. Uh, channels in the TCP. Right, so they need to augment their risk protocol to do that. Anyway, so sorry about guys, guys. I just ramble a lot when it comes to these technical de details. I love this stuff, guys. All right, so we have publish and subscriber for each one. On subscribe, if someone subscribed to you, just immediately publish a message. That's just garbage. There's nothing really special about this. But if I receive a message from the subscriber, this is this way, right? If I'm going this way, right, from the Redis to this. If I received a message, go ahead and loop through every single WebSocket connection that I have 
and send that message to my subscriber. So in this case, I'm going to send it to the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy obviously is smart enough to send it to the right client, right? Because it's all, all this logic is lives in the probably the NAT, right? N network allocation table. I might be wrong there. And we're subscribing to the live chat and the on the Redis server. Okay. Uh, we created this is just a WebSocket logic connection. We created a bland TCP connection and then inherit that uh, logic in the HTTP server. Uh, listening on port 8080, that explains why we have all bunch of 8080s here, right? And uh, on request, this is the connection upgrade. If I am open, close, uh, do this events. If someone just sent me a message, do this, right? And publish that message to the Redis server on the live chat channel. Channel is very overloaded, huh? Channel on RabbitMQ means differently, completely different thing than a channel on Redis. <laughs> All right, so set timeout, obviously, and uh, this is just a, a timeout that whenever your connection after five seconds, I will tell you, hey, you're connected to server one or two or three. And then you can, as obviously, have many connections. So I'm going to add this connection to a pool of connections array that I have here. And that's it. And that's the client code. How about we actually test that thing, guys? So to do that, we need to do two things. Let's uh, clear all my previous attempts here. We are going to do docker dash docker build dash t uh, ws app. Is that what I called it? ws app. That's the image, right? So ws app and then dot. This will build the late. That's the first thing you need to do. Build the Docker image for the WebSocket and we'll build it from basically from this guy, right? The second thing we need to do is Docker compose uh, up. That's it. That will start spinning up all those beautiful WebSocket servers, all those beautiful HA proxies and Redis and everything. So it looks like we're up and running. How about we start testing this thing? I'm gonna open a brand new Chrome. I'm gonna go to the developer tools, clear that thing. And here's what I'm gonna do. Const, let's zoom in here so you guys can see, WS, or just say WS because I'm gonna do this a lot, obviously. Equal new WebSocket WS localhost because it's been running on my machine, right? And it's exposed, right? I said, and then I just connected to the server. We need to set up the message, obviously. And then finally, we need to start sending. So this is client number one. I'm going to say, hello, I am client number one. Okay. And immediately, I got the same message. Obviously, we have one client. So we just need to do this all over again on another client. All right, guys, let's do this again All right guys now i'm i open two chrome the views here i'm going to establish a connection right here and then i'm going to wire the message and i'm going to send hey i'm client number one immediately i got it and the five second immediately got it oh you're connected to server four All right by the way this is all a round robin but let's check now i'm going to connect from client two here all right, and send I am client number two. I am connected to client number one in this case, all right? Look at this. We got the message. Now, if I do ws.send message another message, immediately I got it here, and I got it here, despite us connected to different servers, right? And you can scale this to as many as you want. I can open many, many server, many web pages like this, and I start playing with this thing. And I, I want you to play with this thing now. So now if I send a message from here, if I do ws.send, hey, immediately I get it here and I get it here, despite me and the other client are on a completely different server because we just proved it, right? We were connected to server number one here, container number one to be specific. And this guy's connected to container number 444. And we communicate together with the power of Redis, right in this case. All right, guys. And, and a final thing before we end this video, guys. Uh, yeah, obviously, we have Redis as a, a kind of a center point of failure here. But Redis supports clustering and replication 
to allow us to scale, right? So you, what are you going to do is like spin up multiple Redis but, uh, in instances in order to essentially scale that. But I rarely, really, really doubt that you're going to need that, except you're going to have a, thousands and thousands of connections. Scaling just just this layer is enough to me to scale WebSocket connections. All right, guys. So that's it for me today. Hope you enjoyed this video. WebSocket, have a great weekend. I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. Throw in all your questions that you have below. What should I make next? I am going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. Hey guys, what's up? I want to make um, a new video talking about WebSockets, but uh, uh, I wanted to dive into an area that we haven't talked about in our previous videos about WebSockets, which is I'm going to reference below, detailing about the pros and cons of WebSockets and applications and the, all the code that we have written, right? But we have not talked about how to do WSS, which is WebSocket Secure. And that's why I want to make this video in order to show you guys how to do WebSockets Secure, or essentially it's just WebSocket over TLS uh, connections. And I'm gonna use uh, HA proxy to do that. I'm gonna show you how to do that, right? I'm not gonna write any code. I'm gonna reference the code we have done in the previous episodes right, where we talked about WebSocket. And here's the code, I'm gonna reference the GitHub repo, and I'm gonna show you how it works, and then slowly we're gonna add a public IP address, and we're gonna add a domain, uh, a public domain that points to the public IP address, and then we're gonna uh, essentially use a certificate to secure my public domain, all that jazz, and then essentially just use WSS because now we're gonna listen to port 443 and all that jazz. So how about we just jump into it, guys? All right, so here what I have here, Node.js application that acts as a, no, uh, as a WebSocket server, okay? And WebSocket servers, it's very simple. It listens, it hijacks the TCP connection that you make as a first upgrade HTTP request and make use that TCP connection as a bi-directional communication, right? So let's go ahead and just show that part, the, the vanilla stuff and see how this server works, All right? So I'm gonna go ahead and start debugging here. And when I start debugging, I'm gonna listen to port 8080 on my MacBook here, on my machine, which is 127001 or the local IP address. So how about we go to Chrome and consume that? What, that, what this application does is the moment you start connecting to this server, it will essentially have some events and we talked about all these events in the previous video, but it will, what it will, what it will do is essentially if you send a message, it will reply back with the same message and it will also sends a message every five seconds. The server sends a message to the server, to the client every five seconds because that's that's the beauty of WebSockets. It's a bi-directional system. Okay, right. So how about we go to the client here and my client in this case, I'm just going to use Chrome's console here. And if you don't know how to get to Chrome's console, you can go to more tools, developer tool, and this gives you this puppy, right? And I'm gonna write all the code that I need from here because I'm I'm a I'm an uh, I'm a simple guy like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and declare a WebSocket here, and then what I'm gonna do is WebSocket equal new WebSocket. That's a, a built-in class in every browser, and you can just do WS, which is, stands for WebSocket. Okay, this is the protocol, and then we do 77777-8080, okay? And when you do that, the browser will send an, the first HTTP request as a plain HTTP GET request with an upgrade header, saying, hey, by the way, it's an HTTP request, but I want to upgrade this to a WebSocket connection. And, the, and if the server is smart enough to understand what... Uh, a protocol upgrade is, it will upgrade the, the protocol and return a, a code 101. Was that 101? I forgot what the return. Switching protocol header status code and switch to the protocol. My server, which I just wrote, is smart. It understands upgrade. So it will actually upgrade the connection. All right. So we'll do that. 
And let's just listen on a message on the client itself. Say, hey, equal console.log. That essentially means the function, you can essentially assign a function that will be called every time the client receives a message, okay? And then in this case, it's just, hey, you can see, right? Every five seconds, we start getting a message. So again, we're getting these messages from the server. Pretty cool, all right? Pretty cool. So if I clear this thing, we'll start getting the message. But if I do ws.send, I can send something to the server. Hello, and I'm gonna say, get your message, hello. Got your message, hello. The server sent back the message, right? So that's WebSocket in a nutshell. Boring, boring stuff, okay? So here's what I wanna do. I want to do this as a WebSocket secure, but there are, there are so many layers because this is a, first of all, this is a, a private connection, right? This is on my local machine. So what I have done is, the first step is, I added on my router a rule that says, hey, every time someone requests on port 80 or port 440 on the router, please forward them to this laptop, this local machine, which is Hussein Mac, which is the machine I'm running WebSockets on, okay? So that's the thing we want to do first okay i want to forward everything to this public uh, to this local ip address so port 80 from the public internet on this public ip address will go to this this will go to this this is very critical for the, the for the next piece okay but hussein there is nothing running port 80 on your machine right now and that's true there's nothing there is something running on 8080 but there's a beauty part so how about we go to our beautiful ha proxy which is a beautiful, badass proxy, right? And I made a video about HA proxy. I made a video about Nginx. I'm going to make a video about comparing those two proxies and which is better, in my opinion, personal opinion. But spoiler alert, I prefer HA proxy. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and uh, go to the command prompt and write a config that listens on port 80 on my machine and forwards the traffic to my WebSocket server. How do we do that? Very, very simple. HA proxy supports that. I'm gonna explain how it does that, okay? So obviously we're gonna need to create a config. So I'm gonna create ws.cfg, a config file. It's an empty. I'm gonna create a front end. I'm calling it ws. And the mode is HTTP. I'm playing on the layer seven here. And you might say, Hussein, WebSocket is technically, yeah, it's a layer seven protocol, but most of the stuff is a stateful. How are you gonna do that? We're gonna show you how uh, HA proxy is smart and does that very, very intelligently. So I'm gonna create a timeout, client timeout, I don't know, 10 seconds, whatever. That's the time out after which we will give up the connection that's this these timers are very important guys we're going to talk about them in a minute right so uh, i'm going to bind on all ports 80 and i think that's it right and the back end i'm going to create a ws backend right and let's do default back and here is the ws backend right just point this guy to always to go to this guy and what is the back end here well you guessed it guys it's a server that is named s1 whatever you can create multiple s1s uh, s servers here and it's on port 001 uh, 127.001 okay and it's listening on port you guessed it 8080 Nice. We need some timeouts here. Timeout uh, connect. How long should I wait before I give up connecting to that backend server? Okay. Eh, 10 seconds, whatever. And timeout uh, server. And this should be really high. Okay. Ah, we can put it in 100 seconds. This, this is the timeout after which if I didn't receive anything from the backend, which is this guy as a HA proxy, if it didn't receive anything from this guy, kill it, all right? So let's do that and let's test this out, guys. Let's test this out, right? So let's go ahead and do HA proxy dash F WS to CFG. And we gotta get yelled at because we didn't, we forgot 
to do the mode for we forgot to do the mode on the server yeah it's an incompatible mode both of them are playing on the http layer here on the on the layer 7 okay so if i do this now it's working it's listening on port 80 right so technically any request http requests right right anything that goes into this port port 80 will be forwarded to one test of it including WebSockets requests so let's let's test that out so now if i do this right and instead of doing 8080 i can do this right because port 80 will be forwarded to port 8080 right on the back end okay and this will be clarifying in a minute this is the local because HA proxy is running locally so that i would assume this will also work right and what happened here guys what exactly happened my client which is the browser sends a git request says hey i want to upgrade the connection it's a http request ha proxy detected that and says oh it's a normal http request so yeah i'm gonna do a load balancing on the back end but wait a second there is an upgrade header there okay i don't know if we can see it actually there you go so we give but we made a request right that's the request header i want to upgrade the connection and look at that i want to upgrade the connection and the server replied back with switching protocol 101 okay so this did work ha proxy did establish the connection but here's what ha proxy also does so ha proxy remember as a layer 7 proxy it terminates the connection right between the client and itself and establishes a brand new connection and plays with those in the back end right as a round robin or based based on the back end load balancing algorithm okay but here's the problem now websocket is a stateful protocol right so an HA proxy knows that so it says okay once i upgrade the connection i'm gonna hook you up with one tcp connection there is magic there i don't know what is going on but if i'm gonna guess i'm gonna there will be a nat table that says hey this client ip address always goes to back to this connection so you're always connecting to one server and one server only okay because you cannot every web socket connection not connection every web socket request right doesn't that shouldn't go to another server otherwise the whole thing is going to blow up right because other, other back end servers servers could be used for other stuff as well so let's just test this thing out message equal console.log and you can see that it's it's just normally working okay cool we have port 80 okay running still this is boring that comes back to our public ip address what is my public ip address you can just google it you can just say ip and it will tell you the public ip address that's my public ip address right in this case so if i do this and i put my public ip address and i give you this right right now this second because that's my public ip address on this second right guys you can do this on the cloud as well right but I just like to break things down into its smaller, smallest pieces and understand everything, right? I don't like magic, okay? And that, that works too. And that's the step. We're one, we're one step closer to the final goal to do a WSS, all right? If I like to explain everything, guys. And if I do the A test, Look at that, it works. And if I do this, if my, for example, I have my phone supports WebSocket as a client, I can do this today. Anyone now with this URL can do this, right? Take it one step further, guys. If I have a domain, which I did create this domain, this no IP domain, it's free thing, that points to my public IP address. So this is, the domain is just literally a pointer, a DNS entry that points to this. It's an ugly domain, but who cares, right? My WebSocket site, the DNS.net. So if I go here and I do this and I say, pushed, so you can see. 
If I do this, that works too, because that domain is also pointing to my public IP address, which points to my router, right? And says, okay, port 80, because WS, right? We're still unsecure here, insecure. The port 80 on router points to my HA proxy port learning on port 80. HA proxy looks at that and says, okay, this is port 80. I'm supposed to forward it to this thing, 127 port 8080, which is my code here. And this is all happening, right? This is all happening right now. Okay, I do that, console.log. And you can see I'm receiving the messages. Final step, final step. How about we secure this thing, guys, okay? I am not going to go through the process of creating the certificate because I have done this so many times. Again, ch check out the Nginx proxy, uh, check out the HA proxy, and I, there is a specific way of creating a certificate using the Let's Encrypt uh, Certificate Authority. And I have already done that, and I have generated a file, right, which is my certificate public key and private key on the server, and that will be enough for us to actually secure my server. So let's go back to the terminal, kill this thing yeah, right? And I'm going to W, this is my certificate, mywebsocketsite.pem. Again, refer to the video to know exactly how I generated that. But once I do that, CFG, okay? What I want to do here is listen to an additional port. And what is the secure version of HTTP, guys? Which port is that? That's right. It is 443. And to HA proxy, this is just another port. You have to tell it that, by the way, this port is special because it is an SSL port, okay? This is where I'm gonna do the sec secure circuit layer or TLS, right? It's, this is just legacy stuff. They cannot just change it all, out of the blue. So that's why they have to say SSL. That's why you have to say SSL. And then you have to tell me which certificate. SSL is not enough, right? Because, well, who are you as a server? I need to trust you. All right, this, this is why we have a certificate authority to begin with. And where is my certificate? It's under users. I say Nasser, HA proxy, and hopefully I can remember it. My website side.pem. Okay, and that's it. I'm not gonna play with H H HTTP2 yet, ALP and all that stuff. So this is enough for me. Still, let's play on H1 because it doesn't really matter because WebSocket is its own protocol, right? and save. And if I do HA proxy dash F WS dot softj, you can see I'm gonna get yelled at saying, hey, this certificate that you generated is actually a Diffie Hellman, but the Diffie Hellman is actually, I, I think it's just setting to 1024, which is weak. Maybe you wanna upgrade that. And, and that's that's easy. We can set that, tune that, but I don't really care because my side, my side is shady anyway, okay? All right, guys, how about we test this thing? Final thing, okay. So now my WebSockets technically is secure. So I can do this. I still can do this. That works, see, it's not yelling at me. But I can also do this, WSS. And what WebSocket client will do, okay, you want to WSS protocol, that means I'm, the default port for WSS is 443, so I'm gonna try to connect to W on 443. It's gonna ask the DNS, get the public IP address, which, which is my router IP address, and then it's gonna establish a TCP connection, okay, to 443, which is on my router. And there is a rule, remember, 443 forwarded to 443 on my MacBook, which is running a proxy, which is listening on port 443, which is a secure, secure TLS, beautiful stuff. So if I do that, it works. And now you're secure, babes. You're all secure and you're safe. Okay, that's creepy. And look at that, works. And now this is how you do WebSocket secure, guys, okay? <laughs> It's funny how I made this video because I I was researching the gRPC video and how to do that and that thing is a beast and I, I'm, I'm not 
I'm not ready to make a video about that. But I, I start comparing it with WebSocket because it's very analogous to these Web, uh, to these protocols. It rests and and then well, rest is not a protocol, but sure. Uh, yeah, so. REST and uh, GraphQL and WebSocket and gRPC, they are all related. So it's like, it's like let, let me just make a video for you guys for this Friday. I don't know, which 27, whatever, right? And then uh, talk about just WebSocket Secure and talk about a little bit of how WebSocket works. And then maybe next week we're going to talk about gRPC when I'm ready, okay? When I'm a little bit more educated about the topic. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a like. And I'm going to see you on the next one. You guys will stay awesome. What is going on, guys? In this video, I want to go through a system design exercise. I have never done this before in this channel. This is, it will be a new... A fresh perspective of how to actually uh, do a system design and I picked in this case uh, how to do a multiplayer game design okay and uh, I'm gonna go through some expectation for you guys uh, just to talk through what are you gonna expect to get out of this video and um, and uh, we're gonna pick up a game that we're gonna build and there will be some expectation that comes with it. And if you're interested, stay tuned. So here's what we're going to build, guys. The expectation here is gonna, we're going to build a, a multiplayer game, right? And we're going to go through what game it exactly is. But what we're not going to text is we're, we're not going to talk about products per se. Like uh, we're just going to talk about software engineering technologies. So, for example, I'm not going to mention Redis or Postgres. I'm going to say database that gives you the flexibility as a as an implementer to kind of pick any technology you want to implement right this is just we're talking about the the aspect of the technology it's like not not the actual product okay so if, if you see me like oh this is a communication protocol you can use web sockets grpc it depends on what or really on where you want to go and this is where you shine as a software engineer right picking the right piece of product that actually uh, fits your use cases and what are you trying to build okay so this is what we're going to talk about it's going to be a high level design discussion that doesn't mean that there will not be engineering talk i'll talk a lot, a lot about engineering but it's going to be a high level design there will not be no implementation detail like oh you have to send a json or, or for example oh you have to for example establish a two-way communication right this is going to be a little bit of high-level design. And I'm going to propose two designs to solve this problem, okay? And uh, we're going to show the pros and cons of this design, right? And uh, let's just jump into it. So this is the game we are trying to build, guys. And you can imagine this as a multiplayer game. It could be a mobile game. It could be a browser-based game. Desktop only. It's up to you, right? So here's the game. Uh, the four clients, player one, two, three, four, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using colors here. Um, I apologize for the color blind, but this is a red player. Player two is blue, player three is green, and player four is orange. And uh, each player has a board uh, with cells and numbers. And this, you can you can imagine these boards to have unlimited number of size depends on your requirement so i have nine cells here and let's say player one want to capture cell five right so if it does that it will essentially capture cell five and then broadcast somehow to all clients that cell five has been captured by player one which is the red player and then player four comes in let's say and want to capture cell seven right so it becomes orange, and then it will broadcast the state to all of them. So now seven is now belong to orange. And then player two recaptures cell five, which belongs to player one, and that's perfectly fine. And now you broadcast the state that, oh, cell five is now belong to two. And you get the idea, right? You can go uh, like this until someone eventually uh, win the whole board after 30 seconds that's the game the game ends after 30 seconds and the moment the 30 second ta done you can either result in a draw or one of them player game wins like in this case this player one win uh, with four cells okay so that's the game 
So let's imagine how I can implement this game. What kind of features do we have? We have a create game, right? I want to create a new game. I want to have nine cells. I want, for example, yeah, I want to have nine cells. I want this kind of configuration and you create a game. And then once you create a game, you get some sort of a handle, I guess, to share this game with other players so they can join the game. So you can share this uh, handle or could be URL or anything like that. And then people can join the game, okay? So create a game, obviously, that's a very important feature. Join game and play. There's a, an act of a play, and what does that mean, right? And then the final one is actually how to broadcast the score, right? This is also one of the features, a little bit of a technical feature if you think about it. These are, this is called user features, and this is called technical features. Yeah, technical features. If you if you work with as a product owner, if you own a product, you'll always separate uh, your your features into two types. Your, there are features that are user faced like these, and there is a feature that are kind of hidden from the user, but you have to implement it. This is called. This is an example. Score broadcasting has nothing to do with the user. The user is just expected, but it's a technical feature to implement, right? So how do you broadcast a, a score? Uh, I am using, in this case, the server authoritative multiplayer model where the server pushes the state to the client instead of only the changes. All right, so this is this is one of the model. And you can shine here, guys, as a software engineer. You can just pick. There are literally unlimited ways of solving a problem. And that's what makes us, uh, the software engineering is is a great artistic effort, in my opinion. I, I really believe that and I and, and abide by it. I think, that I think software engineering design is a very artistic way of solving things. There's so many ways to solve a problem and each one kind of tells about the personality of, of the designer. I might be going too deep there. <laughs> All right. This is the first proposed design that I have thought about. Guys, I'm proposing two, but as you will go through that, you will have your own ideas and maybe they are way better than mine. 100%. I will I will guarantee that some of you guys will come up with better designs. So please leave them in the comment section below so we can have a discussion and, and grow as software engineers because I learn from you guys as well. Okay, so let's come up with a, with a proposed design that I have came up with. My first design is a, to go with a stateful application design. And when I say stateful or stateless here, I'm talking about the application server that actually uh, have the game code itself. Okay, the statelessness or statefulness here is with regard to the application server, right? the whole system is always going to be stateful. That's a very important point, guys. There is no system that I at least ran into that is absolutely stateless. You're going to store some sort of a state in a database eventually, right? But I'm talking about the application here. The application is stateful. The system is also stateful in this case. We're going to go through the other case. All right, so stateful. What happens here is all players in a particular game that you create must reside in the same server. And there are advantages of this. That's why I picked up this design. There are also disadvantages we're going to go through. So that's the first design. Any player that come, comes and, want, for example, you want to create a game, all of them will reside in the same server. We're going to make sure to cluster them in the game server. And you, you might say, how, Hussein? And that we have a unique identifier, which is the game itself, the game ID, right? And the game state also reside in the same server. And that gives us kind of data locality, which is kind of attractive feature. All right, so that's the first design. The second design is a stateless design where, again, the application level is stateless. That means we're not storing state in the application, at least uh, we're turning maybe ephemeral state where cached, but the actual state is stored in the database somewhere. Could be Redis, MySQL, anything you can imagine, right? 
And these guys are stateless. That means any that you can create a game and this request can go to this server and you can join a game, you can go to this server and you can see this, the scaling that you can actually go through the load balancer and the load balancer can actually have more uh, distribution of the request, right? Versus the older design, which all of the requests that has to do with the one game will always go to one server. Okay, you can start seeing the advantages and disadvantages guy with this, right? So yeah, so the state is stored here and the statelessness is here, right? So I can destroy the server and absolutely my application will just heal itself, which is beautiful. All right, how about we go through each design in detail and we'll have some discussions and see the pros and cons of each of them. The first design which is the stateful design, right? I am player A, which is the blue color, and I want to create a new game, and I'm gonna call it GA. You can, you can choose not to give a game name, but that's also part of the features that you need to implement, right? By the way, this, this thing is a load balancer, that's why it's a reverse proxy, not necessarily load balancer. Let's be very specific here. So I'm gonna create a game, guys, right? And then when we create a game, I am going to take that game ID somehow and hash it so that I always result consistently on a server, right? This is called consistent hashing. And now once I get that, this game ID will always point me to the server, okay? The act of making these requests are stateless, but the routing, will become stateful and will always end up into one server. Good, so I created a game and I end up with this server. Okay, that's the first act. And I'm gonna store the game GA in this server. You notice that I don't even have a database here. Okay, and you might say, oh Hussein, you don't have a database. What if the application dies? Yeah, I lose, I lose the score and I am okay with that. Join game, so that's the second feature. If you wanna join the game, Player A, who created the game, can actually decide to join the game ID. And this game ID, you can share it via, I don't know, WhatsApp or messaging, <laughs> right? And they get the game ID and you share it. URL, you can use your imagination, right? And I have that game ID and I want to join that game. And if you get, join this game, that reverse proxy is smart enough to take that game and, ooh, that's game ID, I'm gonna hash it, and I'm gonna end up in the same server. The act by ending up in the same server is beautiful because I have the state here and I'm sure that the state is here so I can look up the state very quickly. And I join it and I updated that, hey, player A just joined the game. This is the blue player. And now you can just join player B and C and D, the green, the red, the orange. And all of them will use the same code and they will go to the same server, which is awesome. Now all of the players, we updated the game state, so now all the players are in the same game, all the players are in the same server, and they are essentially rock and rolling, all right? All right, how about we actually put this to test? We're gonna play the game with design one. So if I wanna play a game, you would say player A, which is the blue player, want to play on game GA and it want to capture cell number five. So you can you can have your imagination run wild here. This could be protocol buffer communication. This could be a rest endpoint. This could be WebSocket uh, or gRPC, anything, right? And then the moment I do that, I will obviously, since I sent the GA, now I can consistently hash to the server that is available, right? Hopefully still available. And I'm gonna get to the server. I have the game state. I'm gonna update the game state uh, locally because it's locally in the state, in the, in the server itself memory. And then I'm gonna update that, hey, the blue player is now captured cell five. And then let's play the red player, B. It's capturing four. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and update four. Same thing, we're gonna hash the same server. Remember, if I had this server, there is nothing for me to update. There is no game, right? Because the game is here. 
<laughs> All right, so then I'm gonna play with the uh, uh, sorry player fa uh, player C G A, and then I'm gonna capture five, which happened to be the play uh, a cell that uh, player the blue player has captured. So we're gonna capture it again, and then the orange player captures one. So this is the state of the game is now this. See, these numbers, these are things that I will get an update. Hey, all right. Oh, cell number one belongs to the yellow. Cell number five belongs to green. Cell number four belongs to red. And the blue guy ha has no cells, right? How about we talk about broadcast broadcasting the score or broadcasting the state, right? Broadcasting the state is actually reverse. The server will talk to the reverse proxy or the load balance. So it says, hey, by the way, I have everything here on me, literally everything in my server. So it is very efficient to just send the whole dang state down the wire and essentially to all the players, because I have the sockets of those players, assuming this is warp sockets, you can send all this information to to all the players if you're not using a bi-directional protocol then this is not possible so you might want these guys will stop pulling information or use event sourcing to push this information down or maybe http to push okay but to me websockets is 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 the most elegant one to design here you don't have to use it but definitely it's one of the best Right, definitely works on in everything client, right? Web browsers and all that stuff, right? This just will work. All right, so that's how broadcast states. How about we go to the stateless design and see how it will work? Okay, the stateless design, we're gonna have a database here where we're gonna store the state, right? And when I create a game, I can hit any server. The load balancer doesn't have this weird hashing thing that it does, right? It's just literally just do does a round robin and hits you the first server, which will just act like a dumb uh, database connection and just store, just literally just store the result in the database, right? So now we have a game that is here, okay? And now we have the game ID. I wanna join the game and I have GA, this is the game, doesn't matter. I don't have knowledge of the game in the load balancer or the reverse proxy anymore. That complexity has been removed. But if I make a request, I can hit this server or this, and I wanna join, because this server now will query, oh, where is this game stored? Oh, this is the game, okay, now it exists, let me store it. Now you store that player, a has just joined the game, which is awesome. How about we follow up with another player that wants to join the game? Absolutely okay. Player B, which is the red player, wants to join the game. Well, I'm gonna hit this server, and that's okay. You start load balancing your servers, which is awesome, right? Now you're kind of load balancing your servers, even in a single game, right? In the previous design, you're still load balancing, by the way, guys, but it's a pair game load balancer. The whole players, if you create a new game, you will hit another server, right? But all the players must be in the same game, uh, in the same server. This case, no, not necessarily. Even players within the same game will hit multiple server, which will scale, but there are some disadvantages to this. Let's join some other player. Okay, green will hit the first server. The, the yellow will hit the second server. And we, all the people have joined. And we have the states persistent in the database. Actually persist. So the whole thing da goes down and I rebooted the whole system. Still okay. I can somehow resume the game if I wanted to. Unlike the first design. Play game. Let's, let's actually play. I want player A want to capture cell five. Well, let's hit the first server and I want to update that entry in the database that now cell five is belong to me, sir. Right? And then player B want to actually capture cell number four. Well, I can hit any server, that's okay. 
and that will hit eventually the database which could be by the way horizontally scale if you have like a kind of a master backup uh, scenario it doesn't have to be one node right just think about it this way you, if you're readers you can have uh, backups that actually read from read from the backups and the writes goes to the master absolutely fine all right so player uh, b captures cell four player c captures cell five again so we're overriding that so you'll notice that this is like a last win in kind of a thing right so this is the game is like every the last one will win the the one the cell so you will have to always keep clicking 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 in order to win, win the game that's that's the idea of the game it's kind of silly but uh, just something I came up with so play game G A and D uh, obviously this is capturing cell one and you can hit any server and awesome all right let's see how we can broadcast the score in this architecture and design so the game state is here, right? Nothing is stored here. Maybe you can catch some stuff, but it's not, it's not reliable per se. So what happened here is periodically, maybe every 500 milliseconds, the servers will query the database for the latest state and whomever is on the server connected, because it could be two player, one player, or three, or all of them, doesn't matter, right? And we're gonna tell those players that hey by the way the state is now this so the clients can update their view so there's oh this is the now whatever right uh, the yellow is now belong to the uh, the one cell one number one belongs to the orange uh, cell number five belong to the green and cell number four belongs to the red so this is how i represented it looks like very json -y, but could be protocol buffer any format will work okay and the other server has to do the same thing every single server has to query the database and you can see start seeing this is will begin become a bad bad but i cannot talk it's gonna become a bottleneck if you don't have some horizontal scalability going on there so you need some sort of a replication which which could be achieved all right so now query is this database and send all that information. So you can see that there's some chatter going on here. There's to build the state, I have to query the database, which I have to jump to the network to do it. Okay. So there is some latency added, right? And we can talk about that now. Pros and cons. Let's talk about the pros and cons of each of these designs and you can guys run wild with your imagination and come up with more designs and i'm pretty sure you already as you're reading this and you as you're watching this you are having some ideas to improve this and even to to become way better than i whatever i proposed but let's let's come up maybe some some hybrid approach let's go through the bad things or the good things about the stateful the stateful architecture is definitely easier to build if you think about it, right i don't have to maintain a, a database right so it is it will make make things very simple the assembling of the state the broadcasting of the state will be simple because i have everything in memory literally just dump it to all my players which are in my i loop through all the game state all the players and and send them information immediately if you have a push a communication protocol a communication protocol that supports push low latency there is absolutely no latency because the game state is in me it's data locality 101 right all the data is in my server so i don't have to jump hoops to collect things definitely less network bandwidth because uh there won't be chatter compared to the stateless approach right not just chatter between the server and the database chatter between all the servers trying to assemble the game state between that are fractioned uh, across all the servers right if the game server goes down the problem with this is there is no scalability right when i say no scalability is well the server if that game server goes down which has the state you're done you're done absolutely you're done that's it the, the game is end 
right? And I kind of willing to take that, right? Because the game finishes in 30 seconds. And the, the fact that the idea that the game, the server can go in 30 seconds, I don't know about that, right? If I have a lot of servers, I might not have this problem, but might be wrong. But there's no scalability here, nevertheless, right? The server goes down, that's it. You cannot kind of fix and, and assemble pieces together to resume the game, right? It's just gone, right? And uh, another, another problem is here is just you can see that all the games might lead to the same server because of a hashing, consistent hashing might give you not correctly hitting the same server, which can overwhelm the server, right? But if these are Docker containers, who cares, right? If this is like a part of a Docker container, you can spin up really a lot of containers. And I was, I am imagining this to be a very low application level. The code won't be heavy and the process will be very quick. So as I'm expecting this, the footprint of the game to be very, very light, right? So I kind of like this a lot, but let's talk about the stateless. The stateless architecture definitely scales because I can literally kill one of the servers and the next request will just go to another server and eventually makes itself down to the database, which will query. So it's definitely, definitely e, uh, scales, right? And yeah. But it is harder to build. When I say harder, guys, it's just more components, right? Because you need to worry about a database now and you need to worry about latency, definitely higher latency now. You have a networking going on between the server and the database. You need, and you have a lot of networking between the server and the proxy, which is the load balancer. The load balancer has to kind of, uh, will be a lot of chatter between the server and the, all the servers, to be honest, right? If the game server goes down, definitely you can resume the game. There is no problem with this design. Definitely just kill any server and then resume the game completely, right? So I'm kind of torn between these two designs, guys. And uh, I think I lean towards the stateful, but I still think it's not straightforward to implement this hashing thing that we talked about so that the game... I took the game state and hash it so it always goes to a single server. I think HA proxy can achieve that. Even Nginx can achieve that with some scripting. I think Lua, Nginx have some Lua scripting that can allow you to do that. But I might be wrong. But nevertheless, the stateless architecture is also attractive because you can, you can just make the load balancer literally a dumb reverse proxy that doesn't have any knowledge of your game right and have the application logic on the on the server itself right that's another kind of a disadvantage of the stateful architecture where your code is split between the load balancer and also the application logic is also in the server right so there are complexity and i i can't i prefer the stateful but i think I'm torn. I don't know which one to pick, to be honest. What do you guys think? What third and fourth and fifth design do you guys propose, right? Let's just keep thinking. Let's keep those discussions coming in, this, uh, in the comment section below. And uh, what do you guys think about this episode? Did you like this video? Uh, do you want me to make more of this system design kind of a videos? I'm happy to do that. I'm picking another another. Uh, uh, another design to actually implement like Twitter or, or, or YouTube or maybe even WhatsApp or cha uh, chatting application. And right? we can just think. It's, I want you to understand, guys, that this is, there is no one way to build application. There is no, definitely there is no one right way. If you're going to an interview, design interview, uh, the interviewer will have something in his mind or her mind, but you have to stay true to yourself and just be honest. Just don't don't expect to answer what is what in the interviewer's mind. Just lay all the uh, cards on the table, discuss everything you know, and if there is something you don't know, that's a great opportunity to learn. 
right? Learn from the interviews. Like, hey, if I go now to an interview and, and someone, I will tell them, like, okay, this is what I know. I would prefer this approach because of this, 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 this. Uh, there's this approach, but this is this, this. It really depends. I don't know what to pick. I'm going to say, I don't know what to pick. I'm going to, uh, if, if push comes to shove, I'm going to pick one and run with it, to be honest. I am totally fine with this approach, right? And sometimes you will have to just, you know, pick something and don't paralyze yourself, right? Because you will never get it right. You will never get it right. No, don't don't ever think that that companies know what they're doing, right? They will go through a design and they will run into a trouble and they will tweak things and will move forward so if they if you're interviewing if you're in an interview and you're and the interviewer is asking you something in in an hour and they expect you to to come up with a perfect solution they are delusional right because people take months to to research and design something and you're not gonna get it in an hour they know that they should know that they want you to know how you're thinking and that what matters. They want you to have a flexible, fluid kind of thinking, right? Think about all the possibilities, the pros and cons, right? Uh, what, as you can see, I'm st I'm still torn. What what to pick, right? Pick first or second? Maybe a hybrid. Maybe I still gonna keep a database with a stateful approach and periodically store the state in a database, but keep the state in 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 a server somewhere. Yeah. It's uh, that's how how would the system design works. It's just, there is no one way to solve a problem, and that what makes us software engineer a very creative field to be in. Just and don't don't beat yourself up if you can't think of a solution that is absolutely perfect. If you're if you're torn and you're thinking as you keep designing and as you keep working the problem and you keep getting with more problem you're absolutely normal because that's the state of software engineering. There is, sometimes you kind of get this nice click that's perfect, but there won't be a perfect solution. That's the, that's what I, what I notice in the, in the all the videos that I watch in the software engineering. They, they ship you this design as if it's the perfect one. And I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, right? It's just, oh, this is the way to do it. Perfect. Nah, I don't know about that. There's always going to be a better way of doing anything. All right, guys. Sorry I, I mumbled there in the end. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and suggest what should I do next. Tell me in the comment section below. You guys stay safe out there. In this video, I want to do something that I am completely uncomfortable with building multiplayer game let's get into it so here's the game that i actually built but i want to build from scratch with you guys so it will be essentially a multiplayer game using the server authoritative model and there are three clients and i'm using websocket as a as a as a medium of this multiplayer communication so a client create a game and creates a URL and this URL is sent to any client really could be a mobile phone could be any desktop application it's a completely browser based game and once the the client receives the URL you can click join game and they will start the game so and each each game each client will get a color and if they click that color will propagate to everything right and this guy is like, for example, the red guy, uh, the, the same cell will basically turn all red based on this. And the game essentially is fighting between all of these clients so they can dominate the board. So that's the game essentially. So as you click, right, imagine multiplayer, because I'm obviously a single guy here, but imagine all of these will essentially try to dominate the board with their color that's the idea and uh, the full game will should should have a score obviously should have a timer because that's the, the you're fighting for this the the board and every client will have a share of the of the board and if they have the most they are the winner essentially or could be a draw 
Okay, so that's what I want to build. This is completely built with native WebSockets. I'm not using Socket IO or anything like that. I'm using plain JavaScript. I'm using plain WebSockets. It's a and I end up for the back end. I'm using Node.js for persistent or anything like that. I don't use. I'm just using a stateful application. We can obviously build the application better ways, but this is just for educational purposes, right? I'm gonna talk through in this video how I can build this application in a better way, right? It's gonna be a long video, guys, obviously. If you're interested, stay tuned, enjoy. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Hussein, and this channel, we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. So if you wanna become a better software engineer, consider subscribing and hit that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload a new video. With that said, let's just jump into this video. So let's just jump into it, guys. We're gonna build a multiplayer gaming application, browser-based. When I say browser-based, I mean it works on any device that has a browser. That's the beauty of this thing, all right? And that's why like we're moving away from native applications and just trying things out. Trying things out, right? There's always pros and cons for, to everything, but the web, man, it's getting really strong. And let's see how good this thing is. So we're gonna use WebSocket, a technology has been released for a long time, right? Without any fancy term, and we're gonna build a multiplayer game. Let's just jump into it, guys. So here's the agenda. Here's the things, the design of the game. I went ahead and created the design of the game because obviously for every software you wanna create, you have to design it. You cannot just jump into coding. I've made this mistake before. Jumping into code, you get confused because you have no idea what you're building, right? That's why you have to kind of break down your application into kind of this basic component. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go through the design of the game, right? And then after that, we're gonna show an example, again, of the game. And then finally, we're gonna code. So, that, so the first component here is is connecting to the server, right? So there will be some sort of a server and we're gonna connect to it. So that's one piece of the puzzle, okay? We need to implement the connection from the client to the server, okay? And then when I say connection here, it could be any protocol, but the protocol that I'm gonna use is WebSockets, okay? And then the other component is creating the game. I wanna create the new game. Okay, and the game will have some semantic. The game will have some state. Okay, uh, the, the description of a state will be, hey, this board game now has seven red cells, three blue and two greens, right? So that's the state, okay? And the idea here is the state is on the server. Join a game, that's another action that the client need to take to do, right? Because it's really interesting if you can think about it. Playing, right? Now I want to actually play. I want to set one of these cells or balls or whatever we want to call them to my color as a player. Okay, so that's called a play. And then we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then the final step of the game design is the broadcast state. Wow. <laughs> Much better. Fixed. Thank God of editing, man. So broadcast the state of the game from the server to all clients and we're going to discuss that as well okay that comes back to what kind of game design would you choose right there are many multiplayer game design there's the lockstep there's the server authoritative and then there are like a hybrid approach as well i'm choosing the server authoritative approach here i'm going to discuss all that stuff don't worry about it and uh, i'm going to talk about a full example show an example of how the game will actually conduct and then once we are ready, we are feel confident, we'll jump to the code and we'll write some code, guys. How about we do this thing? The first thing, connection. I want to connect as a client. I want to connect to the server. And you will notice that I am a client. In this case, most probably it's a browser, but it doesn't have to be, right? Any client that understands how to talk WebSockets could be a potential client of your game. The WebSocket server in this case here, I'm gonna not use Node.js as my WebSocket server. And then notice what will happen here. I am communicating with JSON here. 
and I chose this protocol. You can choose anything you want. The web, the beauty of WebSocket is a, it's a blob of text or binary that you send uh, across the wire. You are responsible of choosing the format of what you send, okay? And you pick a format, could be XML, I don't know why would you do that. Could be JSON, like what I'm doing right now. Could be protocol buffers, right? Nothing stopping you from doing any of that stuff. Whatever is comfortable. Since I'm using JavaScript in the client and JavaScript in the server, JavaScript is the best language for this because it's the code I write on the server will be used in the client and vice versa. So here's what I'm gonna do. When I attempt to connect to my WebSocket server, that connection will essentially be up, will upgrade the HTTP normal connection to a WebSocket, right? But the first response that comes from my web server will be to uniquely identify the client. And that's a very critical point. You want your clients to be identifiable with each request they make so you so you can look up which connection to use on the server in order to communicate with that client okay so that's the first point you really need to understand because think about it guys there will be many many connections here many connections from many games many servers how do i know that this connection this TCP full state full connection is belongs to this client. So you need some sort of a hash table and we're going to build that. Okay. So that client ID and I'm going to use GUID because it's the easiest way to identify things, right? Obviously this is whatever I'm going to design now today is not the most performant nor efficient. We can always make things more efficient. I just want the most simple way. It's not even scalable. The way, the way the design I'm doing today. Okay, it's just, it's very stateful, but we can do all of that stuff and we can discuss in another video. But let's just build what we can build, right? The idea of the game without actually adding more complexity. All right, so when, when I attempt to connect, I'm gonna respond with a single JSON response right as part of the websocket connection remember guys and if you if you if you want to know more about websocket i'm going to reference the video that i made here dedicated just for about websockets crash course and i also talked about how to make websocket uh, secured using tls right i'm going to reference all the videos here but once i identify the client and i made the, build this hash table on my server, I'm gonna return this payload to the server, to the client. So there's it's immediate response, kind response kind of a thing here for just that. All right, so now the client knows its IDs. The server know that there is a TCP connection associated with that client. The next component of the game is to create a new game. Okay, I know what does that mean? A game is kind of a state that represents the, uh, uh, the board in this case, right? The, the board that we're building. It has certain number of balls or cells or whatever you want to call it, okay? It has an ID, it has certain players and all that stuff. So one client, assume they already connected, they can issue a command to actually make a request to create a new game, okay? And uh, the method that they can choose here is called create. And you might say, what the heck is a method? It's nothing. It's a JSON payload that I decided. I am building the protocol here, guys. That's the thing here. And you can do whatever you want. I chose to call this thing method. And this is so that I can identify it on the server. So I'm gonna send the client to create a game. You want to send me a JSON payload with a key called method and the value is create. And I'm gonna know that you want to create a new game. But you gotta tell me with every single request, what client ID are you, okay? And you might argue that, hey, so Hussein, you don't really need the client ID. You can derive it from the connection. And I agree with you. I just want to make this as simple as possible. We can do so much optimization, but let's make it think simple. So you tell me who you are, you tell me what you want, okay? So that's the create. And when you do that, the web server will create a new game state, right? And when I say create, use your imagination. 
you can be you can have it stateful in memory of the server which is what i'm gonna do you can save it in a redis instance that's another better way of doing things but i don't have seven hours to do, to do this video so i'm gonna try to simplify this video as much as possible but think about it use your imagination and do a lot of things here okay and once we create that instance we can create a game okay we're gonna have a new id for the game which is very important to identify the game id here and here's the response i'm gonna re return to the user i'm um, immediately we're gonna re response to the user that re made that request with the game id and how many balls did we create for this game and you can make this configurable i am gonna hard code this thing to 20 balls or 15 okay but we can make things configurable so i'm gonna return a game payload here object and it's called id that is id and has a number of balls and that's again we have to return the comp method so the client knows that hey when it receives a response from the server which was because this is a bi-directional thing we have no idea which response is for which request so that's why we have to kind of identify things uniquely okay so when i send that back i'm going to re return this result to the server to the client and now i know the client knows that oh there is a game id and now this is the beauty of this thing. We have the game ID. The client can choose to share this game ID as a URL with other clients and they can join the game. Remember that that client has just created the game. It didn't really join it, okay? To join a game, you have to call this method. You have to do this protocol that I'm building. The whole thing here, I'm building from scratch, right guys? So. To request a new join request, right? You build this JSON. Again, there is another method here that I created and I call the string join. And then you have to tell me who you are. Notice there is always a pattern, but you also have to tell me what game ID you want to join, okay? And you probably will get this somewhere from a create game, previous create game, and someone shared shared the URL through WhatsApp or whatever, right? Any any medium once they get the url or the game id we can essentially join the game and when you send me this request and here's the interesting part if you send me that payload through the web server okay to the web server i'm gonna respond with this payload i am going to tell you that hey this the method is join okay and this is the game the id of the same thing the number of balls because you're a new client right you might be a new client and you don't know how many balls in this game or other state of the game you don't know anything about this game so what you're gonna receive here is this and you're gonna receive all the current client currently joined this game okay who actually joined this game so if you're the first guy to join you will only see yourself here okay so the grid will be the client id of the uh, of the client who joined this game and an automatically assigned color and the server assigns the color for the game so the first guy gets a red the second one gets a green and the third one gets a blue and so on okay you can you can check this i'm gonna limit the game to three players only and then that's it you return this but here's the thing this is a special request this is a special request and response the server will not only respond to this client it will check the from the game id it will check who else is a client for this game who already joined the game and i'm gonna tell them that there is a new player so i'm gonna send the same respond to all the participants of the game so that's why this will be sent to all game clients right if it's none then we're gonna send it only to this guy who just joined if it's another one then i'm gonna send two and so on and we got this we're gonna be clear with with more of an example okay so let's join let's talk about play to play a game here guys what you do is i'm gonna send the same thing it's a method or it's a json respond and there is a method i'm gonna call it a play that's what i called it you have to tell me who you are and you have to tell me what game are you playing and you have to tell me 
what ball or what cell you want to capture or you want to set so i can pick your color and mark it and you might say hussein you didn't send the color in the request how do you know what color is this client that's a good question there will be a mapping on the server in this case right and you might as easily set that on the client as well notice that there is no response in this case this is just like a beacon right it's like a i talked about the beacon api it's like a beacon API. you send information without actually expecting a response and that's very critical for latency because this is gonna be a busy request this is the one of the most requests that will be uh, click through the most right this is where people will, just, da, 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 will keep clicking right so this is the most you need to make this compact you need to make this fast as fast as possible that's why you mean you need to make this there will be a client side work that you need to do and then you send the request immediately like a like almost like a right through cache right so that's 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 the very important point here okay and there, the server doesn't respond with anything and you might say Hussein, how do you know what other players has actually played right because this will be by multiple players this player one will play player two and and so on okay and this is it so this is the broadcast state where the server after each number of millisecond number of seconds or number of frames if you're playing with that right it will group it will it will batch these frames and all the states that has been received from all clients and will send one response including all of these changes right with the final state this is called essentially the batching right so this the the the, the server will batch all the uh, all the changes that happened and will send one final state to all client of that game okay so here's the thing so it was gonna every every half a second 300 millisecond whatever you want to set it the server will start sending these updates right and this is also a very important thing you have to make this as efficient as possible i'm not gonna make it efficient this is gonna be a little bit large but we there are some tricks we can play with bitwise operators and and making the state as simple as small as possible out of the stop, of scope of the video but do ask me in the comments below if you if you're interested to know more so i'm gonna send all that stuff right so that's that's like a kind of a broadcasting to all client kind of a thing and here's the response this is a method that the, actually the server sends not the client not a, a response to an existing request it's just a server side right that's the beauty of the circuit so there is something that the client only sends there is something that the server only sends there is a there is just a normal client server uh client request response kind of a thing as well okay and we're gonna send here the update we're gonna send the game id and the state and the state is an array of all the the current game essentially what the current game look like if you have 20 balls or 20 cells you're gonna have 20 elements in this element and it will tell you that this ball okay the cell number one or ball number one is red ball number two is blue ball number three is green and so on and all the clients are responsible to update that state right and immediately once you receive this you'll you'll immediately refresh that and you'll see that oh there is something changing okay so that's the broadcast state okay and this is what we call the server authoritative model where the clients send changes it sends input the client only sends an input he said hey i want to play this ball i want to play this ball i want to play this ball that's what the client sends and the server groups all that stuff and then the server sent the full state back to the server uh, to the clients right so that's called the server authoritative model in game multiplayer gaming where the server actually is the authoritative of the state okay clients cannot cheat as easily because the state is calculated on the 
server, not on the client. The opposite of that is the lockstep approach where the clients still sends inputs, but the server, instead of calculating the state, it actually sends the input of all grouped uh, client inputs back to all clients. So, and the clients, once they receive all the changes, all these inputs, they are responsible to calculate the state, right? So it's, it's the opposite. So the a client is authoritative in this case to calculate the state. And the clients can cheat in this case because they, hey, so it's like, hey, I, I own this. I own the state in this case. I can play with this and change it, which is kind of not good. But the, the, the good thing about it is just the bandwidth becomes really, really small because you're sending inputs instead of sending a full state, right? And we, this is all going to become very clear, guys, as we go through the game. Example, let's go through an example and start coding, guys. So three clients connect to a server, okay? Random clients, they know the address of the server and they want to establish a connect request, okay? And that's the WebSocket connect request, guys, okay? The first client request, a connect, a connection, and the server will respond with the client ID and it will give it an GUID. In this case, it was called A, okay? So this is a client A. And this guy will be client B and this guy will call, will call him client C, okay? Cool, so that's easy. All right, so we have three clients, A, B, C, that's it. We have three stateful TCP connection that acts like a WebSocket, okay? And we have a handle of this, and we have a handle to these connections. And we have now an array in memory with a hash map, not really an array, it's a hash map that says client A is this connection, client B is this connection, client C is this connection. It's very, very, very important to identify this. Client A decided to create a game, okay? Client A creates a game, it sends a request like this, the JSON, this beautiful JSON, right? And it says, hey, method create, okay? And the client, I am client A. Ha Again, we you have to identify yourself. Who are you? So I can locate which connection I should use, right? And which stuff I can do with you, right? This is very, very important, okay? Again, guys, you can get rid of the client ID if you want to, but it's it's way easier to have an identifier and you'll know why. Okay, once you do that, the server will immediately respond. It will create a new game. It's an, again, it's a hash map with the game ID. It's going to generate a number of balls or cells and will tell the client, hey, by the way, I'm responding to your create request and here it is, okay? I just, uh, you just created a request. Yeah, I know. And here's the game ID. And the game now can be shared with other clients. Remember, client A did not join the game. It merely, it merely created it, which is very important. Client B joins game, game Z in this case, which is the game created by, by client A, okay? It, I don't know, client A sent it through, through WhatsApp, right, or whatever. And uh, we receive the game now, we have the game ID and I want to join it. And to join, what do we do? Well, you have to send me this exact JSON payload. Method, I want to join. Who are you? I'm client B. What game do you want to join? I want to game ID, uh, I want to join, join game ID Z. And when you do that, what do we do? We, the server will check, okay, who are the current member of uh, game Z? No one, okay? In this case, I will join you, sir. You are now a member and you are you're happen to be the first member, so you get the first color, which is red. So we assign the client B, the red color, and we update the game state, right? So that the client, we update the game client state so that with the first client, which is client B, okay? And we check, are there any clients? Nope, that's the only client. We loop through all the clients that are currently here and literally get the connections and send this new change to all the clients, right? And the client in this case is only B, right? So this JSON response will only send, be sent to client B. And B will receive it and we'll say, okay, oh, I, I got read. And I will just display it in the UI, for example. Let's. Join, client C joins the game now. Same thing. I'm going to send a method join. I am C. I want to join game Z. Oh, okay. We'll see. All right. Let me add you to the 
existing game which happens to have already one player so you're the second one so you get the second color green okay and i'm gonna add you so b and c and then i'm gonna loop through all the current clients which is b and c and send them the game because b needs to know that c has joined right so both of them will get this new join request right so you'll start getting this join request so b will get it and also c will get it that's very important that's I'm, I'm writing the algorithm guys as i speak that's very important to iterate these things and reiterate them finally client a who actually creates the game just decided to join and if it joins this does the same exact thing so it gets the last color which is blue and then the server will loop through all clients which is b c a for this game only and will broadcast all the response this response to all client so now a and b and c will get this response and all of them will see that oh there are three players and here where we can actually decide to play the game let's actually play guys so client a decides to play ball six which is like cell number six i want to set it this is mine it's a blue so what do we do we set a request right and the request is called play the method play and I am a client A and I want, I'm playing on game Z and I want to set, I own ball six now, okay? So what will happen here is the server will say, okay, got it, six, this is the game state. This is now the, this is the first time we actually change the game state here. So ball six is now on, and think of it like an array or a JSON hash map, anything you want, right? ball six now is owned by the color blue and you can decide to say hey by owned by client uh a don't really care here so that's enough just to have blue here we don't really need more information so that set set okay that now the state is saved on the server okay it's a stateful thing which is a little bit bad because that's the easiest implementation you can as is as similarly use redis to store the state and that is a better solution okay but that will take more time to actually implement okay client b decides to set play ball say seven okay so client b will says okay send a request and then the method is play and i am b z m seven so the current state is six still blue and seven is now red right because b is was was the red one and the third one is client c is now playing ball six so what will happen here six is already set to a well what will happen here is i am using a last last in win kind of a solution so ball six will now be owned by green and and you can play with this the way you want guys you can design your game the way you want i decided to overwrite the result because it's is kind of the easiest and kind of fairest right because because whoever comes last wins that's it move on right all right so you notice that there are no responses from the server right and all of these three things happen within the half a second right let's say this all of them happen in the half a second after that five millisecond happened right the server kicks in and starts broadcasting the state to all the clients that are in the game okay which are a and b and c so it will send a response a, a, a response to a with this state which is six is now owned by green and seven is our by red and the same state will go to b same state will go to c so this is quite large right if you're sending it a lot right so the network bandwidth will be affected as a result so you want to make this as small as possible and i have ideas to do that it's just it's out of the scope of the video okay and we can play with this and i might make this game actually a legit game and i make it into its own repo but i'm not gonna make a video about it because it's gonna take me weeks <laughs> to do that okay and i can't explain every single decision i make right it's just it's just all subjective to be honest and that's it all of this game state will just send right how about we jump in and we start coding guys all right let's code this thing all right guys so to code we need to create a server and we also need to create a client 
And the client in this case is going to be just a dumb HTML page, to be honest. And the server will be our Node.js, right? So make sure you have Node.js installed. Make sure you have Visual Studio Code. And let's get into it. So let's create a WebSocket server. How about that? File, open, JavaScript, and <laughs> you see I've created so many projects. So let's go WebSocket, cell game, whatever you want to call it, right? And that's it. And uh, I'm going to create a new index.js file. Let's initialize in npm. It's a good idea. npm init dash y. And that's it. So how do you create a WebSocket server? And what is WebSocket, right, guys? WebSocket is nothing but an existing HTTP connection that have been upgraded to a WebSocket, OK? So how do we do HTTP? Well, AZ. As let's, let's start with building an HTTP server in Node.js. And we have done this a lot of time. So, I'm going to create an HTTP. Let's require the HTTP library. It's a built-in thing in Node.js. Okay. And using that, I'm going to create an HTTP server by doing HTTP dash create server. Okay. And you can choose to actually give it a function. We don't really care because well, the WebSocket will actually override that function anyway. So what do we do next is HTTP server dot start listening, right? Just listen to port. I don't know, 9090 just for change, because I'm pretty sure 8080 is used on my machine. And we say like, I don't know, console.log, I am listening on 9090. Boop, 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 sweet. Let's close this. So that's a WebSocket, no, that's not a WebSocket, that's just a server, okay? And that so server, when you first do it, okay, when you first establish a connection with the, with the server, it will create a TCP connection. And that's what we need to pass in to our web socket logic, okay? So how do we do that? Let's create a const uh, web socket server equal require web socket dot server. Okay, so that's the library I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna create a WebSocket server in this case. And to do that, we can create a WebSocket server by doing new WebSocket server. And now, what do we need to pass it is a JSON file. And we need to pass it the HTTP server essentially. And I think it's case sensitive, so we have to do like HTTP server like that. And then just pass it that object that we just initialized, right? And when you do that, this has become this guy's property. That's it. It owns it. Okay. So that's the WebSocket server in this. Up until here, the WebSocket server has. We are not listening to a change of the request to upgrade that connection into the WebSocket. So to do that, there is something called. There is an event. There is an event called on request. And when you do an on request, you get a request object. And when you do a request object, right, you will have a very important thing here. The request object here, you can accept the connection. And uh, we talked about all the protocols. You can create your own protocol here. I, I won't accept any kind of uh, WebSocket protocol. So I'm going to say null. And then I can say dot accept the origin, right? And when you do that, you will get a beautiful TCP connection, which is this bi-directional thing that you have to capture and you have to keep with you. And the, each client, that's the connect, guys, by the way. That's someone trying to connect. That's the first function, right? And what do we do when we connect? We got to generate a new ID for our client, okay? So that's what we're gonna do next, okay? So we have the connection, but this connection is still not enough, right? Because that connection, we need to listen on events that happen on that connection. So the first event is on. So the first event is open. What do you want me to do when I open the connection? Eh, I don't care, just say bleh, open, whatever. What do you want me to do when I close the connection? Hmm, probably a good idea to clean things up, but let's just say closed, okay? And the most important one, 
message. What do you want me to do when I actually message you? And that's the most important function of all of them, okay? If you, if this connection received something from, from the client, I have received a message from the client. That's what it means here, okay? That's where most of our code will live. But here, this is not activated yet. Nobody actually sent me a message, okay? But we need to actually send back uh a connect, uh, send back the results to the client, right? With with their client ID, remember? Because everything we're gonna communicate with JSON, guys. Remember, that's the protocol here. We need to create a new unique ID for the client who just connected to us. Okay, and how do you do that? Let's go to GUID. We're gonna join the GUID. I'm gonna steal a function for joining the GUID because uh, I'm gonna steal this function from. Stack Exchange. Someone wrote this, and I'm just gonna use it to be honest. It's a GUID. It's a function. Good. It's not perfect function, but it's just demonstrated that it can generate a unique GUID, and that's what I want. I want to generate a GUID. GUID. Okay. And that's that's it. Sorry. So that's where we're gonna create a new ID. Okay. So let's just add some comments here. Generate a new client ID. Okay. And yeah, const client ID equal GUID. So that's a new, brand new client ID. And what I want to do here is, this is where the state, the first state we're going to store is like the list hash map of all the clients and their connections, because this GUID is now associated with this connection. How do I build this thing? Well, we can do it right here. Const clients. And we can do it as an object here, right? And when you do it as an object, it essentially becomes a hash map, right? Well, where you do a, this client ID, and this will give you kind of the key of that, and the object and the value will become the connection or even more information. So clients, in this case, sub client ID equal connection. And just like that, I built a mapping between the connection and the client ID. We might need to add more information ju than just the connection itself. So I am going to actually make this into an object, right? And the first value of the object is the connection. And we might add something else. I'm not quite sure yet. Maybe the color of the client, maybe something else, some metadata, maybe nickname, right? So you don't have to have it one to one, right? So that's it now. Now the clients is mapped with the connection and that's Perfect. So next time a client send me the uh, the connection, or send me a request, I can find their connection. I can loop through the clients and send everybody uh, requests, right? Because I can loop through this very easily. Okay, we're gonna show you how as well. Sweet. Now we build the. Uh, that's the connect. We need to send back the response to the client. How do you do that? So let's build a payload, right? That's with the payload that we're gonna send to the user. And what do we do here? What was the payload look like? Remember guys? The method was connect, right? So someone connected to me, right? I'm sending this back from the server, okay? And you, sir, is a client, okay? ID, and that's your client ID, okay? And how do I send this to the user? Very simple, I have a connection because I am still in this closure right so i can do connection dot send and literally do json dot stringify you might say why do you don't send the object directly because it will yell at me right this thing only understand bytes okay json is not really directly correlated with bytes right you have to turn it into something that is a string or numbers or something like that okay so once you turn it into a string you send it back and then we're gonna parse it Okay, this is the protocol that I'm talking about. We are agreeing that the server and the client are talking JSON here, right? That's kind of an implicit contract that we have. Okay, send back the client connect, right? So that's the first thing we did. Client connect, sir. Client connect. We still don't have a client, to be honest. We have still have a server. So we have this, and uh, that's it. Let's do one thing before we actually start testing this thing. Message, okay? When you receive a message, 
there is something called UTF day eight data. That's the data that the server will receive. If, if you send something from the client to the server, you receive it here. And I am going to assume that uh, response result, right? If I do the result here and I do json.parse, this is big. You're assuming that everything that is sent is actually JSON. So this might fail if you have a bad client that actually didn't send a JSON, sent something else, right? But I'm I, all my clients are good clients. So I would assume that they are sending JSON. Okay, I have received a message from the client here. And let's just, uh, oh no, let's just print it here, okay? Let's just print result, which is the JSON object in this case. How about that? How about we test this thing, guys, right? So all we did is we created a server, we created a hash map for the clients, right? And we're accepting the request and we did implement the first thing, which is the connect, right? Which returns the client ID and tells it which method, right? So the client can actually listen to that and do stuff with it. How about we test? So if I run here, I, I'm expecting, I'm expected that I'm gonna yell, yell the yelled at and because of, ooh, cannot find, Module WebSocket, right? That makes sense. We didn't install this guy. So how do we install? NPM, install WebSocket. That's not hard at all. Now we ran. Oh, we're gonna get that for some other reasons now. All right, 1990, we're listening. Sweet, so now we have the server. How do we actually test this thing? We need a client, right? So let's build the client, guys. So the client is nothing but an HTML page, index.html, okay? And HTML5 will give us like the template for the HTML5 thing, okay? And we need to actually connect. And you can assume that the moment you open the browser, we can actually directly connect. Bad idea to be honest, but we're still testing, so sure. So I'm gonna write a script so that it will automatically connect to the WebSocket, right? When it first opened the page, right? So equal new WebSocket, WS, localhost, again, not a good idea to do no localhost. We can use the host name in this case, but we're in the same machine, so this might work. So ws dot the event on the client now on message if the user sent me if the server sent me a message what do you want me to do okay I want to see that message uh, the message dot data is actually the string that the server has sent okay and what did we decide guys anything that comes from the server should be JSON. That's the contract between me and the client and the server. So if I can I can safely do that. Response equal JSON dot parse message dot data. Just bring me everything from the client from the server. So now I have response, and I can just decide to print it. How about that? Let's just print what we received from the client as as a console output. Yeah. How about we test that thing? And there's one small thing, guys, one small thing. What I wanna do is serve this HTML page, but this HTML page have to be served. How do you serve things, right? You can decide to serve it with HTTP, but why, why not just use express, right? App equal require express, boom. So I'm gonna just serve this page on another port uh, with express. So what I'm gonna do is app.listen, 1991 is the port that will actually host the page, okay? So that's the page we visit in order just to get the HTML, and the HTML page will have a code to actually connect to port 909, 90, 1990, okay? And that's just like a console.log, uh, listening on HTTP port, okay? That's just another one, okay? 1991, right? And obviously, we need app.get, when someone visits slash, just give them request response and 
immediately response.send file index.html. How do you do that? DIR name, there, yeah, index.html. This will immediately send that. And we have done so much of that stuff, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm just not going through easy stuff here. I'm trying to explain the complexity stuff. All right, so this will serve me the HTML page, right? So how about we do that? If I run this now, we'll be listening to two ports, 1990, 1991, okay? 1991 is where we're gonna visit now, where we actually can consume. All right, so now if I go HTTP, localhost, 9091, right? Which is the express page, I'll be served the HTML code, right? And let's just for fun, let's add something in the HTML so we know that it's actually a page, right? Header one, it's like, ah, uh, ball game, whatever, right? Pfft. When I restart, there you go, ball game. And when I go to the developer tools here, let's see what we have here. Where we're we going? Hey, we got something back. Guys, it worked. Remember what happened here, right? Let's, let's actually debug to show so I can show you. If I look at the code here and I do this, the moment I serve this page, I get this page, the code will start executing, which is the script, which will make a request to the WebSocket, which will immediately get a, a response from the client, from the server, giving the client its own unique ID. So how about we debug this? If I do this, the moment you refresh, you can actually debug, right? And you get a boof, create a WebSocket. Success, right? Because it's a local host, it's on the same machine, that will work. And then create the event. And then once we create the event, the server actually already responded. Oh, goddamn Grammarly, all right? And now this is what it responded to. Respond with a JSON object, which we parsed successfully into an actual JSON object. Now saying that method is connect and client is actually this thing. And we printed it. How coolish is this guy? How just coolish? Now we have the client ID. I want to keep the client ID handy for me, okay? In in the in in the script. So I'm gonna create let client ID equal null here. And when I set it here, I want to get the client ID and save it in my global namespace here. So what do I do? If response dot method, and I can do that because I built the protocol right equal 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 connect was it lowercase or uppercase I don't remember if that's the connect method that's the first thing we're building right if the connect method then the client ID equal response dot client ID that's it we built it console.log client ID set successfully and we can just do plus client ID Cool, now I know myself. So now every request that I send, actually, I can send my client ID to the server, which is amazing, amazing. Okay, now we, we're building some sort of a, almost like a bi-directional thing. So we build a connect. I think we're ready with the connect. We can move on. Run, refresh, you can see. Client ID sits successfully, and that's my client ID. Amazing, it's a normal grid that we generated. What's the next step, guys? What do we need to build next? This is what we need to build next. Create game, right? So we need to make a request from the client like this. Could be a button, right? That says create game that actually sends this to the server. How about we do that? That doesn't sound hard. Let's do the client code work first. So to do the client for code first, we go to the HTML, right? And uh, it's a button, so button ID equal button create, right? And they say new game. How about that? <clears throat> new game. And this is the buttons. What I want to do here is just build a list of all my buttons here. Button create equal document or get element by ID. Button create, right? I'm only using plain, beautiful JavaScript stuff. Nothing else. Okay. Once we do that, right? That's just like I say, I don't know, buttons or HTML elements, we can call it, right? 
and then we start uh, wiring the events button create dot add event listener e if someone clicks on me what do you want me to do i want you to send a request sir okay and here's the thing guys this actually needs to be up this needs to be up here and i'll tell you why because i'm gonna use ws <laughs> all right so what do you want to do we're gonna build a payload right how does the payload look like we're on a method and the method is create right gonna create a new game who are you i am this guy client id that's the only two pieces of information that we need we're gonna send this to the server how do we send this to the server ws which is the web socket that we created dot send and we're gonna json dot stringify payload isn't this awesome guys so we're gonna send the request to create a game to the server the server has no idea what the hell is a create method so we have to teach it all that stuff coolish coolish all right so we're sending that thing still this is useless let's build the server piece here okay and uh, you can choose to build all the client pieces or the server piece you can build the server and the client in parallel it's up to you really right normally this is in a scrum system this uh this will be like kind of its own issues and each 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 developer will pick one and work on it right so on message here that's the interesting part right and we will receive that i'm not gonna print anything what we want to do here if result dot method equal 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 create if someone want to create right a user want to create a new game so we're recreating a new game first of all who the heck are you <laughs> right who the heck are you i want to know who you are fair enough that's who i am client id result of client id is who i am okay so you can know your client very simply like that so this is you right but you want to create a game okay and i am responsible to create actually a new game for you so i'm gonna create a new game id here and it's just a random grid okay just create a new grid that's it once we create a new grid that will that's just the grid that's just the idea of the game i need way more information what do we need else we need the idea of the game and how many balls the game have and that's pretty much it i think we don't need more information that's the game state it's a game object that we need to return so we're going to return method create and we're going to return the game state and uh, we better have this game state handy huh so looks like another hash map right guys so how about we build that so right here i can do games equal this very similarly right and i can say games sub game id equal object and i can start building this thing right i can do id of the game is game id uh what else was there balls 20 hard-coded just 20 games 20 20 cells we return to the server and the method really that that's the payload we're gonna take care of that right later okay but that yeah that's that's essentially it that's the only two pieces of information that we actually need all right and that's it so let's build a payload right so let's pay, build, build the payload and the payload is method create and the game is actually this right the whole that's the actual object which has the game which will have the game id and balls that's that's okay and that's it i think that's the two information that we need from the user right to the user and then here i need the connection where do we can get the connection here the safest way is actually to use the client id to retrieve the connection but the, otherwise i have no idea where is this connection right you can use closures to actually get a handle to this but it's just safer to actually know what you're doing okay plus when you move to us uh, 
uh, a scalable format, a scalable architecture where multiple servers have multiple IDs. This you're gonna need to uniquely identify the client so you can retrieve which server actually had the connection. So that's actually always a better idea. So I can do like a connect const connection equal clients off client ID dot connection, right? That will give me the connection ID. Remember, because that's the object that we received. It's an object with an with a with a key called connection that will give me the connection, right? And once I get the connection, I can do send, right? JSON dot stringify, we always stringify. When we send, we always parse when we receive. Okay, and then we send back the payload, which is this thing. Okay, now this will create a new game. And you might say, Hussein, we still don't see beautiful stuff. It will come, it will come, it will come, everything will come. So we have the client, we have the server. Okay, so the server sent this create, but we never actually listened, quote unquote, listened to a method for the create. So what do you want me to do when I receive a create command? When someone when the when the server sends information to the client, which is a create, right? That's client. I'm HTML, right? I'm the client. Every time I say HTML, I'm a client. Index.js is a server. Okay. I what do I want to do here? The response in this case I'm creating. I will say, just game successfully created with ID. response.game.id, right? And we can just print the whole state. We can do that, I guess, right? Game doubles, like uh, we can we can even say uh, with response.game.balls balls. Sweet. I should stop saying balls and you change it to cells. I know you guys are giggling right now. All right, <laughs> let's test this thing. Refresh. Hey, we have a shiny new button called New Game. Well, from that I visited, I got a client ID, and if I say New Game, a uh, game successfully created with ID br 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 was twenty balls. Nice, nice. I have this ID. We can start by just literally copy and paste the game ID, right? That's not hard. Let's start with that without doing the hard URL, which is a little bit tricky. Let's just do a copy and paste of the game ID and that will actually allow us to join a game. How about we build join game? Join game, guys. To join a game, you need to send a request and that's the tr little bit tricky part. To join a game, you make a request and you tell me the method, join, the client ID, what are who are you, Gwid, and the game ID, which game you want to join. And when you do that, I will send this information to the server, and the server will respond with the join to all active game participant with a color assigned to the game. So this is the most complex code. Let's, let's, let's start writing it. So sending that, join, go, go my game ID. So how do I do the game ID? I'm not gonna complicate it. I'm gonna have a text box where you paste the game ID and click join. So how about we build the client first and then we build the server. So I'm gonna build another button called join game, button join. And I'm gonna build input text type equal text and ID equal text game ID, just the game ID really, where you can just paste it here, right here. It's just uh, literally nothing fancy. And that's the idea of the game ID, right? That, that That's where we were gonna get the game ID from. Okay. We then do this, this, uh, button join equal button join and text uh, game ID. Just uh, regular stuff, guys. You know all that stuff, right? It's not rocket science. Everything is simple so far. 
let's wire the event for button join dot add event listener e pa 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 da 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 join what do you want me to do on join we're gonna send a request we'll come to that okay but we need to get right let's send let's send this let's just copy and paste here we're gonna send that payload it's not create we're joining right what else do we want to that client i need the client id i need i need you right i also need the game id What's the game ID, guys? There's something we missed. We missed to actually store the game ID in a nice variable up there, okay? So let's store game ID equal null here. And then when we join, right, when we receive a message of create, we're gonna get the game ID and that game ID equal response to game ID. That's very important to actually save the game id so we can globally access it in the client right sweet uh, now i can just say this because i have access to it it's right there right and we know if 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 you want to join the button there this is one case when you actually create the game and join it right when you create the game you want to actually populate that text box with the actual game id right so that's one way, or you can save it as we did. But if you actually open a new page and you click join, you're gonna get an error because game ID is null. So what do we do here? If game ID, right, is not, uh, like, a, a, or if it's null, then actually, you might be a good idea to actually read it from the text, right? Which is what? Text game ID, the value, game ID equal this. Just read it from there, if it's null. If it's not, then like I created the same, I created the game from the same uh, page, then I uh, this will be populated, right? So I have this, and we can send it over. Send the payload. I think that's all we need. It's a join. That's it. What do we write on the server? The server, on the other hand, will be expecting a join request. Oh, fancy, that's uh, okay. Why do we do that here? We have a create method, right? And that's it, we don't have anything else. So how about we do another method? Boom. If the server want to join, not the server, the client. A client want to join. If the client want to join, in this case, let's what do we need to do, right? We need const client ID. I need to know who you are. So response.clientID. I need to know what game you want, right? Dot game ID, right? And that's the two information that we have. If you're joining a game, it's probably in the array of list. And guys, there will be a lot of things I have missed, right? A lot of, a lot of bugs, a lot of bugs, but you guys are good. You're gonna you're gonna take care of a lot of stuff for me. So how do I get the game? I get the game object by saying const game equal games off game ID. Okay, that will give me the game object. And now I need to also get the connection, right? The actual connection, the user connection. So now this client is actually joining the game. Okay. Well, we need to assign a color for this client. In order to assign a color for this client. We need to know how many actual clients are in this game. Well, game.client is actually empty if we think about it, right? Because I don't even believe we actually set that thing. So it might be a good idea when we actually build that game object here to actually build an empty array, right? Which is always re when you create a game, set the clients, which is an empty. There is no, not a single client. And that's important because i'm lazy because i want i don't want to check for things like if it's null or not i mean with optional chaining which is should be there should be easy but you know me guys you know me by now right i'm lazy all right so what we want to do here is dot length will tell us what color what what well, how many clients do you have and based on that we can just assign you the color. How do we do that? OK, 
Okay, there are some tricks up my sleeve, uh, some hacky tricks like this, right? I can do this, right? Red. There are many ways. This is just one of them. Red. One is green and two is blue. I assuming just three colors, right? And if I do this and I do sub this, what will I have, guys? This will be the subset zero, in this case, will give me red. One will give me this. Two will give me this. But if it's more than three, I need to fail. If greater than three, or actually greater than or equal three, then sorry. Max players reached, right? I just decided to do three, right? And it's a good idea to have a limit on your players. You don't have to, but uh, your web server will run out of memory at some point, right? And then you can do const color. Let's see if this is, goes there. Okay, there we go the way now, okay? So now this is the color, it gives me the color of the player, okay? And did you get the idea here what I did? It's like, it's just a trick, guys. Eh, just one of the trick. So now this will give me the color of the player. Where do I store this color of the player? Well, along with the player, right? I'm assuming. So we got the game here. How about we actually update the game state here, right? Because we need to game.client.push, see this is an array, right? I'm gonna push an, an object. And the object is client ID, which is client ID, right? And color. What color are you, sir? What color are you? This is exactly what we returned, guys, if you remember. This is just an array of all the clients. And this is the, sweet. We built this thing. Now, right? We can just decide to return, for example, here, just like, yeah, bleh, just exit. Now, I want to send this thing back to all players. Wow, what? How do I do that? Well, not very hard. You can do this for each. Loop through all the array that you currently have, okay? And if there are some clients already, you're gonna loop through all of the clients, right? And C, loop through all clients, loop through all clients and tell them that people has joined. Some, some new game players have joined. And we have a client, this is C, which is this, right? I need to get C.clientID, right? And I need to get the connection of that guy, dot send, and I am gonna send json.stringify. I'm gonna send the game. Not the game, actually, I need a payload. Did I pr prepare a payload? Ugh, I didn't prepare the payload. Let's, let me prepare a payload. Maybe it's a good idea to prepare the payload right here. Not really, it's just the exact same payload, so we can just do that. Pull, payload. The method is join, and the game state is game. Haha, <laughs> exactly. And then stringify the whole payload and send it. Sounds good, right? Because that's the game ID, ball, clients, grid, and color. Sweet, all right, how about we Test this beast. All right. When I run this now, what are we gonna do? We're gonna join, right? First, we're gonna create a game and then join it. So, refresh. Let's remove the breakpoints. Create a new game. That just created a new game. That is the game ID. I am going to join the game. I didn't get anything back <laughs> from the server. Oh, there's an error. Response is not defined. Ooh, and <laughs> the server crashed. <laughs> response is not defined. What did we do, sir? What did we do? Why is response not defined? Why is response not defined? Result. Why did I say response? Ugh, 
Yuck. That's the problem. Yuck. Okay. Do it again. Refresh. New game. Join. And crashed again. Cannot read property connection of undefined. <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Maybe this is undefined, right? So let's check. What do we have here? What do we have here? It's time to actually debug, guys. Right? Let's just let's just debug. Have a breakpoint. Refresh this, babe. New game. Uh, all good. And join. We will should get it right here. Result the client ID. Oh, client ID is not defined. Why? Okay, guys, I think I found the problem. Is that on the create, we actually expected a client ID from the server, which is wrong, right? We shouldn't do that, guys. That's the bug. Ah, it took me a while to find out, but yeah, we did it. We did find it. So that's the bug. We are we, we're taking the response from the create protocol and we are assuming there is a client and we overriding our good client ID to undefined bad just remove that stuff hopefully that will do the trick refresh right new game join game boom 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 and that will take us to the server anytime soon yep there you go we have a client ID now yay Got the game ID. Let's get the hash map. Get the game. There is no client. Zero. Is the client greater than zero? Nope. We still have it. Get the color. Which color do we get? We get red. The trick worked. <laughs> you got the idea, right? Because it's zero, it's going to find the zero hash, right? Key, and then find the value of this, which is red. Okay? And, and so on. So this will work up to two, and then we'll break. <laughs> Because we we essentially zero one and two we ah now come think about it actually will yeah yeah that's okay that will work so client ID and color add it push it now we have clients we have one and three I want you to send that to all clients and now if I do this go here and we should start seeing. Well, we didn't actually do any code for the client. That's why we did the client didn't do anything. So for the client, we need to now add a code for join. What do you want to do when you receive a join request, right? When you receive a join request, right? What do you expect here? You have the game ID, right? Which game do you want, right? This wants to game to ID. That's correct. You also need to tell me that hey, this these are the players. How about we actually how about we actually do something better this time? How about we have a dev element with the actual colors of the players, right? Let's do that. So I'm gonna do uh, dev ID equal players. We can call them dev players, right? And then do that thing, right? Dev players 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 and then here's what i gotta do when someone joins a game i want to lose i want first to get the game idea the game object right give me the game give me the game right when i have the game i can loop through all the clients of the game right for each see and if i loop i can create elements on this thing but before I create, I'm gonna make sure that this is empty. So in order to do that, I do what was the trick while uh, not dot first child. I think that's is that is that how you do it? Well, this is not the first child of this is is not empty. Go ahead and do div players dot remove child. Uh, remove the first child. I think that's the code to remove all the elements, right? I might be wrong. Is it first child? Is it a function? I don't even know. I think it's called dot first child. Yeah, it is. It is just a property. Right? While not, just do this, right? Clear all the children. 
And once you clear it, start building the children here, which is like uh, const, what do we build? Labels, devs, another devs element. Ugh. How about we just do dev element, sure. D equal document dot create element dev. And then we do de D dot style dot width equal, I don't know, 200 px. That's a little bit much, I think. D dot style dot background color, background color equal, da 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 da. What does it equal? C dot color, right? And D dot text content is actually equal C dot client ID, right? Which is an ugly grid. Yeah, that might do it. And then obviously we have to do like uh, div players, the append child, append the D, right? Makes sense. Plus this is wrong. We should not do it in the loop. We should do it outside the loop, right? Clear all the children and then keep adding one children at a time, okay? That's why, because we're gonna join and then join and then join. This way we get, we get new clients every time. How about we actually test this thing, guys? Boom. Boom, refresh. I'm gonna close this because it's annoying. And then I'm gonna open another browser, another browser, and then create a new game. And obviously I don't know the game ID, so I have to open this again like an idiot. Okay, and I copy this guy. And you, sir, we're gonna join the game. Ho oh, ho, something is happening. It's taking a while. Ugh. Ugh. Did, did anything happen? Did anything fail? Did anything fail? What did fail? Fail, remove child is not defined. Damn it, I, I thought it's called remove child. Isn't it called remove child? Isn't it called the remove child? Wait a second, what is it called? It's not remove child. Oh, I have to do that remove child. What the hell? I thought I did that. All right, guys, it was a stupid mistake. <laughs> it should not have been not while there is a child. Remove it. Bah. All right, at least we have this now. That's pretty cool, right? So now if I take the same grid and go to another user and say join ah, it's happening it's a little bit slow I need to find out why there we go it got green and the guy join that's probably the debugger slowing things down and blue three clients Three beautiful clients, this guy and this guy and this guy. So we have the game, we joined. There, those guys now can build the state actually. So the client can not just build the colors like we were doing right now, we actually can build the state of the game. How many balls do we have in the game, okay? They have enough balls. Well, let's find out. Let's find out. Dev players, dev board, okay? And dev boards, very similarly, li, 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 is, um, I'm gonna use this code again. When we join, we need to rebuild that state of the game, right? So we're gonna, call, what is it called? Uh, da, da, da. We're gonna call it dev board. There's a div board, div board, div board, right? And this guy's div board, div board, div board. Yeah, div board. So what we're gonna do is essentially loop let uh, let i equal zero. Let's make this a little bit bigger. i is less than the number of balls in the game, which is game dot balls. I plus plus. Sweet, that's what we do. We loop through all of the games and the balls and we start building this thing. And it depends what you want to build this as. I'm gonna build them as buttons, okay? Document, 
and we can do uh, const b equal document dot create element and that's a button and then button dot uh, id we need an id right because the id is essentially is going to be ball plus whatever right the i okay because this will be very useful in the case where we actually want to play right when i click on this button what's the id of that button right let's call it a tag right i plus one because we're gonna start from one whatever so now b dot add event listener if someone click on you what are you gonna do that's a that's that's something we're gonna do when do we do the play right but we're building here stuff we're just building it so now uh, div board dot add uh, dot append child b append the child b okay we're building all that stuff that's it I mean we can do if you click b dot uh, style dot background color equal your color right player color which guess what I do not know what my color is <laughs> it is fascinating that you don't know what's your color is so you can find out easily because guess what from the game state you can actually find out your color right because you can loop through all the clients and if the client that is equal to your client id then that's you right so and that's here right exactly so you can actually let's build a let's build this because we need to do it all the time right this player color equal null and not this let and here when we loop and we join this is a good loop because we're looping and this is the color we're using the color right if the client dot client id equal 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 client id which is me right then the player color is equal c dot color that's how we capture my color and that's very important because here when you click i want to set my color but we're not sending anything to the server yet i'm just setting my own color so let's see if all of that stuff actually works. Steve, almost there, guys. Almost there. Sweet. Client generated. New game created. Copy the new game. Refresh this guy. Join the game. Let's remove this because we don't. We no longer need that and we got all the buttons <laughs> we need to put some sizes there okay and then i can join this game too look at that it's faster without the debug huh? right and i can just just join it's way much faster guys without that okay let's fix the button size it's so small b dot style the width is equal to i don't know it's just 150 px let's see 150 by 150 yeah does that looks good does that look good does that look good but i add it oh we didn't add even the uh an id for that i guess we don't have to but sure this is like te the text content right we didn't add that all right refresh 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 new game boom Oh, we didn't create did we i think we did okay join oh my god <laughs> oh my god it actually works nice okay nice nice join the game i'm a green guy nice and join the game i am the blue guy obviously those guys are not communicating with each other plus the colors are disappearing for some reason right no that doesn't disappear we actually redrew them because new people joined so we redrew the whole thing remember guys sweet 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 okay that was the join i think we got that we nailed the join guys we nailed the join we nailed it the final piece not the final piece the piece before the final piece is the play i want to start updating the state let's do this so when i click not only do I send my color, I want to actually build a payload that I want to send to the server. And the method is, remember, it's called play. Play. You need to send the method, good, and which ball are you editing? 
Easy. We have all this information. Uh, client ID equal client ID. Which game are we adding? Well, this is game ID, right? Did we ever save the game ID? Because it's, uh, it's, good, it's gonna be a good idea to actually save it, right? Because we, we're we gonna need it, guys, right? Because this is gonna be saved anyway. If you joined it, it's gonna be here. Definitely click joined or created. I think we're gonna have it, the game ID as a, as a variable. That's good. Another thing we need is like which ball ID? The ball that you actually clay in or, or the cell, whatever you wanna call it. It is b.tag. That's the trusted property. That's the b.tag. Very, very critical. And then all we need to do is just basically us as a client, ws.send. Right? Is it called ws, I think, right? Let's just send it. Yeah, ws. Dot send. We're gonna send JSON. Dot string stringify payload, and that is the client side. Obviously, every client side has a server side. What do we do when we receive a request not to join? Join was actually a big function, huh? That's the join. It ends here. Let's add an if statement for the play, a user plays, okay? The user plays, who are you? Client ID equal result dot client ID const game ID. I need to know which game are you playing so I can, I can find it. What else do we do? We're building a game, client ID, game ID, and I need to know which ball ID you're touching. Boom. All right, sweet. So I need this three information. Once I know this information, I can start building the state, which is awesome. And remember, this is a global state that will be changed on the server. Okay. So let's get the game, which is game z of game ID, right? dot state which it doesn't exist to be honest right let's just do this const state equal get the state currently i know sometimes it's not set so if the state if the state is not set set it as an object let's use an object let's just follow the hash map uh, idea right so state sub ball id which is which ball equal the client id oh how do I know what color is the client from the server side? <laughs> I do not believe we actually persist this information. It's actually in the game if you think about it. So it's games. Yeah, we need to do a lot of stuff. Maybe it's just easier to send the color on the payload, right? It's just way easier, right, guys? Let's, let's actually do it that. I mean, yeah. I mean, we have it here, right? We just literally have it, player color, just send it. And it's just easier instead of doing stuff like that, goofy stuff. So, yeah, so state of ball is equal, just literally uh, const color equal result dot color. Yeah, it's just easier, right? Just there. The ball ID, we didn't use it, so that's now, that's good. So that's it. And then once we're done, we actually set that state back as the user equal state. And that is, sir, almost the payload is ready. What's the payload? The payload is very similar to the, uh, to the join payload, to be honest, right? It's like that, which contains the game, which we said const game equal this guy and just send it back. It's not join, it's actually play, right? What else are we expecting to send to the client, to the user? Actually, nothing, to be honest. We're not sending, the play doesn't actually send anything to the user, to the, to the, to the client. We just update the state and that's it, right? Because this, this will happen often, very, very often, okay? The state of the actual array will get updated all the time. Okay, and now this comes back to the final 
thing, which is the server now sending the state to the client every 500 milliseconds, which is the final, final play. How about we do that, guys? Let's build a function called function update game state. And what we do essentially is loop through all the games that we have, which is what? For g, for const g off games, right, which is an array, that will give us the key of the games, right? And what we want to do is get the g, which is games sub g, which is the actual game, right? Object dot all the clients, we want to loop through all the clients and send them uh, we loop through all the clients, right? And send them the state updated state of the game, right? And this is something we do every now or then. All right, we're gonna determine when do we do that, okay? Maybe when there are three players, we'll just, we'll decide that. Okay, we did this code before. So it's like uh, clients sub C, right? Which is the client ID, it's actually C dot client ID, right? and then dot connection dot send right we're sending what we're we sending guys we're sending the state of the game which is this puppy boom send it the whole thing the actual game i'm gonna test that in a minute but this is gonna happen every i don't know up, uh, set timeout call this guy every 500 milliseconds and nobody actually called this function so we need a place where we actually call this function what is the best time to actually call this function well we can decide to actually call the function when we have enough clients right when you have three clients let's call the function and start sending people there and they can start the game right away. If game.clients.length equal 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 three, then start the game. Start the game when we have three clients, exactly. How about we test this thing? This is gonna be interesting. Let's see if it actually works. And uh, here's the thing. What are we sending back to the client? We're sending just the game state but we didn't actually build a payload, to be honest. So we need a payload, const payload. We need a method, right? Which is to update the state, which is like, I don't know what's gonna call it. Update, I think. That's the final thing, we need to send a method called update with the game state, that's exactly that way. Okay, and that's the game state. So we can actually just do it once right here, right? const game equal this game game and then payload this could be a game we stringify the actual payload right and that we need the final piece from the client to actually respond to whatever the server sends right what does the server send here guys we're gonna send the join nope join we did the join we need to do the update if the client receives an update we need to kind of do whatever we did in join to be honest guys but with some more a little bit we're not really removing and adding the ch children to be honest right that's actually i find i find removing the children now is just kind of useless so what do we do we receive the game right the game state have I would assume a state object, which is essentially almost like uh, a key. So we can loop through all of that stuff, right? So for uh, const s, which is the ball actually, if you think about it, off this, right? Because remember, it's gonna be something like that. Zero red, 
uh, one ball one is whatever, right? I think it's just start from one. I think we built the whole thing start to to be an indexed. So, so what we need to do is find take this. This is B, and B is the index. So we need actually the actual value, right? Const ball ID equal this, right? We need the actual value, and that. We're gonna do a lot of debugging after all this code we've written, <laughs> guys. We gotta go go and find document .get element by ID. We need to find the ball that is titled ball ID. This and give me a B object ball object right, which is the button and we need to make this button style the background color equal to so the id will be b i think right that's the that's the i missed them something other and the b the color will be actually the value of this we're gonna check this out and see if it actually works who knows all right almost there guys It's gonna be a lot of testing. Refresh, refresh, refresh. New game. And we can join the same game. That's the idea of the game. And that's a 20 bolt, right? One to 20. And you can join. And you can join too. And you can join. I didn't write a refresh this way. Oh. Oh, crashed! Something crashed! Games is not an iterable. <laughs> That's good. So something crashed. Update game state actually failed, guys. What we need to do is essentially, the problem with this is, we need to get the keys of this, right? Object.keys, right? We're looping through. This is, this is, the games is essentially an object of the game ID and the content right so we we need these guys the actual values right so we're looping through all the keys itself which is just an array so we can just do so that does the trick and i know i had a similar bug with the states in the index dot html dot object dot keys loop through all the keys okay Dun, da, da, da. Will this work? Bum ba bum, bum ba da bum, bum ba da bum. New game. Join game, and you should go join as well, and you should join as well, and we go bum bum. That's a game state. Got the clients. We have two clients. Nice. I want you to update the clients. Boom. Oh, oh. The game started. I don't see any crashes. Oh, it looks like the game started. There's a failure. Cannot convert on divine or not object. Oh, we're getting errors, man. We're getting errors. State sword. Yeah, yeah, that's the error. Response to the game to state is an error. Why? Why don't you like this? So you're receiving that. Yeah, this is just failing. See? I got an error under there. Cannot convert undefined or null to object. Why would I want to convert undefined or null to an object? Response to it's not, it is a response. Right? Don't we, shouldn't we get response? Okay, we have an error on the client in this case. Same error. Okay, it was, I was a little bit too late, so I didn't catch the actual error here. But, seems that this is null, which is odd because that's what I'm gonna send, right? The payload is game, update, and there's a game state. All right. All right, let's do it again. 
So I wrote still. Ooh, we have a sign into a constant. Ooh, constant. Ooh, why is this a constant? That's a problem. Should be a let. <laughs> That's the problem. All right, maybe that could have caused the problem. Updating the state. And refresh. Boom. And we game. Boom. We get a const. And refresh. Join game. Refresh. Join game. And join game. That will just immediately give us a result. Yes, sir. Do we have a state? Oh, the state is undefined. Aye. Well, it looks like we didn't even have a state. We're assuming that we're having a state, which is wrong. Hmm. Yeah. We don't have a state, son. We do not have a state. That's the problem. Oh my god, look at that, I'm overriding this. <laughs> oh, that is the problem. Oh my god. Okay. You saw what I did, right? I overrode the actual game <laughs> with the state, which is null in this case. So the whole thing was just the whole thing just crashed. So again. Third time is the charm. And join. Refresh. And join. Refresh. And join. I don't see any errors. Oops, we still have the errors, guys. Really? I expected that. Why is that? Maybe I have to add like a check. We need, a, we need a play. Let's play. Boom, boom. There you go. We at least have a state now. Hey, we have state now. Yeah, okay. All right. We just we forgot to play, I guess. We have just to, to capture the state when, when we don't have anything, really. Oh my god, looks like it's working guys. It looks like it's working. We just got one. And this is a blue. Oh, there's a bug. <laughs> I know what this is. I know exactly what's going on. <laughs> I know what's going on. We're starting from zero. This is like a zero index kind of a bug. All right. So when we're building uh, the uh, what is it? ID that ID equal ball i let's just do this i plus one that that should fix the problem and while we're at it dot state well if this is if this is null i'm such a bonehead all right so it in should be not okay we knew we get a new game. I shouldn't fail. That error doesn't really matter, guys, to be honest. Because it's just once you start playing, now you, you don't see the error, right? But once you start playing, now everybody should get the stuff. Holy moly. That is nice. That is nice, guys. Now I have these three puppies. Look at that, guys. So this guy is the red. This is green, see? You can see directly. Everything is updated. That's exactly right. WebSockets, multiplayer game. And you can take this source code, guys, and build on top of it anything you want. You can make it into a URL like I did, right? I'm not gonna make this video any longer than it already is. It's probably like seven hours now, <laughs> okay? But you get the idea, right? You can take this code, Okay, and just build on top of it and just have the idea of what we built here. It's just using just raw WebSockets, you can do all of that stuff. I understand that 
building or like socket IO can kind of simplify some of the stuff we did today. But still, it's really your choice. You can choose any technology you want, but that is what we build essentially, right? There might be some bugs, but let me know guys. And uh, we're gonna see you in the next one. How did you like this video? Hope you like it and see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. What is going on guys? My name is Hussein and in this video, I want to know what is going on behind the scenes when we establish a new WebSocket connection, when we send data between the client, the WebSocket client to the WebSocket server, and what happened when you actually close the WebSocket connection. And I'm going to do that with the beautiful new toy that I just discovered that I'm really excited about. It's called Wireshark. So it's actually going to show us exactly what's going to happen in the network. And we're going to see all the calls and we're going to explain every single thing because that's what we do on this channel. We try to demystify everything. So guys, what I have here is a beautiful WebSocket server. And we talked about WebSocket in this channel. Check out this playlist, right? How to start with the WebSocket. What is WebSocket? Really, you need to understand all of stuff if you're a backend engineer. All right. And once you understand that, you know how a WebSocket server starts and, and what does it know, the connection upgrades and all that stuff. You, you want to watch this video. You cannot just jump into this video because without knowing what's, what, how WebSockets work. But I'm going to explain it anyway in this video. So stay tuned. So I have here a beautiful WebSocket server running and listening on port IT, IT because it's the best port ever. And it's on my old Raspberry Pi. This Raspberry Pi, Pi is from 2013, I believe. It's so slow. I mean, it took me 13 seconds just to start the server. So I have here WebSocket, uh, uh, WebSocket, Wireshark listening. And I have here Chrome because you know what? Because I'm going to write beautiful code here. And as I write code to connect to that server, you're going to start seeing the packets showing up here. So the first code we're going to write is uh, let WS or connection. I'm going to create a new connection and I misspelled connection. That's embarrassing. And then we're going to do connection equal new WebSocket object. And the address is literally Raspberry Pi 1 and in port 8080. And we're going to use the WebSocket protocol. I'm going to zoom in here so you can see that. And when I do that, you can start seeing the flood of stuff that happening. I'm going to explain every single thing that happened there, all right? No worries. And the second thing I'm going to do here is I am going to hook in the uh, message so that I receive stuff from the server, just an event, right? And the final thing I'm going to do is, I uh, see, you're going to start seeing some stuff there. And then the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send some information to the server. I'm going to say sub server. And the server is configured so that anything that it receives, it sends it back with saying, got your message sub. It's just a bunch of string. And the final thing is close the connection. Awesome. And here's our Wireshark log. How about we jump into it and demystify everything that has happened, right? And obviously, at the other end, you can see there's some messages here in the console. We don't really care about what happened in the server. We really care what happened on Wireshark. So let's stop the log and let's take a look at this beautiful thing. All right. So guys, the first thing that happens, and I, you guys, first of all, I want to thank every network engineer on my channel uh, for correcting my stupid mistakes and, and uh, my uh, really insufficiency when it comes to networking. And I learned so much from you guys. So thank you so much. And now I, I, th I, I can read this crap better. <laughs> All right. So the first thing, what is this? What is these three beautiful things? Why are they three? It's called a beautiful three-way handshake because that's the first thing. It's, well, WebSockets is built on HTTP and which is built on TCP, at least for HTTP2, right? Or in HTTP1. So this is built on TCP and TCP, what do you do? The first thing, three-way handshake. Check out the video, three-way handshake, how it works. So the client, which is a MOI, 10, IP10, and the server is 81. What's 81 in French? I forgot. 80, 82, 
No, that's two. Never mind. So 81. Turn to 81. So sin. And the server responds with synac, obviously, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna start my own sin sequence numbers, and then I'm going to acknowledge the sin that I just did. And then the final thing is like, okay, acknowledging the sin of the server. So now the client and the servers are synchronized with the sequence numbers. Both of them know their each sequence numbers and they know where to start, right? So they can send a packet. Who is sending the first packet? Guess what? It's the client. And what's this? A get request? Hey, we know this stuff. It's a get request. Yes, that's the first get request that that there were, were that the client does and it's called an http upgrade right it's an upgrade header it says hey i am about to establish we just establish a connection and hey server i want to upgrade this connection to a websocket connection so from now on we want to use the raw tcp connection as a websocket pipe right that is not true in http2 that is a little bit different it uses streams right this in http 1 1 which is what we're seeing here right where is the version 1 1 there you go right it actually hijacks the whole tcp connection which is extremely inefficient that's a different topic for the, i i talked about it a little bit but ask questions in the comment section so we can have a discussion all right i'm sending a get request it's around 500 bytes that's big you like see all right and the server says yo i acknowledge your uh that I acknowledge your request. I just acknowledge it. I don't have a response for you. Now, after a little bit of a time, the server responds with switching protocol. It says, yeah, now I do support WebSockets and I'm going to switch the protocol. And this is the text it says, okay, I'm going to switch the protocol. And from now on, let's communicate with WebSocket, right? And this, the client obviously now responds says, hey, yay, I acknowledge your acknowledgement of my acknowledgement that's switching the protocol, right? So it's just acknowledging the switching protocol. All right. And then everyone has like a, a acknowledgement number. We don't really, really need to look at these anymore because I, we understand them. And here's the thing. We, this is something I didn't run into when I actually first made the video uh, offline. This is, I just know, and I, I didn't make sense. So this is a feature of the WebSocket. It's called ping-ponging. So what the client, what, it's actually not the client, actually the server says, hey, because what I, I kept talking, I established the connection, I kept talking, talking, and it says, okay, client, are you alive? And that's how the server know if the client is alive. It pings it. And what is it? What this ping is? It's a very small packet that just have very, what, how, how big is it really? Let's take a look. It's just two bytes, two bytes. It's very small. So the client pings it. The server pings the client says, are you alive? And then the server, uh, the uh, so the server pings the client, are you alive? The client acknowledges the ping, right? See how, how much chattiness is there guys when we make requests as software engineers we don't understand what's going on behind the scenes so now we're gonna we're gonna appreciate what's going on once you understand what's happening right so now i appreciate the ping i'm gonna pong you because the acknowledgement is not, is not enough for some reason you can argue that this should be enough right why well, should I actually send data if i acknowledge it that means i received it right so we can actually tweak the websocket protocols so as like oh is the pong really Necessary. Hmm. And why is the Pong six bytes? Jesus. That is big Pong, man. Okay, that's a... Uh, all right. I'm not going to say that because this video is going to get more demonetized. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. And then the server acknowledges the Pong. And then, hey, whoops, I get text. Obviously, this is an unsecure connection. I'm going to make another video, Wiresharking TLS 1.2 or Wireshark DLS 1.3. But for now, look. The client is sending some text and it's around nine bytes. What's the text says? Sup. It says sub, it's nine bytes, but I sent three bytes. So the rest of stuff is just garbage of the WebSocket header, I guess. And the server now says, yo, I acknowledge your sub. That's not a response. That's just an acknowledgement of the request. I say, hey, I got it. I'm processing it. Now, that's our code kicking in on the back end, and the server is now sending some data to the 
client and the client says get your message sub that's the exactly the message that we got from the server and we saw it in chrome right so yeah we got the message back it's awesome right and then the client sends something else what is that what does the client send it acknowledges the git message that's just a, just an acknowledgement that we receive your got your message sub right so the server knows okay we got it now this is the exciting that's the most exciting part here and afterwards so here's the thing the client initiates the close remember when we said the it's right there right connection to close right that's the client that's me closing the tcp the WebSocket connection all right so the the WebSocket connection is now the client actually sends it's just another WebSocket data to the tcp stack right i am sending a request to close the connection okay and uh, yeah that's just the headers of the websocket stuff and the server acknowledges that we received your request that happens to be just data for us that you want to close and now i as a server i also want to close and here's the message that I want to close the connection. So it's almost like the fin and fin act, but at the data, the application layer, right? We're at the web socket here and we're just playing here. So the connection technically is not really closed. It's just a bunch of data, right? And now at the web socket protocols cleaning stuff up, right? And here's the here's the most this is the most powerful part. And I think whoever designed the web socket protocol is smart because of that. The client initiate the close, but look at this. The server, obviously there's an acknowledgement, obviously, that uh, from the client that we received uh, the last message, but here's the thing. The server is doing the actual physical thing to close the physical TCP connection. So here's the was like a logical close, and here we flipped it, the server, is closing the connection and I'm gonna explain why and I think I, I think that's the reason when the server closes the connection whoever closes the connection first end up the other party end up in a in a TCP wait state which will be there for around four minutes to, to receive all the garbage uh, delayed segments and all that stuff and I didn't really talk about TCP wait and I'm gonna talk about another video but that's a state where every TCP connection will go to in his, in order to clean things up it's a lingering mode right so what do we happen here is like the server is doing a finac and we know why every with every data that server does is always acknowledgement so that's that's just a free bit that we set to acknowledge stuff that we haven't done in the past right it might an acknowledgement might got lost right because there's no acknowledgement of an acknowledgement unfortunately right so here's that so yeah, Finac, the server is doing the Finac. The client says, okay, I acknowledge your Fin and here's my Finac. So I am responding to your Fin and the server acknowledges and immediately terminates safely, right? This way, the server, the WebSocket server especially, right? If the client initiate the close the connections, it will not be it will not it will not end up in a state where the all these tcp wait state are are uh, overwhelming the memory of the server right in this case this the tcp wait state will be in the client side and uh, that will be a little bit better and that, that i didn't know that to be honest i just know it when i made this video all right guys so that was the wire sharking web sockets uh just a little bit of closer look of what happening in the back end when you really establish a tcp connection and do some websocket connections there right so yeah i'm i'm not sure what happened if the if the server initiates the close that will be an interesting video to make and, and just analysis and uh let me know guys if you like this kind of content and uh i'm gonna see you in the next one you guys stay awesome goodbye what is going on guys my name is hussein in this video i want to talk about how websockets work with http2 yes it for the longest time we always thought that 
why reinvent the wheel? We know how web sockets work with HTTP one, which is, I'm going to explain now in a second. Why can't we just use the same method? There is a very, very good reason. There are a lot of smart engineers sitting down and building great spec to squeeze every single performance out of everything right and this is one of them this is the what i'm gonna about to explain is rfc request for comment 8441 how about we jump into it lights on guys all right so uh this rfc is called uh boot scrap boot bootstrapping bootstrapping web sockets with http2 all right guys but before we talked about that i want you to have a little bit of an idea how http2 works if you don't check out the video here right here i think it's right here yeah check out the video right here to learn more about http because it's very critical for the for the point i'm about to make however http normal http traffic 1 1 with op, op sockets work as follows okay i am a client this is a mobile phone and this is a web socket server let's say this is the WebSocket server. What you, every WebSocket server is a web server. That means it's less than usually in port 80 or 443, and you can listen to any port really. really. And what we do, the client establishes a TCP connection between uh, itself and the web server, and then it attempts to communicate using just normal Git request. And the first Git request that it sends, it says, hey, get request this is a normal http traffic right get request and in the header it says here's an upgrade header i want to upgrade this pipe that i just created right between moi and the web server and i want to make it into a web socket server do you support this or not that upgrade request which is a normal good request that upgrade request reaches the web server and the web server says wait a second i don't know what the heck is this web socket thing so i don't know it will just ignore it or if it does know what a web socket says like yes i know this it's gonna reply with 101 i believe for the status courses switching protocol son it's gonna say that and then from now on that tcp that beautiful tcp connection that we created is just now reserved for this web socket you cannot do anything with it so if you want to send a git request to obtain a css file or javascript use another use another tcp connection you cannot use this this is reserved for the web sockets right and that's a that's essentially how websockets so now the server can send garbage to the client the client can send garbage to the server and they can communicate with information all right so that's the idea of websocket obviously with http 1 1 1 establishing tcp and having it only does one thing is a little bit of waste of memory right and waste of resources because tcp can does can do so much for us right and we're using it for just a request response and yeah the browser does this uh, silly thing that's called pipelining and and it just establishes six tcp connections but we're this is over now http2 have one tcp connection between the client and the server and you can multiplex multiple multiplex from this side multiplex multiple requests into the single pipe that we built so you can say a request to get the index html a request to get this uh javascript file and the css and, and and your pdfs and everything your apis your jsons all of them can be multiplexed together and you might say hussein how though right how, how do i know if they're if you're sending everything in the almost in parallel how do i know that the the, the responses that comes back from the web server are for which request you don't know right because they can come out out of order here is where the idea of stream tagging and i don't like the word stream to be honest i i prefer what rabbit mq named it channel but it is what it is 
that's what Google did, right? Google is almighty, so they decided speedy is called this. These are called streams, so we're following those called streams. So yeah, these are called streams, and every single stinking request will get a stream ID. So if the request, if the server responds back with with the data for that request, it will tag it with a stream ID. I don't know what the hell what is that about. Sorry. So yeah, we'll ooh, ooh. every response will have a stream ID. So we'll, if the client will come back, we'll say, okay, this is stream ID. Oh, up, up, this is for this guy. This is for this client. This is for this client. And we'll start doing that. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful design. A little bit of limitations that I talked about here. TCP and HTTP2 limitation. Check out this video. But regardless, it's beautiful. One TCP connection for many requests. WebSocket, right? The OG WebSocket client comes and like, yo, what's up? I want to make an um, upgrade request and goes into the pipe, right? Imagine we don't have this new RFC and the server go, this says, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I support WebSocket server and we'll reply back with the WebSocket upgrade and they will say, yeah, okay, let's do that. Okay, let's use this TCP connection as a WebSocket. It was like, ooh, it was like the browser was like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What the heck are you talking about? I'm using the same TCP connection for 70 other streams and requests. You cannot just hijack the whole TCP connection for your stinking WebSocket uh, chatting gaming session. No, sir. No, we need to find a solution. And that's what browsers do. And I'm not sure if actually they implemented this or not. It says here... Mozilla actually proposed this thing. Pretty neat, huh? So Mozilla proposed this. It's like, you know what? WebSockets will act differently. We want WebSockets to act differently in HTTP2. And here's what we want. You can still do the same thing. We cannot no, we can no longer do this upgrade thingy because it's it's a little bit different. Upgrade behave differently. But you can still use another reco get request using another method called connect. And using that, tell us what, what protocol you want to use. And when we get it to the, the other side, if the web server supports HTTP2, it will know to use one stream, one thread just for web sockets on the same TCP connection. Isn't that cool, right? This is pretty cool. So they have to see the same TCP connection, one stream, one channel. I, I'm going to call it channel because I hate the word stream. Stream, what the heck stream means? Or is it a river? No, I don't like the stream. I'm going to call it channel. <laughs> so yeah, so that stream will be essentially just for WebSocket, another stream for your get request, another stream for the post request, another stream for the put request, another request for the delete, another request for everything, right? So still one TCP connection with every single thing. So that's an idea of bootstrapping WebSockets with the GDB2. Instead of hijacking the whole socket to do one single thing, right? We're going to reuse it and reuse it to do multiple things. All right, guys, going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome.